Assalamu alaikum and good morning. Before we begin the session, I would like to get your response on the quality of the visual and audio. Please respond and let me know if there are any issues. To all speakers and audience, I would like to remind you to kindly mute your microphone during our session. For your information, the opening ceremony for this conference is now streaming live via Pusa Asasi UITM's YouTube channel. The parallel sessions will then be live streamed through two different platforms. The science and technology sessions on Pusa Asasi UITM's YouTube channel and the social science sessions on Pusa Asasi UITM Facebook page. So be sure to stream according to the sessions that you would like to follow. Let's begin with our national anthem, Negaraku, followed by Wawasan Sitio Warga UITM. Yang berbahagia Profesor Teknologis Dr. Hajar Rozia Muhammad Janur, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and International, exercising the functions of the Vice Chancellor, University Technology Mara, UITM, Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Halimatun Hamdan, Professor of Raza Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University Technology Malaysia, UTM Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dr. Saifullah Haji Abdullah, Director of Center of Foundation Studies, 
University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia. The conference local chair, our invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. First of all, it is my pleasure to be the MC for the iCrest Virtual Conference 2021. My name is Sakinatul Ain Jilani from the Center of Foundation Studies, University of Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia. On behalf of the organizers, we wish to extend our warm welcome. Salamat datang and thank you to all foreign and local participants, guests of honor and representatives to the second iCrest Hello. Virtual Conference 2021, huh. organized by the Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology Mara, UITM, Dinkil Campus, Selangor, Malaysia. To seek blessings for our event today, I would like to invite Al Fadil Ustaz Ahmad Jamil bin Jafa to lead the du'a recitation. Thank you, MC. Cabut eh, saya cabut eh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Al Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Malik yaumiddin. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. Ihdinas siratal mustaqim. Surat al-lazina an'amta alayhim ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim waladdallin. Amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wal'aqibatu lil-muttaqin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillah. Indeed, all praises is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise him and seek his help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from our soul's evil and, and our wrongdoings. He whom Allah guides, no one can misguide. And he whom he misguides, no one can guide. On this blessed morning, in conjunction with the ICRES 2021, we seek your blessings for a flawless progress of this event from the beginning till the end. Ya Allah, Ya Munzil Rahmah, Wa Ya Fatih al Barakat, we glorify and thank you. You have showered us with countless blessings and the blessings continuously remind us of your faithfulness and guidance. We humbly ask you to shower our speakers today of your greatest inspiration so that they may share the most of their knowledge, heart and soul to their topics. May we also absorb the priceless knowledge, experiences and put them into practice what we may learn today. We pray that you bless all the committees in charge, that they may be able to fulfill their task responsibly, that the objective they have set may all be achieved. We ask you for your knowledge. Make useful for us that you have taught us and teach us the knowledge that will be useful to us. Ya Allah, Ya Karim, show us your guidance and adjust our path and ways to achieve happiness and glory. Let us listen to the people who like the good things. Let us avoid doing the bad and evil things. Ya Allah, do bless our meeting and gathering and do prevent us from harm and unfortunate events. Allahumma ja'al jama'ana hadha jama'an marhuma wa tafarruqna min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'asuma. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-barasi wal-junun wal-judham wa min sayi'il asqam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Taqabbal Allahu minna wa minkum. Taqabbal ya kareem. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ameen. Thank you, Ustaz Ahmad Jamil. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of the conference is embracing research culture and fostering academic excellence. This international conference aims to provide opportunities for researchers and scholars across the globe to present their research work and findings with common enthusiasts, ultimately boosting the possibilities for impactful academic sharing and networking. For your information, Today, we have 145 participants, as well as industrial experts and professionals joining this conference. 
All participants have come together to discuss various contributions to science, technology, and social sciences. We hope these valuable contributions in this one day of conference will be beneficial to both academia and the industry. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to begin, I would like to invite Young Brabahagia Professor Dr. Saifullah Haji Abdullah, Director of Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia, to deliver his welcoming speech. Please welcome Professor Dr. Saifullah Haji Abdullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, MC. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Teknologis, Dr. Hajah Roziah Muhammad Jano, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, exercising the function of the Vice Chancellor, University Teknologi Mara. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Datuk Dr. Halimatun Binti Hamdan, Razak Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University Teknologi Malaysia. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Dr. Tetsuo Soga, Department of Electrical and Mechanical Engineering, Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. Yang berbahagia, Profesor Datuk Dr. Samrahayu binti A. Aziz, The Institution of Malay Rules Chair, University Technology Mara. Yang berusaha, Dr. Salizatul Ilyana binti Ibrahim, Chairperson of ICRES 2021. Committee members, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. Alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah the merciful. By whose grace and blessings we are gathered here for this virtual event. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the International Conference of, on Research and Practice in Science, Technology and Social Science, ICRES 2021, with the theme Embracing Research Culture and Fostering Academic Excellence. I am proud to announce that this is the second annual virtual conference organized by UITM Center of Foundation Studies. It is hoped that this conference will, be, will provide opportunities for exchanging views and promote knowledge transfer among researchers, academicians, students, and industry professionals. I would like to thank the ICRES 2021 Organizing Committee for their tireless effort and commitment. The committee members under the leaders, leadership of Dr. Salizatul Ilyana as the chairperson have worked hard and dedicated themselves to making this conference a success. Last but not least, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend our gratitude to our sponsors for their generous contribution and support for this momentous event. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the pandemic COVID-19, ICRES 2021 still managed to gather researchers, academicians, students, and industry professionals from various backgrounds to share ideas and research findings from their respective fields. The main objective of organizing this virtual conference is to provide opportunity for researchers and scholars to present their research work to a global audience. Another objective of this conference is to provide opportunity for virtual academic sharing and networking. In addition, the conference also aims to produce high quality research papers for further development to meet the demands on fulfill and fulfill the needs for 21st century research and development R&D. I'll also believe the ICRES 2021 is a great platform to encourage interest 
in research among students. This is in align with the UITM 2025 strategic planning objective, namely to build a strong research ecosystem and producing well-rounded graduates. Ladies and gentlemen, to help us achieve this objective, we are very fortunate to have with us three highly respected academicians. On behalf of the ICRES 2021 organizers, I wish to extend our warm welcome and express my gratitude to our plenary speaker, Professor Datuk Dr. Halimaton Binti Hamdan, Professor of Chemistry from Razak Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University of Technology Malaysia. The keynote speaker from, for Science and Technology, Professor Dr. Tetsuo Soga, Professor from Department of Electrical and Mechanical Engineering, Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan, and the keynote speaker for Social Science, Professor Datuk Dr. Sam Rahayu Binti A. Aziz, the Institution of Malay Roles, Chair, University of Jimara, for their willingness to be part of this conference. I am sure everyone in attendance today is eagerly waiting for the insight that they will be sharing with us in just a while. Ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah, we received good response for the participation. I am proud to announce that we have a total number of 160 presenters for ICRES 2021, 20 invited speakers, 140 presenters, 24 presenters from UITM Dinkil, 38 presenters from other UITM campuses, 71 presenters from other local universities and 12 international presenters. The variety of presentation topics that will be shared today offers opportunity for networking, collaboration and knowledge transfer that can greatly benefit academic institutions and the communities. Ladies and gentlemen, academicians, scholars and students are always on a journey of discovery. We learn from not only books and websites, but from everything around us. Research is an important part of the learning process. If knowledge is the door to wisdom, then research is the key that unlocks it. Thus, our theme for this year, embracing research culture and fostering ex academic excellence, ICRES 2021 aims to encourage the participants to be more research-minded and equip them with informatic information about the world and skills to help them improve their life by practicing academic excellence. Conducting research helps people to make use of what they have learned, nurture their ability, and achieve goals. Therefore, let us together grasp the opportunity provided by this conference and embrace the culture of research. Once again, thank you to the organizing committee for their hard work, to our industry partners for their generosity, and to the experts for graciously sharing their knowledge. This conference was only made possible by your ded dedicated effort and continuously support. I look forward to hearing more amazing contribution from all of you. May we all reach greater height together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Saifullah, for the welcoming remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to the next agenda, let us take a look at a special montage presentation of iCrest 2021.
Next, I am honored to invite Yang Berbahagia Professor Technologist Dr. Hajar Rozia Muhammad Janur, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, exercising the functions of the Vice Chancellor, University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia, to deliver the opening speech and to officiate the conference. Please welcome Professor Technologist Dr. Hajar Rozia Muhammad Janur. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and compassionate. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dr. Saifullah Abdullah, Director Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology Mara. Yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Halimatun Hamdan, Razak Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University Technology Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Tetsuo Soga, Department of Electrical and Mechanical Engineering, Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. 
Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Syam Rahayu Abdul Aziz The Institution of Malay Rulers Chair University Technology Mara Yang berusaha Dr. Sadizato Iliana Chairperson of ICRES 2021 Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning Alhamdulillah, it gives me a great pleasure to address all of you at the International Conference on Research and Practices in Science, Technology and Social Sciences 2021. In short, ICRES 2021. Thank you for joining in from wherever you are in the world. Even though we are into our second year of COVID-19, and are facing some trying times, UITM is indeed proud to host conferences such as ICRES 2021 that gathers dedicated academicians and esteemed participants who have shown resilience to expand research in higher education. With that being said, I am pleased that our special guests for today's event are known researchers from different fields. We have with us our plenary speaker, Professor Datuk Dr. Halimatun Hamdan, who has contributed numerous findings on chemistry and nanotech in her writings. Next is our science and technology keynote speaker from Japan, the prolific Professor Dr. Tetsuo Soga. And last but not least, our social science keynote speaker, Professor Datuk Dr. Sham Rahayu, who is a well-known figure in national affairs, Sharia law, and human rights. With this year's theme of embracing research culture and fostering academic excellence, the shared insights on relevant areas can help us ensure and sustain a strong research culture towards the betterment and advancements of society, especially in this new norm. This team closely depicts all efforts and roles played by various individuals in each unit of an academia like UITM. The university depends largely on academicians whose primary tasks include not only fulfilling the pedagogical aspects of a teaching university, but also research work that require them to constantly seek for new knowledge in respective fields and be able to contextualize their findings within the larger body of research. Hence, this conference is a great platform for a multidisciplinary group of researchers to not only present and exchange ideas, collaborate and publish research findings, but more importantly, these shared findings should be able to pave the new way towards practical solutions to real-world problems as well. With an alliance of industry experts and professionals who will share their experiences and insights on research culture in their organisations, I trust that this can lead the university towards a transformational change that we aim to reach by 2025. The lessons from this conference should proactively nurture young minds and cultivate their interests in research that exposes them to future needs and resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the normalities that we used to have will never be the same as they were before. As we adapt to the effects of the pandemic and rebuild our lives, we must seek and explore new inventive pathways to aid and empower our students, society and industries in this region and beyond. By expanding our expertise in science, technology, humanities and entrepreneurship, we will improve even better and be wiser to face new challenges. In closing, I would like to once again thank our esteemed plenary and keynote speakers for joining us today in exchanging great ideas and enlightening us 
on the importance of a strong research culture. I would also like to applaud the efforts of UITM's Pusat Asasi's organizing committee, led by Professor Saifullah, along with Dr. Salizatul, for his conference's success. To everyone here today, I look forward to more progressive and relevant research findings that will extend beyond conferences, labs, and classrooms to improve the lives and livelihood of our stakeholders. On that note, in the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful, I hereby declare the International Conference on Research and Practices in Science, Technology, and Social Sciences 2021 officially open. Thank you. Wa bilahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Technologist Dr. Haja Rozia, for the meaningful speech and for officiating ICREST 2021. Next, we are honored to introduce our plenary speaker, Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dato Dr. Halimatun Hamdan. Professor Dato Dr. Halimatun is attached to the Raza Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University Technology Malaysia, UTM Kuala Lumpur. She is also the chairperson of Nano Malaysia Institute for Innovative Technology, Nanomite Global Research Consortium, and a council member of Academy Science Malaysia. She received her PhD in Physical Chemistry from University of Cambridge, UK in 1989, her Master's Science degree from Marshall University, USA in 1981, and her Bachelor of Science degree from Indiana University, USA in 1979. In addition, she was also UTM's first female professor at the age of 40. Professor Halimatun has successfully promoted her research and innovative activities globally. She pioneered the zeolites and nanostructured materials research in Malaysia in 1990. Today, she will deliver her speech on socioeconomic impact of scientific research by academics, roles and responsibilities. Please welcome Professor Dato Dr. Halimatun Hamdan. Thank you, Ms. Sakina, for the introduction. I would like to uh, share my slides. Can you all see the slides? Okay. <clears throat> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to participate virtually in ICRES 2021 as a plenary speaker to present a paper entitled Socioeconomic Impact of Scientific Research by Academics, Roles and Responsibilities.
Malaysia, having transitioned from an agriculture-based economy in the post-independence era to a resource and manufacturing-based economy in the 80s and 90s, is now faced with the challenge of shifting to an innovation-led economy. Of course, an innovation-led economy requires the harnessing of innovative science and technology across all sectors in order to generate new knowledge and translate ideas into cutting-edge technologies, products and services, which will lead to the growth of knowledge-based enterprises for wealth creation, economic development and societal well-being. We know that STI will enable us to climb the value ladder in innovation value chains through incremental and radical innovation capacity. However, we should pause and have a reality check on what Malaysia has achieved in the past 63 or 64 years. So looking at this slide, you see that uh, Malaysia is uh, sort of indexed and ranked at the top 25% of the global innovation index, the competitiveness index, the knowledge and the market index. However, we have to consider uh, this ranking has been there for the past 10 years or so, despite the fact that Malaysia was uh, striving to be a developed nation, was supposed to be in 2020, but now it has moved to 2030. So what is the reason behind the uh, start of, of stagnant uh, indexing of the ranking of Malaysia in terms of its competitiveness and innovation. So for that, we need to dive deeper. That means we have to go down under to see what's the reason. So after 63 years, we see that even though generally the ranking of uh, Malaysia in the innovation and the knowledge and talent index is quite commendable, which is in the top 20%. But if we look at the uh, sub-pillar, Malaysia is not doing well because you see that the sub-pillar in the product innovation, Malaysia is ranked 133rd from 137. So is the chapter participation in global value chain, 53rd from 63. And also in the knowledge sector, we are not doing well as well because in the knowledge creation, Malaysia is ranked 75th and the knowledge workers of Malaysia is ranked at 71st out of 126. So we have to embrace the fact that Malaysia must enhance its competitiveness through STI in the frontier industries where Malaysia already has a niche. And we have to increase and improve the quantity and quality of talents and also the research, development and commercialization activities for Malaysia to move up the ladder in innovation value chain. How impactful is RDC towards socio-economic development? The main indicator of the research intensity is the gross expenditure on research and development, or GERD for short. And locally, we see that Malaysia uh, spending on research and development, or the GERD, and the percentage of it from GDP has increased tremendously in the past 10 years. And currently, the ratio of GERD to GDP in Malaysia has reached 1.4%. However, if we look at the data on the left side of the screen, you see that Malaysia is way down 
compared to the other um, innovative developed countries like Korea, Switzerland, Japan, Singapore, and so on, where they have been spending more than 3.5% yeah, of their gross uh, expenditure on R&D. So looking at the innovation ecosystem, it is clear that Malaysia invests too little on experimental development because this is the sector which is required in order for our in Malaysia, for Malaysia to translate the R&D outputs to market. So if you look at the, the data here, Malaysia spends uh, only about 14.6%, the green bar, on experimental development compared to the other countries where you see that China uh, spent almost 83 or 84% yeah, of its investment to the experimental development. So this is another aspect that we have to look at in order for Malaysia to move, yeah, or uh, to move from our developed state to the developing uh, state to the developed state. So where are the researchers? From the data, we see that the distribution of the researchers is totally um, not aligned according to the um, comparatively with the other countries. For example, you look at uh, Malaysia, only 12% researchers in Malaysia is in the business enterprise compared to 80% of the researchers uh, in Korea, which is in the business enterprise. And so are the other countries. Most of the developed countries, uh, the researchers are uh, distributed in the business enterprise are well above uh, 50% of the total uh, quantity of the researchers. So, uh, from in Malaysia as well, you can see that there's uh, only 3% of the business uh, enterprise researchers uh, are having a doctorate um, qualification. So, uh, most of the researchers in Malaysia are in the Institute of Higher Education. About 78% of them are there and they are the academics in the uh, universities. So there's a lot of uh, uh, work that we have to do and we have to deploy these uh, academics and uh, promote their uh, activities, their research activities in the industry so that it can be translated to uh, products and also uh, to the market. Looking at the Malaysia's industries landscape, we know that 98.5% of uh, the business establishments in Malaysia are in a form of small medium enterprises. And these uh, SMEs, they contribute about uh, 36% yeah, to GDP in 2016, and the target is 41%. And, um, and many of these uh, SMEs, they are merely adapters and imitators because they don't uh, do research and development, and they don't develop technology for their industry. And only 6% of uh, Malaysian companies are really creators, while the majority are adapters. This is again supporting what we are facing here, looking at the um, charges for the use of the IPs for Malaysia. So we see that over the years, Malaysia spent so much more in buying technology, like 
uh, USD 1.8 billion in 2017 compared to producing our own technology. So this is the reason why that Malaysia uh, is not climbing the ladder of innovation value chain because we are not, we are merely adapters and we are not producers. So the role of our research community now is to try and promote research and development in, in our case, in the universities, to the industries and to the market. And of course, over the years, we faced many challenges in terms of the uh, marketing and commercialization because there's lack of strategy towards successful commercialization of local IPs, the local patents not being taken up by industries, and uh, the IP commercialization by technology transfer office is quite difficult. The aspiration and objectives of, the Malaysia, of Malaysia is actually to develop a talent pool that facilitates the move into more complex stages of high technology production that meets the demands of Industry 4.0 and Industry 5.0 and the digital economy. And the talent pool should prevail over the challenges of automation and a changing labor market, supported by a robust and well-functioning skill systems to upgrade and upskill the workforce on a continuing basis. And they have to be relevant and competitive. So the data on the right side shows you the current STEM talent distribution. A national study, the science and technology human capital, a strategic planning towards 2020 done in 2012, confirms that Malaysia needs at least 1 million science and technology human capital by 2020, out of which 50% must be skilled workers. So looking at the data now, the current situation is that uh, even though the target is 500,000 high skilled workers, we have managed to reach only 220,000, which is 1.5%. Uh, yeah of the targeted value and compared to the advanced country, countries, the percentage of highly skilled STEM workforce is well above 30%. So ladies and gentlemen, we uh, should really uh, feel uh, lagging behind currently and a lot of things and a lot of work and concerns and thoughts must be put into the effort of increasing and meeting the needs of the, um, uh, the high skill uh, STEM workforce in our country. The factors that is important in making sure that we remain innovative is competency. Competency is a combination of knowledge and skill. So in the Institute of Higher Education, most of the students are uh, imparted with this knowledge uh, in, in the, the various uh, uh, skills, yeah, technical, in the knowledge of the technical, social, economy, and so on. And at the same time, they are also trained to develop uh, their skills in various uh, areas, especially the written and oral communication, leadership, critical thinking, creativity, and so on. So with the <coughs> com successful combination of the knowledge and skill, we hope that we can uh, develop uh, a group of uh, uh, workers with uh, high competency. And we must not forget that leadership is also very important uh, in order to drive the research community 
towards higher level because the leaders must be able to create confidence, breeds enthusiasm, and can work as a team, and a leader must lead. So, so making, considering all these uh, requirements, yeah, we uh, came out with a project way back in 2015, and um, over the uh, five years, the program has already ended in 2020, and I would like to uh, introduce to you and to showcase the strategic research initiative. We name it as Nanomite, or the Malaysian Institute for Innovative Nanotechnology. As a background, Nanomite is a global research consortium consisting of five Malaysian research universities. As members and program leaders and 100 Malaysian scientists collaborating with experts from renowned institutions of higher learning from US, Europe and Asia. The proposal on the formation of Nanomite was approved on 26 September 2013 by the Global Science Innovation Advisory Council, chaired by the Honorary Prime Minister of Malaysia in New York City. And uh, in 2015, Nanomite was launched by the YB Minister of Education too, uh, and UTM was appointed as the Secretariat. Nanomite was awarded a matching grant by the Ministry of Higher Education <coughs> that runs for five years to undertake 18 research project projects under uh, five programs. So the mission of Nanomind is to pursue formal research collaboration. I guess this is the first such uh, research consortium in Malaysia uh, where we do scientific research in collaboration with scientists from world-class universities. And uh, we want to do a high impact yeah, research projects which offers solutions to current industrial problems and coming out with indigenous output and outcome. Along the way, we want to create experts in various areas of nanotechnology through sharing of facilities, resources and skill among the researchers and at the same time produce postgraduates, yeah, a new uh, experts in the field, postgraduates in the form of uh, masters and PhDs, with improved competencies through journal publications, outputs, and also intellectual properties. Most important that this uh, consortium also promotes global mobility through exchange of professors, scientists, teachers, and students. This is the five uh, nano priority nanotechnology agendas under Nanomite. It consists of five programs. Each of the program is led by a research university. We have program one, which is energy led by UTM. And the theme of the program is nanotechnology enable efficient generation of renewable energy. Program two, led by University of Malaya under wellness, medical and healthcare. And the, the topic of the project program is nano aerosol technology for the diagnosis and treatment of smoking related diseases. Then we have program three led by University Putra Malaysia under the food and agriculture sector uh, with the title of the program as Nanotechnology in Detection and Control of Ganoderma Boninase, Program 4 by University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM, under the Electronic Devices and Systems, with the uh, topic of Development of Graphene-Based Nano-Electro-Mechanical Systems, NEMS, Sensors and Devices, and Program 5 led by University Science Malaysia, under the environmental sector, 
with green technology and nanomaterial applications for the mitigation, mitigation of greenhouse gases. Under each program uh, led by the university under each team, for example, like energy led by UTM, we do uh, various projects which are related to our main th the team of the uh, project. So uh, overall, over the uh, five uh, programs, we undertake uh, 18 research projects uh, consisting of comprising of researchers from uh, various universities, not only the research universities, but we also have members, uh, researchers from the uh, private universities and also the uh, MTON, yeah, the technical universities as well. So this is the list of the projects that was undertaken, that were undertaken under Nanomite for the, in the past uh, five years. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have seen a short preview of Nanomite and after five years, we have uh, already completed all the research projects and I am very pleased to uh, show you the output of Nanomite. So far, we have uh, successfully created uh, in both uh, get the involvement of 112 academic experts in nanotechnology. These are the local uh, researchers from the research universities and the public universities in Malaysia. And uh, we have also produced five postdoc scientists in nanotechnology, 118 postgraduates, 
where 61 of them with a PhD qualifications. And in the publications, we managed to produce or publish 213 journal publication in index uh, journals, where six, 68 of them are in Q1 yeah, journals, mm -hmm. and 107 publications in a form of books, proceedings, and thesis, and also 26 patents, copyrights, and certificates. So besides that, um, each of the program managed to produce products, prototypes, and also technology uh, for to be uh, upgraded yeah, uh, into the uh, pre-commercialization uh, stage. And uh, another success factor of uh, Nanomite is that we have managed to form many uh, strategic partners around the world, which include the renowned university like MIT, Harvard, Imperial College London, University of Cambridge, the University of Negri, uh, the, the Institute Technology Bandung, yeah, and also with the various industries in Malaysia and also uh, overseas. And uh, the first three years was uh, very busy for Nanomite because we managed to organize research visits, meetings, and workshops. But unfortunately, after uh, in 2019, um, most of our work was uh, delayed because of the pandemic, yeah, the MCO. But um, uh, luckily, many of the projects uh, were already in the final stage. So uh, for the past five years, we also managed to organize annual symposiums, Nanomite annual symposiums, uh, with the collaboration with uh, Malaysian Nanotechnology Association and also the Ministry of Higher Education and Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. At the end of the um, part of uh, uh, Nanomite, we organize uh, the impact assessment in order to look at what is the impact of Nanomite, yeah? uh, whether it has successfully um, uh, impacted or meet the requirement and our uh, initial objectives. So the objectives of Nanomite, there's uh, four of them, which is to provide a uh, global platform for scientific research development and enabling empowerment of national nanotechnology capabilities and skills. Second objective is to drive nanotechnology-based industries for economic development and people's well-being. Third objective is to support government's implementation of a sustainable economy by focusing on engaging active world-class nanotechnology scientists at home and abroad. And also the fourth objective is to showcase the culture of science, research and economics of emerging science. So uh, the impact assessment primarily focus on the objectives of the program based on the research output of Nanomite and also the primary data captured from uh, the uh, leaders and contributors of Nanomite. The first uh, assessment was based on the social capital data analysis, which uh, is used to provide visibility to a consortium research network and individual publication weightage by measuring the social development of the researchers through their collaboration in the projects. So through this uh, data, the whatever the output that is come out from uh, publication that comes out from the programs is being uh, analyzed to look at its uh, uh, social network in terms of bridging, centrality, and tie strength. So bridging is the connection between the clusters. Centrality is whether um, the program managed to create uh, central authors or many central authors and also the um, 
the tile, the Simelian tile formation between the uh, publications in the programs. So generally, the analysis result shows, uh, managed to show the leadership style of each of the program. So as is a consortium, so we, we, uh, we manage to uh, produce directive leadership in some of the programs versus uh, servant uh, leadership in uh, the other parts of the program. So in order for consortium to uh, develop yeah, further and to innovate, we need uh, directive uh, leaders. So for the future, then we know that uh, in order to create a good uh, or successful research consortium, we need to find uh, directive leaders. Yeah. And then uh, the high uh, trust simulian ties within the publication networks in specific clusters is uh, required for further development of ideas because Simelian ties enable members to develop trust, cohesiveness and norms which contribute to effectiveness. And uh, the programs also show that, uh, that they have uh, many central authors in the publication network and uh, that indicates that they have many uh, influential uh, persons in the, uh, in the program, in the consortium. And uh, evidently, um, Nanomite has uh, uh, produced or managed to form many strategic international uh, collaboration. Another uh, aspect of the impact assessment is on technology readiness level, which is based on the EU, uh, EU 2016. So the TRL, yeah, for short, the technology readiness level uh, will indicate at which level that the, the project has achieved. Is it in the basic level, which is one, two, three, in the research of the fundamental or basic level, or is it in the development level, which is TRL 4, 5, and 6, where um, many of the projects yeah, uh, have found or managed to reach up to uh, TRL 6, which is the technology demonstrated in relevant environment. And uh, most important that uh, we want to see that there's an uh, opportunity for all these projects to move up the technology readiness level to level seven, eight, and nine in the future. So this is in line with the um, the experimental yeah, development research that is required in order to increase the innovativeness and competitiveness ranked of uh, Malaysia. The intellectual property quality assessment is based on uh, uh, using the qualitative matrix, yeah, as shown here, for a program level assessment of the IP quality. So it's divided into six. We have uh, highly central uh, inventors, star inventors, repeated collaboration, international collaboration, industry adoption, and imitability. So uh, Nanomite has produced, in general, yeah, the overall score of uh, two, in general, the overall score of above two, which shows that uh, we have uh, successfully, in some cases, uh, achieved the highest level to the highest uh, level three in all aspects of the, inter, uh, the quality of the intellectual property of uh, the projects. So to summarize, uh, for the past uh, five years, Nanomite has showcased, successfully showcased the value of collaboration. Being a consortium, we managed to um, adapt shared vision, shared ownership, shared risk, 
shared resources, shared outcomes, shared knowledge and technology, and also develop mutual trust among the researchers. So moving further, what we need now for Malaysia is to bridge the gap. We need a system by design, not choice. We need a skill system that prepares talent for high income economy and science and technology skill jobs and provides continuing training that improves potential for staff progression and leads to increased productivity and efficiencies. And over the years, we have identified the gap. Why don't we have the skill system that we aspire? These are the gaps, yeah? Because we found that there's disparities between the skill sets required in the job market and skill sets are currently being developed. And there's a gap in the provision of mid-career learning, insufficient investment and partnerships between employer, employee, learner and provider, insufficient flexibility and transferability of learning, low proportion of STEM graduates due to unattractive remuneration schemes, and Malaysia is still a consumer society, and we are still developing economy, although we hope that we wanted, that we aspired to be a developed economy by now, but we need to do a lot of work to transform our uh, mm -hmm. society to be consumer, uh, from the consumer society to a prosumer uh, society. And uh, the government has not uh, uh, sat still. And uh, in last year, they launched the Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama. This the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030. And we see that... Uh, Collaboration is the basic uh, platform for this uh, uh, shared vision to be uh, realized. So it's very important for us to collaborate between the industry, the government, the academy, and also the society. And with that also, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation launched the National Policy STI uh, 2021 to 2030, where the goals of this policy is high technician and from, uh, from technology user to technology producer, link STI to economy and emphasize on impact rather than KPI only. So this is the 1010 My STIE framework. Uh, launched by MOSTI uh, end of last year. So as academics, I think, uh, and researchers and scientists, we uh, need to study this and take the opportunity uh, of this policy that is being offered by the uh, country. And they also launch the uh, Malaysian socio-economy drivers and also the science and technology drivers uh, where uh, we should uh, identify with this, uh, the socio-economic drivers, there's 10 of them, so namely energy, business, financial services, culture, arts and tourism, medical health care and so on. And uh, we have to uh, collaborate with the science and technology drivers the sensor technology, advanced materials, augmented analytics, and so on. So they have done quite a lot of work in uh, identifying yeah, these uh, drivers uh, and all the socio-economic drivers and the science and technology drivers. And they hope that uh, for Malaysia to move on, we need to uh, adapt this uh, uh, science and technology driver system to to the, our research 
development and commercialization activities. Further, they have also identified the national niche areas for 10 socioeconomic drivers for the next five years. So you can have a look at this, there's 30 of them and uh, how you can, uh, if you have developed uh, skill and knowledge in these areas, then you can be part of the uh, these areas yeah, to undertake uh, RDC and help the, com the, the innovation of, the, of Malaysia. So um, we also need to look at the future of work uh, environment due to the rapid changes on an exponential scale driven by advances in technology. So the scores, skills of future talent are centered on learning. So uh, we have to design and build a system of uh, workers for the country, which is aligned to the future work environment characteristics and structure as shown in the slides because the future work environment is a, a bit different from what we are facing now. So the question is, where can we contribute? Yeah. So after um, discussing uh, all the achievements, the challenges and the hopes that uh, required for Malaysia to climb the, the ladder of innovation. So we can look at this and see uh, in which part of areas that uh, we as academics can uh, contribute. So the end game to finalize is that we need to invest in nurturing the workforce of the future, in particular by direct involvement in RDC to strengthen our knowledge, practice our skill and expertise, to nurture talents who are competent to produce indigenous technology for the consumption of the society. And today's educators must prepare students for jobs that don't yet exist, using technologies not yet invented to solve problems not yet identified. So the criteria of talents in the future is that the talent must be able to learn, unlearn, relearn, co-learn and co-create. And we need to provide the, the training yeah, and the knowledge through our research and development activities so that we can create job seekers, oh, sorry, uh, we can transform yeah, or we can create job creators, not job seekers for Malaysia. Okay, so with that, I end uh, my speech and thank you for your uh, cooperation. Thank you very much, Professor Dato Dr. Halimatun, for your inspiring presentation and sharing about the socio-economic impact of scientific research by academics, roles and responsibilities. Ladies and gentlemen, the organizers of ICREST 2021 would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to our diamond sponsor, Brave Oilfield Services Engineering, BOSS, for their contribution to this momentous event. Now, I am honored to invite Mr. Riza Ramli Ambak, General Manager, Corporate Strategy, 
of Brave Oilfield Services Engineering to deliver his speech on the introduction of Brave Oilfield Services Engineering to UITM. Please welcome Mr. Riza Ramli Ambak. Uh, my apologies, yeah, Mr. Riza, please uh, unmute your mic. Thank you. Hello, can hear? Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here at this second virtual conference ICRAS 2021. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Dr. Saifullah Abdullah, the Director of Center of Foundation Studies, UITM, Dr. Salizatul Liana Ibrahim, the chairperson of ICRES 2021, and of course the committee members who have made this conference successful. Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Riza Ramli Amba, uh, General Manager of Business and Corporate Strategy at Brave Oilfield Services in uh, Unfortunately, uh, my CEO, uh, Cik Bhatia, uh, has something come up but he will join us shortly. Okay, just to let you know uh, a little bit of information about Brave. Uh, Brave Oilfield Services Engineering Sambahat was incorporated in 2017. Nevertheless, the, the people experience and strength accumulated behind Brave is about 98 years. It is a 100% booster company that has been involved in the oil and gas industries, focusing on upstream, midstream, downstream, on services and maintenance for both onshore and offshore sectors. And inshallah, Brave in gearing to be another competitive EPC and EPCIC in oil and gas sector. Apart of, from businesses, Brave is also gearing as a subject matter expert in collaborating with TVEX Lango to provide additional syllabus in technical and engineering to develop and upskill youngsters on their careers enhancements, especially in the oil and gas sector. This is part of Brave initiative to contributing back to the society. Okay, um, during the short video about Brave, uh, if you have any question, please uh, bring it up uh, the Q&A session after this video, if there is. Okay, um, without further ado, uh, let's watch this video about Brave. Thank you.
Mr. Riza for sharing about the introduction of Brave Oilfield Services Engineering to UITM. For your information, we have a special guest together with us today, Mr. Bakhtia Safwad Baharudin, Chief Executive Officer, CEO of Brave Oilfield Services Engineering. Thank you, Mr. Bakhtia, for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment that we have all been waiting for has finally arrived. The winners of the Best Presenter Awards. First off, on behalf of the organizers, we would like to thank all the participants for your submissions. Without further ado, I will now announce the Best Presenters. For Physical Sciences, our heartiest congratulations to Dr. Wan Muhammad Ashraf Wan Mahmud with his paper, Sustainable Microalgal Biofuel Production from Chlorella vulgaris and Nanochloropsis Species Using Renewable Terpenic Solvents. Congratulations as well to Dr. Nora Shikin Matsale with her paper, Dispersive Solid Phase Extraction Coupled with High Performance Liquid Chromatography for the Extraction of Phenol from Water. For Biological Sciences, congratulations to Associate Professor Dr. Aisha Bujang with her paper, Physical Mechanical and Antimicrobial Properties of Biodegradable Plastic Incorporated with Zingiber Officinal Essential Oils. Congratulations to Dr. Izva Riza Hazmi with her paper, Foraging Behavior of the Stingless Bee, Tetragona Apicalis and its responses towards temporal and climatological factors. For Information Technology, Engineering and Mathematics, congratulations to Ms. Nur Hidayatul Hikmi Mazan with her paper, Prototype of Grey Water Treatment Using Arduino. Congratulations to Mr. Cairo Yusri Zamri with his paper, The Effects of 10 User Interface Elements on Game Design Process. For Social Sciences and Humanities, congratulations to Dr. Haslinda Husaini with her paper, A Preliminary Analysis in the Therapeutic Landscape of Malaysian Public Libraries. Last but not least, congratulations to Mr. Faris Junaidi Muhammad Junos with his paper, Rights of Education, Review of the Conditions of Students in Learning Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic. Once again, we would like to congratulate all the eight winners of the Best Presenter Awards. 
Ladies and gentlemen, now the time has finally come for our keynote speech sessions. Before we end the opening ceremony, I would like to remind you to stay tuned until the end of the sessions to fill in the registration form for the e-certificate. I will now pass the floor to Dr. Hussein Haniba as the moderator for the first keynote speech. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much, um, uh, Ms. Asakinato, for the introduction. And also, yes, I'm very happy to have uh, the uh, to uh, moderate these sessions. So I'm going to start. So Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Before I proceed to the next sessions, to ensure the effectiveness of the visual conference, I would like to get feedback regarding the quality of the visual and the audio of the com of this conference. Kindly respond to by letting me know if there's anything that I can improve or attend to. Can you hear my voice clearly? I think, yes, thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Sakina. So, to show a respect to, as a sign of our respect uh, to the speaker, please silence your phones and mute your speaker during the parallel sessions. So, okay. Our invited speaker, distinguished guest, and ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be here as a moderator for iCRAS Virtual Conference 2021. I would like to moderate this keynote speaker sessions. My name is again, I would like to say chemist Dr. Hussein Haniba, uh, one of the lecturers from uh, Asasi, UITM, for the Center of the Foundation. So on behalf of the organizing committee, we wish to extend our warm welcome. Selamat datang. I notice a lot of uh, familiar face on this during this conference. It, and also representative from uh, participating institutes, foreign and local participants to our second ICRAS Virtual Conference 2021, organized by Center of Foundations Studies, U uh, University Technology Mara, Chawangan Selangor Campus, Dunkil. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that the conference is joined by more than 145 participants ranging from researchers, industrial experts, and professionals. Esteemed participants are gathered here today to share their latest research fund, uh, findings and to share their knowledge expertise on the science, technology, and social science. It is hope, hope that they uh, newly gain knowledge from this uh, society as a whole. So, without further ado, I really hope uh, like to introduce our keynote speaker, which is a Professor Dr. Tezus Soga. Oh, hi, Kuchamas Sensei. How are you? Oh, oh gozaimasu. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, morning. Yeah, I can hear you, Prof. So how's uh, how your picture are quite static, uh, Prof? Your video. Mm, oh. Okay, now I can see. Yes. Okay, let me introduce Prof. This is I'm be, I will read to the the uh, profile a bit before we really start. So just a moment. Okay. So Professor Dr. Tezu Soga is actually from. the Department of Technology Japan. So Professor Prof Tezu Soga received a PhD degree from the Nagoya University in 1987. I'm sure I'm very young on that during the, that day and you already get a PhD. <laughs> okay. He was a researcher associate from 19... 1987 to 1992, and associate professor from 1992 to 2005 at Nagoya Institute of Technology. From 2005, he has been uh, a professor of the Nagoya Institute of Technology. He has published more than, I would like to highlight again, 
more than 400 paper publications and has a H index of a 44. This is a big achievement. I can I can say this is a very very good achievement in your fields, Prof. So uh, uh, and also his current research deals with the nanostructure material for energy and conversion device. So without further ado, I'm sure our audience are so excited with your presentation today. Definitely, we are going to have a wonderful session with Prof. Soga. So without any further ado, I'm sure let's start with Professor Soga for the session. Prof, I pass the session to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to present at ICRES 2021. I'm Tetsuo Soga from Nagoya Institute of Technology, NITEC Japan. Today, I'm going to present on nanotechnology for sustainable energy. First, let me introduce Nagoya and NITEC briefly. Nagoya is located in almost the center of Japan, and it is say, famous for Nagoya Castle, Tokugawa Shogunate family, uh, and the uh, Nagoya area is the uh, largest in the industrial area in Japan, with Toyota, Honda, Mitsubishi, Brother, uh, and so on, a lot of manufacturing company. And uh, uh, this is uh, a collaboration between UITM and NITEC, uh, MOU, MOU between UITM and NITEC was signed in 2005. After that, we did a, a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh, th 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 this is the international co conference in 2007. Uh, th this is me, me, me. and uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Saifora. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Professor Russo. And uh, oh, uh, we invited a, a young researcher and a student by JSPS pro program and Sakura Science program and so on. Oh, okay, uh, so uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, after re reviewing the future energy, I'll talk on nanotechnology and nanomaterial in general and move to nanotechnology in solar cell, the nanostructural solar cell. It means dye sensitized solar cell, organic solar cell, a pair of solar cell. And finally, I'll summarize my talk. Uh, you, you know, we are facing a lot uh, terrible uh, environmental problems, such as uh, pollution, flood, melting ice cap caused by global warming. Wa warming. The uh, global temperature has increased in the last 50 years. Uh, th this is a global temperature. Uh, global temperature anomaly and uh, uh, that this year and the temperature. So the temperature also increased in last 50 years. And uh, it, it is said that the, uh, it is due to the fossil, fossil fuel sources a uh, major cause of uh, greenhouse gas emission. So in, in, in order to reduce the temperature, we need to reduce the consumption of fossil fuel sources. 
So uh, the, this big view graph shows a uh, world primar primary energy consumption. Th this increase is almost similar to the behavior of the temperature increase. And blue is oil, and light blue is natural gas, and black is coal. And small uh, green is a renewable energy, wind and solar. So the two in, in, uh, in, it decrease the consumption of fossil fuel. It, we need to increase the portion of wind and solar energy in the future. So the problem is how to increase the portion of renewable energy in the future. But this is a very big issue now. So move to the uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials. Na nanotechnology uh, means uh, it is a scale about atomic or molecular level with materials or devices around one to 100 nanometers. So th this is a size of material. So uh, nano, uh, na na nanomaterial is uh, uh, around like this, uh, back, Buckminster flooring, hemoglobin, coronavirus size. Uh, this is usually called uh, nanomaterials. So it is said that nanotechnology will contribute to the energy environment medicine, bio, me mechanics, devices, health, architecture, and, and so on. So nanotechnology will contribute to various fields. Uh, th th this is a feature of nanomaterial. There are a lot of features, but uh, I select someone. First, it, it is possible to change the physical properties at uh, the nanoscale for bulk, strength, thermal conductivity, reflectivity. Second, uh, nanomaterials have the ability to self-assemble or self-organize and can be changed into ordered structures spontaneously. Third, nanostructured materials have a high surface area, so more pretty create who are, the, who are interacting with other materials. So in, in sum, summarize, the uh, advantage of uh, nanomaterial is uh, band gap is tunable, mechanical strong, flexible, large absorption coefficient, high surface area, tuning of DOS density of state is possible uh, and uh, other uh, the, uh, a lot of advantage. For, for, for example, uh, this is a density of state in nanostructure. Uh, it's a bulk. The case of bulk is a parabolic de density of DOS, but uh, uh, 1D confinement the, uh, the density of state become like this, 2D confinement become like this, 3D confinement, it means quantum dot, it becomes like, uh, like this. So by changing the uh, structure in nanoscale, we can tune the uh, st structure of density of state. So uh, this is an example. Uh, so if we change the size of uh, crystal size, we can change the emission 
uh, this is a uh, emission from cadmium selenide. Uh, so in the uh, size large red emission, but the small size blue emission. So we can change the uh, color of the uh, emission. But the, this is an example of carbon material. Uh, this is bulky carbon and this is nano carbon. B bulky carbon is usually graphite, a pencil, and uh, diamond uh, jewelry. And uh, uh, graphite is a conductor and diamond is the insulator. Uh, but uh, in the nano carbon, for example, uh, graphene, carbon nanotube, flame, it is semiconductor. So we can it, it change the properties of the uh, material. Uh, for, for, the, for example, this is a carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube is a diameter of around one to three nanometer, length a few micrometer, and very, very high conductivity. Uh, but uh, uh, like, like this, and uh, it is uh, uh, black, uh, as shown in this figure. Uh, but it is uh, spread uh, to the film like this. Uh, we can make a carbon nanotube film by, by the spray method. So, uh, so it, it, if the thickness very thin, we can make a, a, a transparent film. <laughs> so by changing the thickness, we can make low transparent film to a highly transparent film. And we can ch change the uh, heat resistance also. <clears throat> so uh, it, the property is still uh, inferior to the uh, ITO film, but, but uh, there's a room for the future improvement. And, uh, and if the graphene is used, more highly transparent film is possible. For example, one single layer graphene is trans uh, absorbance is about only 3%. So uh, transmittance at around 50, uh, 96 or 97% uh, is possible by the uh, monolayer graphene. So uh, th this film can be used for the transparent uh, film for the uh, solar cell applications. So, so uh, ne next uh, we'll move to the nanostructures nano in solar cell. So as you know, uh, this is a solar spectrum, uh, a spectrum of solar radiation. Uh, solar radiation in include from uh, UV light to the infrared light. So it, we need to combat all four range of photons to the electricity. So uh, this, this is a, a conventional silicon solar cell. Uh, it is used in roof, mega solar, uh, and so on. And this uh, silicon solar cell is clean, abundant energy. Solar light is free sufficient energy, maintenance free, and the uh, structure, structure is like this. Uh, but, but there is a theoretical limit in the efficiency and also high production process. Uh, there are a lot of problems for the future. So new types is, new type of solar cell is expected. So new, new type of solar cell is 
there are a lot of studies, organic solar cell, dye-sensed solar cell, quantum dot solar cell, perovskite solar cell. There are a lot of work has been done. So in mo mo most of the advanced solar cell nano technology has been used. Oh, oh, so, uh, so nanotechnology and solar cell is the uh, next new uh, research uh, subject. So I uh, wrote one book from nanostructure materials for solar cell, uh, solar energy conversion in 2007 uh, from Elsevier. So, uh, so I'll talk on some solar cell properties. First is a dye-sensitized solar cell. The solar cell structure is like this. It is made of TiO2 nanoparticle. Usually, nanoparticle size is 10 to 14 nanometers. Uh, and uh, it has uh, work with dye, electrolyte, and uh, glass substrate, and counter electrode. So the principle is like this. Uh, photons excite the electron in dye, and the excited electron mo move to the TiO2, uh, and uh, then uh, FTO glass, uh, uh, and uh, the fall come to the uh, electron come to the uh, this state uh, through the uh, oxidize oxidization of iodide to three iodide. So uh, I have I have uh, done a lot of experiment. But today I'll show you the effect of silver nanoparticle. So what, what happened if the silver nanoparticle is incorporated in uh, DSCSC? DSCSC means TiO2, like this. Uh, white particle is TiO2, and gray is uh, silver. First is a uh, plasmonic effect. And another one is uh, uh, light scattering by silver nanoparticle. Uh, so uh, plasmonic effect, the two effect, one's localized surface plasma resonance, uh, optical absorption is enhanced by the electric field near the surface, and also plasma induced charge separation. Uh, charge separation at the uh, null particle sem semiconductor interface. So, how, how to make a, a silver null particles? Uh, this is a very simple pr procedure. F f first, uh, uh, extract the uh, from the that this is flower and mix in the silver nitrate solution and star and fold. Then a silver nanoparticle particle can be uh, synthesized. It's a very uh, environmental friendly technique. So uh, this is a, a TM image of silver nanoparticles. Uh, uh, today I, I don't present the detail, but the, it is we can synthesize several kinds of nanoparticles depending on the uh, synthesis conditions. So this is a side. Uh, silver one is from, size is from 10 to 40, 
は、シルバー、トゥイズ、あれ、スモーラー、スモーラー。ワンナノメーターは、フィフティンナノメーター。ライブです。シルバー、セブン、ザット、あれ、ビッグワン。そうですね、サマリー。で、ティザーパーティクルサイズ。And the light figure is a absorption. So by changing the particle size, we can change the absorption of the、uh, silver n a n o p a r t i c l e So, we、uh, mix the silver n a n o p a r t i c l e in the TiO2 and made, made a disensitized solar cell. So,、uh, this, this is a、uh, UV visible spe-、uh, absorption spectrum of silver n a n o p a r t i c l e and it has、uh, 470 nanometer. And、uh, th- this is a、uh, XRD of silver nanoparticles. <clears throat> so,、uh, this is absorption spectra of the film. So,、uh, as you can see, it's not, it not clear.、Uh, with the increase of silver nanoparticles, the、uh, absorption Is increasing. You can see. So, so the,、uh, uh, when we make a solar cell properties, the property of solar cell is also increased. Right ones, I v current voltage characteristics. And the right here is a, a percentage of silver nanal particle and、uh, short circuit current, power conversion efficiency, p i l e factor, and voltage. So by doping the、uh, silver nanal particle, they improved. So this improvement is due to the plasmatic effect of silver nanal particles. So, ne- next,、uh, we dope the、uh, s- small molecule in the zinc oxide based DSSC. Small molecule is a nickel tetrafenyl propylene. <coughs> so, by this、uh, molecule doping, we can modify the optoelectronic properties. And enhance the charge collection efficiency. And so it is expected to be,、uh, have a good performance. So uh, this, this uh, uh, surface morphology for different、uh, amount of nickel tetrafenyl propylene. Without doping, it's very smooth. But with the doping, surface, surface become a little rough. Uh, this uh, XRD of、uh, nickel tetrafenyl propylene doped zinc oxide film. So without NITPP, only the zinc oxide peak is appeared. But with the increase of NITPP, NITTP peak gradually increased. And、uh, th- this pink curve shows the、uh, NITPP spectrum. So, and uh, uh, this is、uh, the absorbance of the、uh, zinc NY nickel tetrafenyl polypene incorporated zinc oxide film. 
uh, anyway, TPP has a, a absorption at around four and twenty two nanometers. So with the increase of anyway, TPP, this peak increases. So compared to the without doping, the uh, absorption uh, absorption is increased. So uh, this uh, current voltage characteristics of the device. So without doping black one, it is a little small efficiency, but with the doping, the voltage, voltage is almost a constant, not, not changed, but the current uh, in, increased a lot. So uh, this uh, graph with an increase of uh, nickel tetrafluoropyrin, uh, open stack voltage, fill factor is a constant, but uh, uh, short current in increase like this. So th this improvement is explained by the is suppression of uh, back uh, transfer like this. So uh, next we will talk on the uh, K uh, organic solar cell. Organic solar cell can be fabricated on flexible plastic substrate like this. Uh, flexible and lightweight using the plastic substrate and it is very low cost because vacuum process, no vacuum pro process. And very thin layer, uh, less than 100 nanometer. Due to the large absorption coefficient, <clears throat> so uh, th th this is a structure of organic solar cell. In this experiment, uh, zinc oxide and and silver nanoparticle was uh, doped in the organic film. This is uh, a conventional structure. ITO glass substrate and P dot PSS whole transport layer, uh, aluminum and so electrode. So between aluminum electrode and P dot PSS, uh, active layer is P3HT and PCBM. And in this uh, zinc oxide, silver was doped. So fa fabrication process is uh, uh, like this. Uh, all the film was uh, coated by the spin coating. P dot PSS spin coating, active layer spin coating, and annealing, and uh, uh, alumina was evaporated, formed by evaporation. So uh, th this is uh, a uh, spectral response of the field, uh, de device. No, no, normal means uh, uh, cell without doping. So uh, not, not, not so clear, but uh, with the doping of silver, the uh, uh, peak shift to the shorter wavelength side. <clears throat> this effect is also the effect of localized surface plasma resonance. So it means optical absorption is enhanced by the electrical field near the nanoparticle surface. 
So we, we measure the uh, electrochemical, electrochemical impedance by changing the frequency. Uh, uh, this is uh, a fundamental biograph uh, uh, of equivalent circuit and uh, the impedance called, called plot for a different frequency. When the frequency change, uh, the uh, it become impedance become like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, we can ch change the frequency that, that one prime, we can me measure the peak uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th this is a uh, plot. From this plot, what we can say is uh, R1 and R2. So uh, we can say uh, th this is the R1, uh, right side is R2. So we can say that we is doping the uh, silver nanoparticle. Uh, R1 and also R2 is reduced. So it means we can get good properties, better properties. So this is due to the R1 is reduced by the reduction of series resistance, and R2 is due to the charge carrier transport reaction is reduced. So we can estimate the mo mo mobility also. So uh, uh, as you can see by the uh, doping silver nanoparticle, uh, mobility is uh, enhanced, means the, uh, the uh, good film uh, was uh, obtained by the silver nanoparticles. So, so finally, we'll talk on the perovskite solar cell. A perovskite solar cell uh, is a very new, very new topic in a few years, five or six years. <clears throat> The, but the structure is almost similar to the solar cell or organic solar cell. The difference is the uh, active layer is a perovskite material. So a perovskite ma ma material is a perovskite structure is like, like this. PB and I, uh, iodide, uh, methyl ammonium, like this. And the sickness is very thin, uh, five, uh, less than 100 nanometer. Then we can get very, very high efficiency. But, but uh, now, the nanotechnology in perovskite solar cell is not, not so uh, studied. It is a new research field, I think. There are a few. Uh, fabrication method, such a uh, most common method is a s s spin coating and uh, evaporation and CBD uh, is uh, oh, uh, usually used. So, but, but the uh, one, one, one problem of the solar uh, perovskite solar cell is uh, the lead is uh, used. Lead is a poison element. And also, uh, this, this material degradation is first. First, degraded. So now we are trying to make uh, uh, lead free perovskite solar cell. We don't 
so the detail and a similar process by the spin coating we can make a, a dead free pelvical thrust cell so we, now we show that the time between uh, the timing of spin coating was changed this result i show you By changing that timing of spin coating, we can change the color only zero minutes to 10 minutes. We can change the color of the film like this from black to orange. And the band gap is also changed very much 1.82 electron volt to 2.1 fiber electron volt. The reported one is 2.04 electron volt. So uh, absorption is very high. And uh, it's very interesting to show, show that by the changing of the time, uh, we can change the surface structure Nanostructure very much. Uh, as you can see, uh, the 10 minutes, it is a little big structure, but uh, uh, one minute, very, very fine nanoflake structure. So this structure will can, uh, uh, is, it is possible to change the uh, morphology from nanoflake structure to microflake structure. And uh, I think this is, will contribute to the solar cell improvement. Mm. 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 Recently, we could get uh, nanofiber by the spin coating. Uh, this is a nanofiber structure uh, by the spin coating. Nanofiber structure uh, will contribute to the a uh, dead free perovskite solar cell uh, maybe maybe it, it improves the uh, uh, solar cell performance oh, oh okay uh, th this is a conclusion of my presentation first uh, the pr prospect of future energy especially the improve importance of renewable energy was briefly reviewed Second, the advantage of nanomaterials was briefly reviewed. Third, the nanostructured solar cell, such as diacensitized solar cell, organic solar cell, and the perovskite solar cell were briefly explained. Fourth, the improvement of nanostructured solar cells with nanotechnology was demonstrated. Uh, so I'd like to thank the, uh, these uh, researchers, Dr. Kishi, Dr. Kato, Dr. Yasser, Dr. Sarabana, Dr. Mr. Kato, Mr. Suzuki, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, Mr. Father Rachoi. He's now uh, in my lab from UITM. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Soga, for your wonderful and interesting presentations. And I think a very detailed and very organized presentation about the nanomaterial. Uh, Prof. Soga, in fact, I will really attracted to your uh, presentation, especially I myself also dealing with the nanomaterial and in the particular field of a solid polymer electrolyte. So I'm doing for the battery system and so on. So that's part of my research. Of course, I'm sure our audience have, uh, of course, now we will open the session for a Q&A because I'm sure a lot of audience, they might have in the mind some question to ask Prof or maybe need some clarification for Prof from the, uh, uh, maybe advice as well from the research on the nanomaterial and so on. 
So uh, for the our, our audience, if you have a question, you can ask straight away or put it in the chat box so I can read through as well. Prof, meanwhile, waiting for the question, may I ask a some fundamental question as well about this, Prof? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Prof, I'm attracted when you're talking about the conductivity of the material because the, I noticed the, you are using the EI, uh, EIS system, impedance, to measure the conductivity. But one of my concerns is, Prof, about the conductivity of a, such a complex system. Because I noticed you put some nanomaterial, silver, and also you have a thin film, which is a polymer structure material. So I'm about, uh, I would like to uh, get some answer. How we sure, how can we know that which material contribute the conductivity for that particular film? Because it is, we are measuring the conductivity of the overall system. But if they are asking which one contribute most, so, how can you advise us, Prof, about the conductivity? Mm, yeah. Yes. So, uh, I, I, I don't know how to explain. <laughs> uh, so, uh, maybe if, Dr. Aini uh, also uh, here. If the uh, highly conductive nanomaterials drop the current. Uh, co conductivity is determined by the high co conductive film. For, for example, when the carbon nanotube is dropped in the organic material, it is very, it becomes highly conductive film and uh, not pro pro property or is not so changed. Or optical pro without changing optical properties, Electric property increase. So means the conductivity because it's a quite complex system. Sorry, Prof, if I'm misunderstood. Then is do you think that it, conductivity is mainly from that nano uh, comp components or no nano materials only? Yeah, uh, uh, it reflects the conductivity of nano materials. So how about the dopant that we put into the system, such as the as this now notice like a zinc oxide and also the silver material, do they contribute significantly about the conductivity as, as well, uh, Prof? Yeah, uh, uh, so, sorry, I I could not catch you. <laughs> Okay, Prof. Uh, are you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I can hear you. Yeah, sorry, Prof, uh, about the uh, connections. So, is the other material also... Uh, so, you're trying to say the conductivity is mainly from nanochip only? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's true, uh, Prof. <laughs> Prof, okay, do you have an idea? Do you have an idea? What is the conductivity range for this kind of material? The range. Mm, mm, yeah. Uh, it, it depends on the mm -hmm. ma ma material. So uh, I, I don't know how to. <laughs> okay. Explain. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, at the audience, uh, do you have a question? You, of course, you can proceed as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. And hello, uh, Professor Soga. Uh, uh, hi, yeah, aside for us. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Eh? Thank you to share your knowledge in our uh, ICRAS 2021. Actually, Prof. Soga, actually, they are looking forward to come face to face eh, to the PSASC, but hopefully, uh, later, uh, if the situation is uh, good, so we can meet in PSASC. Eh? Okay, uh, so my simple question, Prof. Eh? 
Okay, mm -hmm. I think you are mentioned about the flexible solar cells just now, yeah. Okay, uh, so now which status actually is it uh, already commercialized for the flexible solar cell? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it not not to commercialize it yet, but it, it is uh, t t tested. Uh, 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 can, can, can you see this? Yes, bro. Uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, flexible solar cell is already made in Japan and also uh, uh, USA or Europe and relatively very large area and it is tested the degradation test or stability test is performed. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, so they are uh, what 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 is the, what is the substrate actually? They are using polymer or the metal substrate, Prof. Uh, 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 P P E T PET or P E N PET or PEN. I, I don't know in this case. Uh, so mean polymer substrate, Prof. Eh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Prof, uh, maybe one of the things that you have highlighted earlier is about flexible. The film mm -hmm. need to be flexible and transparent. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Prof, why it is important to be transparent? Um, yeah. I do not know about it. Is that... Yeah. Uh, yeah for, for example, uh, if, if it's uh, transparent, uh, we can. Uh, th 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 this is a, a solar cell, uh, so if mm -hmm. we can make th this uh, uh, cell by using the semi-transparent. Mm -hmm. it, it by the silicon we cannot make th this structure. Uh, light pa light pass and also uh, generate electricity generate. To have a flexible uh, yeah. uh, surface, isn't it? So we uh, yeah. we can uh, fabricate it. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, Prof. I do understand. Uh, prof, uh, is there any uh, specific reason why zinc oxide? Because mm. with some of the research, they also use on magnesium oxide. Uh, your study, you are using zinc oxide. Mm. Uh, any reason? Yeah, ma magnesium oxide. May maybe it is a uh, in insulator. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, but uh, uh, and it's a good insulator. Okay, it's a good insulator. It is number value of band gap. Energy. Oh, okay. I'm sure. Any other questions? Maybe can add yeah, on. Uh, doctor, uh, doctor, here Rusop speaking. Doctor, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yep. Doctor, yeah, doctor, can you listen Rousseau. to me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Soga Sensei, eh? Professor Soga, thank you so much for your very good, very interesting uh, presentation uh, today. Could you show to us again the device configuration for the perovskite solar cell? Oh, perovskite solar cell. That uh, you, you have presented uh, at the last part of your presentation. Yeah, yeah, this one. This, uh, oh. uh, so this, uh, the... <clears throat> the latest technology of perovskite solar cell using perovskite material that consists of lead, is it? Yeah. Uh, lead, yeah. Uh, PP. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, toxic. Uh, toxic. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, and uh, also it uh, cause to the uh, very fast degradation of solar cell. Yeah. yeah. If All we right. use that duplicate solar cell, mm. uh, do you have a data how much the the degradation of solar cell uh, for for this type of solar cell? The degradation ratio. Do you have data on that? Yeah. Ah, there are a lot of papers. Uh, on the degradation, and uh, now it is uh, de degradation is uh, improved very much, but uh, there is a still s s small degradation exists. Still small. So you mean uh, still still possible uh, to uh, to to consider perovskite material as part of the configuration on uh, in this type of solar cell, is it? Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, just now you have presented uh, to replace perovskite with mm -hmm. other type of material, so in that case, could you explain again uh, mm -hmm. to us uh, the 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 what uh, the 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 properties? Uh? Mm -hmm. Is it is it near to the properties of perovskite or? Uh, how much the difference of uh, the properties of active layer of the new material that you have uh, presented just now that you have proposed uh, so that is it hopefully is it possible in the future future to replace the perovskite? Could you uh, explain a bit more related to that? Sorry, I, I uh, did not uh, clear uh -huh, yeah, yeah. during your presentation just now. Uh -huh. how, how much the difference of the uh, characteristic of newly uh, proposed material compared to the perovskite material that have been uh, presented okay, as a very good uh, latest generation of solar cell right now? Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a very good point. <laughs> and uh, actually, the, the uh, uh, solar cell performance of dead, dead free perovskite solar cell is not good. For example, in the uh, dead material ammonium bismuth uh, and material ammonium red iodide, this kind of solar cell efficiency is more than. 20%. But, but uh, uh, team based solar cell, team uh, SN, uh, the solar cell performance is about 10%, less than half. And in my lab, more small, uh, small. Uh, we are doing the bismuth based solar cell, bismuth very stable material and not uh, so. It's very, uh, low, so very how, how, much, how much the difference of the absorption coefficient yeah, you compare uh, uh, between uh, those two types of solar cell? Yeah, uh, absorption coefficient is a little uh, almost the same, but the band gap is a little di change, di different. Is it around um, the, the around 1.6 EV also? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. How, example, how much? Uh, in this case, about the two, around two, well, 1.9. So, so it is a little large. Larger, larger than the, what we call the, the, the required optical yeah. band gap required uh, yeah. for the uh, solar cell publication. Huh? Yeah. Okay, okay, Prof. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So, any other questions? We are still have a uh, plenty of time. I'm sure this uh, we can take the good opportunity of this session because it's a very uh, rare to get a very distinguished and a very well known uh, professor for our uh, sharing knowledge sharing sessions. Especially on a nano material. The okay. <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. So, so my question that that is not about uh, from your slide, but I would like to maybe uh, get the information from you. Okay. Is it any in your groups or in your in your university? Those are people uh, uh, doing research on uh, COVID nineteen based on the nanomaterial like the uh, touch surface. I think that is very popular using the nano coating, copper nano coatings, mm -hmm. uh, and also the uh, face mask uh, uh, dope with the nano carbons, uh, and also the AG or, or the silver nanoparticle uh, in, uh, in in sanitizer. Uh, is, is it any uh, information from you, or if you have the some information in Japan, normally the group of Nanotology actively uh, uh, doing research on to curb and uh, pandemic COVID nineteen. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, ah, in Japan also, eh, uh, out of researcher, uh, trying doing this experiment, this research. But actually, I'm sorry, I, I don't know who is doing. But a lot of paper. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you. Um, Prof, maybe uh, just a simple question. Can you suggest uh, some idea for a future researcher, such as for uh, like me, nano material? So about what are the material or the field of study that actually I can go and have a bigger opportunity to have, a, of course, when we do the research, we go for a higher in, uh, publications. So, any any guidance from you, Prof? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a very difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Prof. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Prof. <laughs> Because I'm so uh, I'm so interested with the your project and your study and also it is somehow related to my uh, my research as well. That's why I, I I hope that I get some base idea from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, as Professor Saifola has mentioned, yeah, COVID nineteen <laughs> scientist <laughs> uh, uh, application maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm so, sorry, I don't know. I have no good uh, comment. Okay, it's okay, Prof. So uh, just now, Prof, uh, there is one uh, uh, one question in our uh, our chat box. There's uh, they're asking from No Juliati. May I uh, know? They're asking. May I know uh, why you choose? A zinc, ni zinc nitride, I think so, rather than the titanium oxide. Zinc oxide, rather than the titanium oxide. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah we, we are doing the both zinc oxide and TiO2. So, but uh, today I present the result of zinc oxide, but uh, uh, zinc oxide is and uh, TiO2. Both material possible. Prof, uh, just now you have mentioned in your study also you are using a PET, PET. Yeah, for the substrate. Polyethylene reflect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you are using for is that PET is the polyethylene teraflate? Is that the one they are using? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, because in my study, Prof, I'm using PEO, polyethylene oxide, because mm -hmm. it's not really complex. So, mm -hmm. because and it is a linear polymer. Mm -hmm. So, it's uh, okay. So, can uh, do you have any idea about? The uh, the difference maybe the in term of conductivity for PET and also the PEO maybe Prof. Uh, yeah, 
I I don't know the PEO. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, maybe it both is uh, insulator. So uh, uh, conductivity yeah, yeah. Say, but uh, I don't know the stability at high tem temperature. P PT it is stable uh, up to one hundred twenty or one hundred thirty and one hundred fifty. It is a uh, uh, melt. So okay. the difference may, may be affect, but uh, I I I don't I'm sorry I don't know the uh, what what the what the change difference. Okay, Prof. I definitely with think. So maybe Prof, from the audience, you can ask uh, other questions. Maybe. And then. Uh, We are still having a uh, more time to go. <laughs> Prof, maybe uh, outside of the scope of discussion, uh, maybe do you have like uh, an opportunity to collaborate with uh, by having a, a, a exchange student between your institute with UITM for uh, running out of this uh, simple project or something, Prof? Uh, uh, yeah. Ah uh, yes, uh, it uh, is possible. Is that possible? So, so if any exchange or the about the research program, everything. So we will straight away deal, uh, deal with uh, Prof regarding the project, isn't it? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, definitely it's a good opportunity to for all of us to involve, also get some knowledge and collaborate with the Prof. Uh, the uh, opportunity, yes, we might take the opportunity. So, um, maybe Prof. Russo, you can add on anything, Prof. Prof. Saifuna? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, we have uh, listened a very good uh, presentation from Professor Soga just now related to the synthesization of nanomaterial and its possibility yeah, uh, to use uh, in uh, various kind of various type of solar cell. And then uh, Soga Sensei also uh, has mentioned that uh, nanomaterial can be used in uh, another type of uh, nano electronic device such as LED, yeah? LED device fabrication using uh, new material such as just now perovskite material, uh, nano tube, nano road, nano silver, and so on. So we hope that uh, for those uh, uh, among our researcher who are interested in doing research, uh, uh, please do not bother yourself to only uh, to. Uh, wanted to study related to the synthesization of nanomaterial, but over there at uh, Professor Soga's laboratory and at their university, because I also was uh, there, uh, uh, was studied there at this institute for my master and PhD, and then for degree I was at the Nagoya University. Over there, so many types of uh, material synthesization, uh, synthesization or preparation we can do over there, and then various kind of device and application of nanomaterial also. Uh, we can do research over there. So we hope this is uh, a very good opportunity yeah? uh, <clears throat> uh, for our researchers, not only from UITM Denkil, but from over uh, from uh, UITM uh, to hopefully yeah? uh, making them interested to do research in this area and try to search for a scholarship or whatever funding yeah? to go there uh, to start collaboration with their institute. Okay, that's all from me, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. So I think uh, we do have a question. Doctor, I mean, I mean from uh, Asasi. She have a question. Um, hi, I was I'm 
、えっ、ー、と、ナノのサイズは、えっ、ー、と、表面の、あ表面積の、うんあうん、すいません、日本語難しいので、えっ、ー、と、<笑>サイズ、ナノのサイズは表面積の,のせいですかそれもし、ルーソ先生、もし<笑>できれば<笑>。えっと、えーあ、できれば、えっと、あえっと、多分何のサイズについてなんですけどすみませんえっとえっちょっとあのどういう質問かちょっとはよくわ分からないですけどうんあえ英語でいいですよ英語でいいですかはい、はい、えー、っと It's,、um, it's about the、uh, size of the nanoparticles. Is it because of the、uh, surface area? Why is it so important? Is it because of、uh, the surface area?、Uh, yeah, no, 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 not on the surface area, but、uh, on the size.、Uh, just on the size.、Uh, for, for, for example, in the case of carbon nanotube, carbon nanotube length or diameter. Oh, it's okay. It's on the diameter as well. Okay. I think、um, only that's for me.、Um, I will give back to、um, Dr. Hussein to continue on. Yeah, thank you, thank Dr. I m e a n our translator, and also, wow,、uh, they're very impressed because the Japan,、uh, your language in Japanese, they are very good. Thank you for helping us for the question as well. So maybe is there anything? Yeah,、uh, there's one question also asking about uh, about the energy energy storage because、mm -hmm. the, we are talking about energy. So, Prof, can you tell us what do you mean? What is the optimum optimum range for this kind of material, energy material?、Mm. The, so, yeah, 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 around. Yeah. エネルギー、ま、ま、ま、ファットレ,レンジ。I, I could not understand the、uh, yeah. question. Because you say this is an energy storage material, am I right? So is there any range?、Uh, so we can say, oh, this is suitable for use in、uh, this kind of energy, sto、uh, energy storage. Because、uh, that, what, that is what I understand about the conductivity of your material, maybe? うん、いや、あ,あ、いや、え、コンダクティビティはサーフェスエリア。いや、あ、is that the conductivity around the range of a ten power of negative three semen maybe millisemen per centimeter? Uh, conductivity? うん、いや、あ、あ、sorry、あ、あ、あ、I don't know that. I don't know the、okay. electric energy strategy. I don't know the detail on the、okay. energy strategy device. Okay, I do understand、oh, definitely. I so, anything else from the audience as well? Because I'm, I'm asking a talk, too much of questions on these sessions. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Maybe about your nano structure solar cells, am I right? Just now you have mentioned、uh, you are doing the XRD.、Uh, okay, the, sorry, Dr. There's one question, maybe.、Uh, I think it's in Japan language in the chat box. Dr. Aimi, maybe help me. Dr. Aimi? Yes. Uh, the question Can you 
read through? Because if I read, it will be definitely very sound very funny. Um, actually, this is not a question. This is actually a statement from the audience. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. um, one is from Tetsu so, Tetsu Soga Sensei uh, students, I think it's uh, Faisal Achoy, he is stating that, uh, thank you very much for today's presentations uh, it was a good, nice presentations and then another one is actually from Dr. No Giuliati mm -hmm. she's yes. saying that Sugoide, a bit about the Japanese language that she is uh, studying the uh, um, Japanese language as well. So it has um, actually nothing to do with uh, today's uh, Q&A sessions. It's just a statement from the audience towards the conference. Okay, it's not a question. Okay, thank you so much, Atami, for your help. Okay, is that anything else we can add on? Maybe, maybe uh, we have like a five minute, Prof. Can you give uh, maybe a, 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 a final advice or conclusion again about uh, through all your research? Uh, just a simple conclusion for us. Share with us, Prof. Uh, Dr. Aimee, help me. Um, I'm sorry again, Dr. Rizin? Uh, just make a remark, final remark, and then a conclusion of uh, what can uh, Prof can advise uh, for our future uh, just, uh, students or researcher. Just a final word before we end the session. Dr. Aimee? Uh -huh. Okay, um, uh, for, for the, uh, 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 energy, renewable energy. And also, uh, I didn't talk on the Is the problem with the internet? Hmm. Is a prof? Are you there? Uh, prof, are you there? You can hear me. Uh, I, the time me, are you there? Yes, Sensei, Kikoimaska. Sensei. Maybe having an internet difficulty, maybe. Wait, we might give a few more minutes before. Sorry for the technical issue, just a moment. Uh, yeah, I think Prof is coming. Prof Soga is coming. Prof, I, uh, is Prof Saga in, inside? Yeah, Prof, yes, Prof, yeah, yeah. We have, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so I think, uh, Dr. Aimee, uh, have been, uh, I think Prof have concluded, am I right, Dr. Aimee? Yeah, I think, yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think thank you so much again, Prof, for your sharing session. And I would like to apologize if I'm asked too much of questions or through all the session. Uh, I'd say sorry. I, but I enjoyed the session because I get a definitely a lot of beneficial input from your side. 
So I really uh, get some info and I'm sure, I'm sure um, today our audience also get the same uh, effect, same benefit from all of your sharing knowledge. And also this gives uh, us an, a basic idea of our future research in the nanotechnology and also our, uh, say, our researcher from, of course, UITM, more specifically from uh, Asasi UITM, from the foundation of UITM, then Kale definitely get a lot of input and an idea for proceed with a better researcher. Yes. Once again, Prof, uh, Prof, we like to thank you again, Prof uh, Dr. Tesu, Tesu Soga for the sharing sessions. So... So without uh, further delay, I would like to pass the sessions. I will end my uh, session as a moderator for these sessions. And I would like to pass to Dr. Farhan, Farhan Abdul, uh, Abdullah. Okay. Assalamualaikum, Abdullah. And a very yeah. good morning to all. And thank you, Dr. Hussein Haniba. Okay. Assalamualaikum, Abdullah. And, and a very good morning to everyone. Before we proceed to the next session, to ensure the effectiveness of this virtual conference, I would like to get your feedback regarding the quality okay, of the visual and audio of this conference. Kindly respond by letting me know if there's anything that we need to improve to and attend to. To show respect and a sign of our appreciation to the speaker, please silent your phone and mute your speaker during the parallel session. Thank you very much. Our invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be here as the moderator for ICRAS Virtual Conference 2021. I will moderate this keynote speech, Social Sciences and Humanities session. My name is Dr. Farha Abdullah from Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology, Mara, Malaysia. On behalf of the organizing committee, we wish to extend our warm welcome, Selamat Datang, and thank you to all participants, guests of honors, delegates, and representatives from the participating institutions, foreign and local participants, to our second ICRAS Virtual Conference 2021 organized by Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology, Mara, Chawangan, Selangor, Campus, Dunkil. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that the conference is joined by more than 145 participants ranging from researchers, industrial experts, and professionals. Esteemed participants are gathered here today to share their latest research findings and to share their knowledge and expertise on science technology, and social sciences. It is hoped that the newly gained knowledge from this conference will be able to contribute to the betterment of the industry and society as a whole. As excellencies, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite our keynote speaker for this session. 
Please welcome yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk Dr. Syam Rahayu Abdul Aziz from the Institution of Malay Rulers Chair, University Technology Mara, Malaysia. The topic is Challenges in Nationhood Education. Please welcome Yang Berbahagia Professor Datuk Dr. Syam Rahayu Abdul Aziz. Terima kasih Dr. Farha. Thank you Dr. Farha for being the moderator for today. Um, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, before I proceed with the presentation, I would like to thank uh, Pusat Asasi UITM, also the UITM Global for organizing this program. I would like to congratulate uh, the organizing committee and to welcome the honorable representative from various institutions, local and international respected participants. I would like to take uh, this opportunity also to congratulate everyone for making effort to be together with this important conference and occasion. Hopefully it will be beneficial to all of us. I am humbled and honored to be given the opportunity as one of the keynote speakers to speak on social science, uh, social sciences and humanity studies. Before I proceed with the title, the title is quite open and that when I choose the title, I would like to focus actually on the nationhood education or sometimes referred to uh, citizenship education or citizen education. I, I welcome later on, I welcome everyone to share views or to give comments uh, on my presentation so that I can improve the research. First of all, I would like to introduce myself a little bit because as my ad academic background, I'm, I'm, I studied constitutional law and I've been a constitutional law lecturer for almost 30 years. But for the past 12 to 13 years, I've been involved in public scholarship about uh, matters regarding uh, nationhood education and also citizenship education because it's subjects of interest and somehow related to my uh, focus or area of research. So I've been involved in various committee at national level and international level, and I've been an expert uh, panel of reference at Ministry of Education. I've been a special committee uh, to review history, syllabus and textbooks for the secondary schools at the national level. I've been um, in the steering committee for human rights action plan for the nation, for Malaysia, and involvement in some research on national unity, on national unity, uh, and the setting up of the, being involved also in some discussion on the setting up the national blueprint for uh, unity, which have been recently, I mean, been, been launched by the government. I've been involved also in some related legal matters, legal issues relating to national unity, such as discussion on the on national philosophy or the Rukun Negara, national ideology. I've been involved in various discussion on this and also being involved in discussion on the Commission for National Harmony, which have been um, developed by some sectors in the society when we have beginning 2003 and I've been involved uh, seriously in 2013 until 2015. Given my background, teaching constitutional law also is interesting, but it's very much related to nationhood education, also citizenship education. The experience for 30 years makes me realize that um, generally Malaysia need more, I mean, need to move faster in terms of understanding the basic foundation underpinning the nation. So I'm focusing on the Malaysian uh, citizenship education. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of fundamental principles that have been stipulated uh, within the federal constitution of Malaysia. And also uh, there have been debate and um, discussion on the current issues uh, involving nation, especially uh, the traditional elements or the subject matter, which is very important for the nation. 
such as uh, the parliamentary democracy as well as the um, the not the monarchy or what we call a constitutional monarchy. Giving that background, um, why did I choose the topic? Why did I choose the topic? Because um, we have seen that current trends, especially in the usage of media statement or the media uh, usage of social media, is basically people are people are using sometimes uh, using some hatred expression, and sometimes uh, this, uh, especially when using said uh, hatred expression or speeches, that is probably can raise the issue or can raise the sentiments among the ethnics, one thing. Another is can raise the sentiments against the nation itself. It looks like we there are some uh, loopholes in the education. That is why I, I think uh, I want to find challenges in nationhood education. Okay, as of now, um, the Malaysian education system has introduced um, education on nationhood with different names, um, with different names. We, if we can see that we have different names on the, what we mean by nationhood education. So uh, since education uh, is involved things like history, religious education, moral education. So the nationhood education is being taught at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the initial or primary school or secondary school or even at tertiary level school across the subjects. Then I will see, we will see how it's been adopted in the Malaysian um, education system as far as the nationhood education. Yeah, um, I haven't started with my, my, my presentation uh, using the PowerPoint yet, but just to give my initial remark of why I choose uh, the topic. So the most important thing that we um, we have to admit, uh, we have to admit that there are actually uh, various other things uh, that we have to consider when we talk about nationhood that I will explain, I will share my views on, I have nine challenges that I found um, based on my studies and also my experience and observation uh, throughout that uh, almost 15 years of uh, researching on the subjects, also 15 years of observing uh, the, the, the Malaysian attitudes or the Malaysian acceptance on the nationhood uh, principles. Yes, of course, for the nation, education is mainly to serve two important, uh, two important purposes, uh, namely promoting peace and promoting nationalism. So I take the approach that uh, education must also establish that it must pro to promote peace and also to promote nationalism. And over, all over the world, all over the world, we see that nationhood education, or sometimes known as citizenship education, has always been the government concern, has always been the government focus and priority. This is because nationhood education is important in awakening and fostering nationalism and patriotism among the citizen. It is so crucial as a unifying factor, meaning nationhood education, where we understand the system applies, the history we had, then it becomes a unif unifying factor, strengthening so social cohesion and shaping the national identity. The nationhood education has some nexus or some relationship with nation building. So when we have a uh, kind of nationhood uh, education, then we also be able to establish or to set up our nation building in, and especially courses at the university level and also civic education. So in Malaysia, nationhood education forms part of formal syllabus in school, tertiary uh, schools, primary and secondary, uh, tertiary education institution, whether it's in private uh, tertiary education or the, the national education. Uh, Whereby is as I said earlier, is found across the subjects offered in these um, institutions. Uh, some nationhood education elements in found in moral studies, religious studies, and is also found in um, some uh, history. Sometimes it's found in politics and in political studies or general studies. Yeah. So in university, some nation building courses are introduced in various school curricular activities, probably 
example from uh, University Technology Mara so we at the Malaysia uh, the Malay Institution Royal Institutions of University Technology Mara we have two subjects offered at the as co curricular for the uh, something related with nationhood education which is named as a uh, constitutional monarchy in Malaysia so in their operational strategies most that the, most the tertiary education institutions set up a specific center or unit or even a faculty to coordinate the teaching of those courses the lecturers or trainers are trained from different discipline of studies so that the lecturers can teach or can be facilitators for those subjects which tackle huge number of students the main challenge found in this nationhood education is that general perception of the public that we at the tertiary level have yet to be able to form the group of society form the citizen to create citizen or graduates who have who have sufficient or enough uh, civic values which should be instilled or nurtured during the studies especially in the tertiary education let's go to the uh, first um, first slides of mine in the presentation the first slide is uh, the first slide is on the uh, I, I can say is 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 an abstract so which I will read it from here uh, later then I will explain nationhood is in fact uh, is the fact or feeling or the state of being a nation meanwhile education for the purpose of this paper for the purpose of this presentation is the transmission of civilization through the process of transmitting and receiving but what i'm trying to say is that nationhood education is now to transmit the nation into a civilization as we realize malaysia I mean, focusing on malaysia malaysia is now at the age of 64 years old since our independence day in 1957 and we have about uh, 36 years to go for the civilization and i always state 100 years is a mark of civilization then the goal of the goal of education is actually to create a nation which has the quality of a civilization so the goal of education is to create all rounded development of personality who will later form that civilization the main way to receive an education is to undergo training either in structured or even unstructured educational system or institution nationhood is ed education is thus the process to create all rounded development of personality to produce citizens who have the feeling of being a nation in the transmission of civilization so this presentation aims to discuss the challenges in nationhood education in malaysia okay dengar suara kita focus on the tertiary institution analysis are being made on published literature uh -huh. oh maksudnya uh -huh. cuba uh, mean literature based on some research and also suara then dengar, my observation dengar suara dia clear suara kita clear tak regarding the subject matter I've observed that there are few challenges faced by the tertiary educational institution in the transmission of civilization through nationhood education. The challenges can be placed into two categories, namely the contents of nationhood education and the other is on the administrative or the management related to the teaching and learning of nationhood education. The content here refers to uh, the concept and uh, also the, the concept and also the application okay, the eh. concept I'm also sorry the, the concept and also the jurisprudence of the subject matter and i will explain eh. the Syih, um, when when i discuss the challenges we face But basically Cukup now uh, we do find that there are challenges uh, in um in nationhood dia, education dia. in general Uh -uh. Let's go to the next slide. Ini akak cuba uh, antai next screen. slide is about uh, screen, uh, screen, the screen. national education policy. I have to uh, explain a little bit that mm. this uh, the education in Malaysia is based on the philosophy of national education, and is um, the principles are found in the NEP or National Education uh, Philosophy, which was, was which was formed in 1988. And another principles which uh, underpinning the the national education policy is the national principles 
or sometimes we call it as national ideology or for Malaysia known as Rukun Negara. The ultimate uh, objective of, uh, uh, of the national education policy is to building is building a united and progressive society. So this uh, this is the aim of national education policy. And below what is in the my, my slides is the whole uh, quoted uh, national education policy of Malaysia. Education in Malaysia is an ongoing effort towards uh, further developing the potential of individual in a holistic and integrated manner so as to produce individuals who are intellectually, spiritually, emotionally and physically balanced and harmonious based on a firm belief in and devotion to God. So that is the principles of national education philosophy in Malaysia. Such an effort is designed to produce Malaysian citizens who are knowledgeable and competent, who possess high and moral standards, high moral standards, and who are responsible and capable of achieving high level of personal well-being, as well as being able to contribute to the harmony and betterment of the family, the society, and the nation at large. This is this is the national education philosophy. And in nationhood education or citizenship education, it's all based on this education policy. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, therefore, emphasis uh, which we have in the national education policy, uh, the Ministry um, of Education emphasizes a balance between both knowledge and skills, as well as ethics and morals. Students' aspirations in the Malaysian education plan are built around six key attributes. This I copied from the uh, website, the, the, the website of the um, Ministry of Education. So, ethics and spirituality, uh, leadership skills, national identity, language proficiency, thinking skills, and knowledge. Yeah, these are the emphasis um, of, in the national education, uh, education philosophy. And the goals of the, when we talk about um, tertiary education, the tertiary education has its goals. And I would like probably to, uh, sometimes uh, some uh, national universities or universities in Malaysia uh, has their own way of explaining to their members of what are the goals of their own institution. Sometimes uh, the institution has some gender goals as brown in the national education philosophy, but sometimes some universities develop its own goals of that uh, institution. But uh, basically, the higher learning institution in, in general is to produce scholars or scientists who are skilled in thinking and developing knowledge in various disciplines. Apart from that, from the professional aspect of higher education is to produce technocrats to implement national development plan. I think this is where national, I mean, nationhood education is also important. Technocrats to implement national development plan and bureaucrats to govern the organization of the society. The higher education has an educational dimension and also training dimension. So they must have knowledge and also how to implement such knowledge, be them become the bureaucrats or they can become the members in the technocrats in the present in the building the nation or in in a, in in organizing the nation yeah let's go to the next slide the educational dimension which nationhood education said take place is to develop intellectual spiritual emotional character cultural and physical aspect of individual ethics the keywords here is individual ethics at the maximum and the highest level so that the individual not only becomes a balanced human being but also able to make appropriate adaptations to influence of current development. Meanwhile, the training dimension touches on the role of higher education in terms of production and services to the social economic development of the community in which universities and other institutions are parts of its members. 
Um, now I'm focusing on the nationhood education, having understood what is the national education policy and also the objective of the tertiary education, the goals of tertiary education, what kind of graduates we want to create, what kind of citizens we will produce. So what do we do at the university level? Courses offered uh, for in the higher learning institution, whether in, in the private or the public uh, educational institution or public university, we have different courses as mentioned earlier. Uh, I list uh, some of them. Malaysian nationalism, Malaysian studies, Malaysian politics and society, ethnic relations, Islamic civilization, ethics and civilization, and philosophy and current issues. So some, uh, the, the, the two bottom are the subjects are in newly introduced. Uh, some universities already introduced, some public university introduced, uh, already introduced the courses, but some universities are yet to introduce the courses. But previously, all the universities, including the private universities also, were teaching ethnic relations ethnic relations. Um, so this is basically uh, the most important, this is top down, that is, that's the government introduce and make it compulsory to every students to undergo these uh, courses uh, for the purpose of, uh, probably uh, for the purpose of rebettement in terms of uh, unity among the people, among the citizens, and when they know what are the underpinning matters or when they have to communicate one another, especially in different ethnics. Because uh, I, I assume that everyone knows Malaysia because Malaysia is uh, probably, people say Malaysia is having uh, more than uh, 70 ethnics uh, and various, uh, various languages used by the ethnics, but we have the national language, that's Bahasa Melayu, and most of us also speak English. But English is not uh, the national language, but some states uh, like Sarawak, one of one states in from Malaysia, uh, in Malaysia, uh, they have two uh, official language that is Bahasa Melayu and also the English language. But back to this, uh, the nationhood education in tertiary education, uh, educational institutions form in a different kind of uh, names or courses offered. And there are some uh, compulsory and some universities, as I said earlier, introduced in the form of school curricular activities. And um, sometimes uh, we don't have some, except for ethnic relations and some subjects, we do have some uh, what we call standard modules to every university that is being to be used by all universities. So uh, there's probably one thing, uh, let's say I was involved in the preparation of the ethnic and civilization module to be introduced. I'm one of the consultants in the, in the making of this uh, module for ethnic and civilization. Um, but then uh, the policy of the government is that uh, all universities are given the opportunity to improve. It's, it's not a, I mean, to improve uh, from the, I mean, from the basic PowerPoint or the basic ideas that have been introduced by the Ministry of Education or higher education. But then uh, when it comes to university, the university still has the right to improve or to change uh, or to introduce new, uh, new subheadings in the discussion or new subjects or new focus.
Okay, um, would you excuse us for a while? There's uh, some technical glitches. Huh? We'll be back, inshallah, this week. Prof. Dr. Okay, Prof. Sham, are you there, Prof. Sham? <laughs> How are you? Okay, Alhamdulillah. Uh, it's okay, Prof. Take your time, okay. The floor is yours. Oh, uh, we can't hear your mic. Uh, mic, mic. Uh, we cannot hear. I put in the chat box. Hold on, eh? hold on, Prof. Yeah. Text, um, sure. Prof, um, Alana, um, um, Prof. Okay, excuse us for a while, some uh, technical glitches. Okay, we'll fix it. Okay, in the meantime. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, oh, okay, 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 Prof. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, can. Okay, thank you, Prof. Yeah, can hear you well. Thank you. Something wrong with my computer now. I'm using my phone. I put, I, you can. Okay. Oh, it's okay, Prof. Yeah, no worries. Thank okay. you, Prof. Now, how many more minutes do I have, Dr. Farfa? Um, according, accordingly, we will around, um, we will have to refer to Okay, could we have um, 10, 10 minutes huh, before Q&A? Is it possible, Prof? Yeah, yeah, I will do within that minutes. 10 minutes and then we have a Q&A briefly. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide when I talk about, uh, I was talking uh, on the subjects that was offered, yeah? And also the flexibility that the ministry has given to all the universities uh, to... to to develop their own courses on on educate I mean nationhood education. So let's go to the next slide, which um, the contents of the courses. Having said the names of the courses, and probably now it's important to look at the content of the courses. Most of the courses include the history of the nation, including the political history, the constitution, the social culture of society, the society and unity the social economy and civilization, the new subject, which is ethics and civilization, introducing um, a subjects on uh, civilization itself. And some also to create on the democratic, I mean, to have includes uh, topics like uh, creation of democratic way of life by creating uh, democratic citizens. Um, let's go to the next slide very quickly. And students are expected to have knowledge and be able to deliver on the following. So the, the outcome of the courses will be that the process of nation building in political structure and also the national development and issues of issues of um, um, national concern, I mean, content, especially on philosophy and current issues, it will talk about uh, issues and national concern and appreciates Malaysia's role Malaysia's role at international level. That is to say uh, Malaysia also will be able to introduce Malaysia at international level and play a role especially in uh, peace let's say peaceful mission towards other countries as well how Malaysia has participated. Having said that um, the objectives of the, the objectives and so the courses, the contents of the courses, we found that there are, I, I listed down, uh, as I said earlier, nine challenges that we found in the nationhood education in Malaysia. This uh, divided into two headings is concept and application, also teaching and learning process. The challenge number one is national education policy and nationhood education. It's probably something which we have to uh, to study on the national education policy. Um, I'm sorry to say this, but I, I, I do feel regret saying this. Being, being a lecturer for almost 30 years, 
I do find that uh, there are colleagues who have yet to be able to appreciate or actually understand the national education policy. Even we are at the tertiary level. I mean, it, this is a I mean this is a big uh, statement which I make. But then I do find this is my observation. That I do find that there are many many of uh, lecturers yet to explore the basic principles in the national education policy. Yeah. So, the, but the the most important part that in the national education policy, which is related to the uh, to the nationhood education is um, personal high moral standard, responsible and capable of achieving high level of personal well-being, and as well as being um, but to contribute to the harmony and betterment of family, the society, and the nation at large. So, I mean, we have to extract from this sentence in order for us to understand whether there is any emphasis on patriotism. When I find uh, patriotism and nationhood, when I find a lot of writings, they imply that I mean, from this by way of implication that national, and national education philosophy has actually emphasized on the patriotism. But it's just by implication. I mean, so this probably the way how that philosophy was crafted in order, but then is in in order to provide a simple, but then a wider words in the in the philosophy in the wording of the philosophy. The next issue, the practical issue, is has the goals of national education policy been achieved? There is uncertainty when I do research on this. Can we go to the challenge number two, please? Uh, has the goals of national education policy, uh, philosophy has been achieved? There is uncertainty whether national education philosophy has been actualized in educational process, transmitted successfully by teachers to students and pers um, further personalized by students. Um, there are few studies which uh, indicated this uh, finding. They indicated this finding, so I received this. Uh, as I, I mean, I take this from some finding which I will have the uh, footnotes or the reference to such uh, writing in my full paper. As I said earlier, also that's uh, relevant also to whether we can achieve the goals of NAP when many of us have yet to study the contents of the national education philosophy itself. Another is whether or not we will be able to balance between global development and patriotism. To keep evolving, to keep pace with, to keep evolving, to keeping with, uh, if not ahead of global trends, such as the latest technologies, uh, advanced robotics, internet of things, and work knowledge automation, are expected to dramatically reshape the business and social landscape that it is today and to balance with the strife to instill the nature uh, to instill and nurture the feeling of belongings and patriotism to individual citizens to be innovative for the sake of ensuring the traditional indigenous autochthonous elements of the nation be preserved or even enhanced so we are competing with the technologies actually the nationhood education is competing with the technologies so i think uh, the efforts that the organizing committee having this kind of seminar is actually for us to balance between the development in technologies and also how human sciences also will be relevant in the in the competition of uh, global competition on the in the revolution, if we can say, in the latest technology. And these are the things that, um, the, the challenge number four is able to, are we able to manage the target group? The target group is the university students are digital native, meaning to say they were born, now students by the age of 19 to 23, they actually born in the digital era where the digital native, they are the first generation of the digital native and they spend their entire life in a digital environment, information technology. And people like me, and I was born in the uh, 60s, we actually the immigrant to this uh, digital 
net, net digital era. We are immigrants to the digital era. But how do we be as the we I mean trainers is uh, trainers who are of our age of I mean probably forty five years old on onwards right? Can we be innovative to try new inventions based on experiments from I mean based on based on based on our observation that these digital native I mean people of this digital era they are very uh, they are very um, innovative and they sometimes uh, without realizing being influenced by kind of things on the internet it's not only about their not only about their knowledge but also their way of thinking their the ideology that have been um being be, they, they, they have been reading materials which has one second uh, let's say tweeted one second from other country other part of the world is already in their handphones there's that's already in their palms and they read it from the phone. So are we ready, actually, the syllabus that we have in the university ready to face this challenge? Another issue on the, um, on the concept and also the application of this, um, the application of this nationhood education is unity in ideas and notion of the nation. Currently, uh, we we are reading. I mean, for Malaysian, we are reading newspaper every day. We are reading matters regarding the scope, powers, and functions of the constitutional monarchy. We have yet to get a common understanding of what is meant by what is meant by constitutional monarchy in Malaysia. We still have differences of opinion. Many many people give their own views. It looks like yeah, the discussion is, is is I mean it's very interesting. It's good that all Malaysians propose their ideas and values, but in the educational institutions, we need to have some common understanding. But although we can debate on certain issues that we disagree or we have different understanding, but the, at least the common understanding, let's like, say on the relevancy of the constitutional monarchy, for instance. So this is important for us. I mean, one important, and I mean, what is in my slide is our students and facilitators or lecturers or instructors united on the ideas and notion of the nation, including the philosophy of the nation, background and real objective of the national philosophy, blending the national philosophy with the current policies in the government. So this is one thing. So it is my observation that we, as a nation, yet to solidly appreciate holding it in our heart the common ideas of the nation, all common acceptance of civic values of the people. And the current debate tells me very clearly that we are still at the state of infancy or not to say to reach the state of, you know, mature uh, understanding of ideas and the notion of the nation. Free from ethnic politics, are we free from ethnic politics? I mean, the challenge is quite real because of the situations uh, that we have, because of some, uh, because of the some, um, what we, some principles that we found in our constitution. But how do we tackle this? How do we explain this to the students? Or how do we explain to the citizens at large? So why do we need this? Uh, why do still we have this ethnic politics? Challenge number seven is about approaches in teaching and learning. Since nationhood education or citizenship education in Mal and in all the study education involve a large number of students, it certainly requires, let's say, University Technology Mara mostly is about 70,000 so, or 70,000 students I mean, at one course of time attending um, courses involving nationhood education. It certainly requires a number, a large number of teaching staff or trainers and sometimes getting instructors and providing training in an integrated manner is a challenge, it's a real challenge in nationhood education. And especially when we have the facts that we are still, we are still uh, fighting, we are still striving to find the common understanding of a notion of the nation. 
So in addition, learning and teaching approaches to tackle huge number of students may require special attention or otherwise the learning and teaching process may fail to achieve its objective. Do we have another challenge and this related that related to this is that expert instructors must be properly trained, not on the contents of the subject matter, but also on the teaching and learning. Do we have such sufficient trainings for the instructors, either in the teaching and learning approaches? Less effective teaching experience. I mean, there are certain studies showing that there's less effective teaching approaches due to two reasons. One is teachers' lack of interest and teachers' uh, lack of commitment. And because of lack of interest and commitment, the study shown that teachers' lack of confidence. And the traditional methods may not be effective for our uh, digital native. Yeah. Expert teaching staff in the field, since the national education requires holistic learning about a nation. Of course, as I said, a combination of history, politics, social economy, culture, etc. So we need to have a facilitator or trainers who have teaching staff who have holistic knowledge and the courses like ethic and civilization, for instance, and the philosophy and current issues require instructors who have various abilities on aspects of nationhood. The challenge here is to get properly trained instructors to discuss the course context. And challenge number nine, do we have sufficient number of study centers on nationhood education? Usually now we have general studies. Uh, I'm one of the consultants to discuss on the uh, new courses uh, uh, in UPM, that's the University Putra, Malaysia, where they want to introduce a politics and kenegaraan, one master courses. And from the presentation, we understand there's not, there's no such course offered at master's level when the kenegaraan. But then we do have a cent I mean, subject nationhood education, uh, as I said, scattered ubiquitously in various subjects. And we have in University Utara, Malaysia, that we have uh, uh, offering PhD and Masters on national uh, nationhood studies. And we do have some also in UKM and UPSI, uh, University uh, Pendidikan the, at so it's, we have some limited. Although we do have some higher learning institution that establish specific department for nationhood education, the numbers are still limited. Not all universities having the same. Some universities assign a particular faculty to handle the related courses. UITM is an example. Also, we assign to Aches Academy for Contemporary Islamic Studies. Adding the faculty some additional workloads, although sometimes the courses offered under the ticket of the national education is not the focus, the main focus, or the responsible faculty. Let's say in UKM, they introduce uh, Chitra or some units to, to, to be focused on the, on the, on the courses relating to the, the general studies. Yeah? So um, in my conclusion, I would say that Education is for the nation, although we admit the importance of the technology revolution, but education is for the nation. Apart from producing graduates who can adapt to the current technology revolution or even evolution, nationhood education remains the first and foremost. Accepting the change is of, is, is of course inevitable, but the inner self of the nation must remain and improve to the better. National philosophy or national ideology must form the foundation of all action plan and strategies to face the current challenges. How innovative, creative, independent or critical the graduates are, they must possess and profess the foundations underpinning the nation. Therefore, nationhood education is important to all of us as a nation. External and internal challenges faced by the nation must be addressed and focus by strengthening the spirit of patriotism and nationalism. Relevant authorities have been doing various efforts on this, but due to rapid change of technology, the efforts must be multiplied and effective. Last but not least, 
education is for the nation and nationhood education is a must for us all. Thank you. I'm back to you, Dr. Moderator. Um, okay, um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Shamrahayu, yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Shamrahayu Abdul Aziz, for your presentation and the sharing of ideas and knowledge. Eh? Okay, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, now I open the session for for question and answer. Okay, hold on, ah, because um, I need to scroll uh, the list of questions. Uh, okay, uh, okay, I need to scroll uh, the question. Hold on, uh, Prof. There are a few questions taken from the YouTube and the uh, in the chat box. Ah. Okay, hold on, ah. uh, there's a question um, in the in building sense of nationhood, do we do you think that uh, bringing the improved uh, version of uh, national service training program is a good idea? Uh, second, do you think we should do away with vernacular school system? I'm back on my computer. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Okay. Farha. Um, I, I'm much easier with my computer rather than my phone. Um, okay, um, my answer to this, uh, th because this is beyond what we discussed, so I don't discuss about uh, National Service Training Program. Uh, in Malaysia, we know it as uh, PLKN. Yeah? yeah, when, if you ask me personally, I do agree that we need this kind of training but um, the module must also be improved if we want to reintroduce what we actually previously did. Yeah. Secondly, uh, vernacular school is something of debate, um, but I still insist on the part of the Ministry of Education because people were saying by having a vernacular school, this contributed to the disunity or, I mean, will affecting the social cohesion, especially in the unity of the nation, of the people of different ethnic groups. Um, I, I've been saying this for many, many years, that there should be a proper research done, a mass research done, on whether or not that vernacular school has actually caused uh, the disunity. I think a, a proper research from the ministry itself, I think this should be taken very seriously by the ministry. We just listen to people, they might, might be right, they might be wrong. But if we have a result from an academic research without bias, not representing the any political party, but then it's to determine what is the best school system we have here in Malaysia. So I, I, I want to I want to emphasize here that the ministry must focus. What is the impact of having vernacular school on the social cohesion the, or, or on the unity of the people? We haven't found a very cogent reasons from a very massive research on this. We just listen to people outside. Yeah, they may be true, they may be right. But for the government, for the ministry to make decision on this, they should have uh, data and studies on this. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there are a few more questions. <laughs> uh, take This one is taken from uh, the from Google's uh, chat huh? from... Um, Abang Iqbal, Abang Bukhil, okay, Prof. Assalamualaikum, Prof. The lecturer from Pusat Asasi, eh? uh, the, NAP, the, the, NAP, and the NEP seems too symbolic in nature and its idea in emphasizing patriotism might be just a facet towards certain parties' interests. Um, so, your, your comment, Prof. What do you think, Prof? 
<laughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Iqbal. Um, yeah, I did mention in my presentation because uh, it looks like by implication there is a notion of patriotism. This is my view that probably people, but well, because I read a lot of literature, when they talk about uh, national education or citizenship education, they refer to the national education philosophy. But uh, they, it just to say that by implication was such words you probably I'm trained in legal, I'm, I'm trained in legal background from legal studies. Therefore, there's probably black and white over there that I want to find out. Um, yeah, probably it's a symbolic in nature that we want to establish that people, I mean the citizens who can contribute to it, become um, balanced, balanced individuals, contribute to the nation, could contribute to the society and himself. But then, uh, it, whether this is understood by the people or not, because known as philosophy is must not be easy to un to be understand to be understood by majority of the people. So it becomes uh, like it's just a symbolic, as you say. I do agree. So we do it by implication only. That is the national education policy philosophy wants us to establish or wants us in a in a education system to nurture and instill the spirit of nationhood. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So many people interested in your speech. Eh? Um, there are a few questions uh, taken from the YouTube. Um, okay, the, next, the question is here, Prof. Uh, there are two questions. Eh? Okay, we compile. The first one is how to get uh, some of the digital natives, yeah, like Millennium, to be interested in nationhood education. Right, because uh, like us, we used to watch film like Bukit Kepung, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Adnan, <laughs> Hati Malaya, 1957, Palo yeah. Pulang, yeah. Tanda Putra, Legacy Vat 1969, yeah. Embun yeah. Bravo Lima, right? But they are, yeah. they now they are more TikTokers. Ah, uh, they are not ah <laughs> uh, uh, TikTokers, ah <laughs> uh, YouTuber, right? So, um, so how to make them get interested uh, in this um, awareness for the uh, digital natives? Uh, okay, uh, so you want like to answer that first, and then I will mention okay. the next question. Later. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Um, yeah, as we all know that when we speak to one another, we use the language that understandable by each one. By everyone. I mean, if we, let's say I speak to all of you, then I should be speaking in the language that you understand me. I mean, the same thing goes with the digital uh, native or the millennium uh, generation. We must speak in their language. But um, it's not something easy for us. It's probably, I, I would say just now, the immigrant to this era. That we must speak to them in the language they understand or using the mechanism or using the tools that they prefer to. And let's say media is at all times relevant. At all times, media is relevant. The old days, as you said, I mean, I mean, there are a few numbers of um, movies that you mentioned just now, Dr. Farah. And there are so songs that use or uh, raise the spirit of patriotism. Yeah, media is important, but yeah, Dr. Farah said was TikToks is one of the ways uh, how the people, I mean, the younger generation uh, used to, I mean, they're using it very effectively. And we also learn from TikToks that they use uh, the application. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, we go to the using the media, which is relevant to them. We use the media, we use the media, which is um, understandable by them. However, one thing we must not forget that whatever the medium you use, whatever medium we use in the trans transmission of the knowledge, it must remain the content. The content must remain. Let's say we want to use a media like uh, application like TikToks or what I um, mean, using application in WhatsApp, whatever, it must be, we must not be, we must not leave the, or uh, left out something which is fundamental to the, fundamental to the 
nationhood, the spirit of nationhood. Um, I have to, I want to add a little bit on this, yeah, uh, Prof. Farah, Dr. Farah. We, we want to say that, um, let's say we want to introduce Rukun Negara. It won't be in the way that we were taught last time. It will not only the way that we memorize and raise our hand and swear the Rukun Negara. It's not the way, but it just, it will be for the this generation. It's for them to feel it then. I think people in education will have more right to say on this or more views to say on this. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you a lot, Prof. Uh, Dato. Um, another question. Uh, they're very interested. Um, anyway, still about the nationhood education, in tertiary education, uh, how to get digital natives to contribute or participate positively in nationhood education? Because some of them are so obsessed with what's what whatever is sensational in the social media. Okay, to uh, answer this, Dr. Farha, I just want to share my experience because I don't do research on this matter. Because I think uh, experience also, I've been in. I mean, I've been in the legal uh, studies or legal arena for almost thirty years. But then for the last one year. I've been, I mean, almost 10 months I've been in the uh, this University Technology Mara. I just recently moved to University Technology Mara. Previously, Salam. I was teaching law at the International Islamic University, Malaysia. When I come here in the uh, University Rahmai. Technology Mara, I, have a do, I do a lot of engagements uh, with young people. At one time, uh, I host, I mean, I was invited as a speaker. Okay, but I feel pre-recorded, so you can play here to listen to YouTube. Uh, classes for UI, UITM students. And we have about 70 uh, over students registered for the courses, registered for the courses. And 60 of, 60, okay, almost 60,000 students attended on the same course. And I was... I, I mean, I was not ready for the such huge ah, okay, number of students you. attending the virtual, uh, okay, thank you. virtual okay, bro. course, okay. you know. But then uh, when when I, we, I go through the comments that they give, we receive almost 50,000 comments. 50,000 comments. And they say that, oh, this is an interesting subject. Yeah, yes, yes. This, uh, I was talking about uh, our nation, uh, our future, our aspiration okay, to become uh, a nation at 100 years of independence. Our our nation becomes a civil, a civilized, uh, we want to reach a civilization in 36 years time. They were excited because they will be the members of the, the, the members of the administrators at the age of 55, 56. They will, they will be peak of that career. Therefore, my conclusion is that the contents we convey is important. The contents we convey. Secondly, is these children, this digital or millennium generation, as what they have in they they have in their media now, like the Instagram media, the Facebook media. They have what they call is an influencer. Therefore, in nationhood education, we need to have influencer among ourselves and facilitators. But among themselves, as a peers, I mean, influencer, how do we create that? I think the institution has this responsibility to create that influencer. So I think uh, in this digital era, therefore, we use the language they want. We use the language uh, they use. Influencers, uh, we must know what are the terminologies they use, what are, what, let's say, probably for all Malaysian, my friends from Malaysia, you know one named Caprice. He has 1 million followers in his uh, Instagram. So this kind of influences, I mean, this kind of things uh, which is in the internet uh, using the media is very important. So the, the influences that this will be, I mean, probably I will be sharing in my full paper of some kind of tips or some kind of uh, suggestions of how we can improve this. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Prof. Um, uh, there's a very good um, 
we would like to welcome uh, Professor our pengarah campus, Professor Dr. Saiful Abdullah. Uh, thank you, Prof. Dato. Dr. Shamrahayu for your willingness to thank give you. to give a talk in our in our international conference. Thank you so much. So much. Uh -huh. We're really honoured. Eh? And very grateful, good Thank and you. very informative address challenges on education policy. So I <laughs> thank you, Professor. I'm I'm really humbled, but I'm I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be here with all of you. Okay, I think we comes towards the end. As the Westlife, uh, one of the lyrics say that we don't want to let you go, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> very hard to let you go, Prof. And for your information, Professor Dr. Dr. Shamrahayu was my uh, law constitutional lecturer when I did my law degree. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Dr. Shamrahayu. I'm <laughs> Anak Dede, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Shamrahayu. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry for you. taking this slim light, okay. Thank well, uh, we come towards the end. Thank you very much, Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Shamrahayu Abdul Aziz for your presentation and the sharing of ideas and knowledge. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, okay, this is the end of our keynote speech, Social Sciences and Humanities session. Uh, before we disperse, I would like you to click into the registration form. Uh, it's um, appeared in the YouTube uh, link. And of course, those who are in the Google Meet, you can click into this registration form. And of course, the QR code. QR code is available in both YouTube yeah, and of course, in our Google Meet link. Eh? Okay. And then, um, of course, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart to all guests and participants uh, for participating in this conference. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, Prof. Uh, because we we already come to the end. But there's a question from the YouTube. Um, the next session will start at 12.30. Were you able, Prof? <laughs> I just came across the message because I did not refer to the YouTube and there's um uh okay fine um so hold on eh? uh so hold on so can we can we end uh, west oh, okay fine so it's okay prof nevertheless um already we have already start um get ready already received um uh, information from the technical team okay so I think with that um. Okay, hold on. Eh? Okay, so okay, hold on. Okay, so do we have come? So anything? Okay, hold on. Okay, so I think uh, we come towards the end, uh, twelve fifteen. So by the way, both um. Okay, thank you. So I think I would like to thank again to all guests and participants for participating in this conference. Uh, okay. Please accept our humble apology for the inconvenience. Yeah, uh, we hope that this conference has become a good platform for researchers, academicians, and industry players to broadcast and disseminate their valuable knowledge in their respective fields. Yeah? So, knowledge shared indeed will be useful and beneficial to all. So, please, by all means, let's we be, take a challenge, become TikTokers in spreading a nationhood education. Why not I start from us? Uh, all become TikTokers and uh, active in IG, inshallah, yeah, to benefit our our youth. Yeah? Okay. So we uh, come towards the end. Till we meet again in the future, stay safe and take care. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you. And the rest, uh.
Assalamualaikum and a very good morning everyone. Uh, can everyone hear my voice? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we will begin in shortly. Okay. So, let our team first, technical team link this live to Facebook. So we will begin shortly. So our team currently is trying to fix some technical difficulties on the live YouTube. Okay, so we are already currently online on YouTube. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Before we proceed to the next session, to ensure the effectiveness of this virtual conference, I would like to get your feedback regarding on the quality of the visual and audio of this conference. So hopefully everyone can hear my voice, isn't it? To show respect and a sign of appreciation to the speakers, please silence your phone and mute your speaker during the parallel session. I will present the question to the respective speaker during question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can type your question in the chat box in the Google Meet or also in our live Facebook, okay? And we will try to read it at the end of the Q&A session. Our invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be here as the moderator for iChrist Virtual Conference 2021. I will moderate this session. This is the first parallel session for science and technology. My name is Nurufil Zahbenti Ghazali from Center of Foundation Studies, University of Technology, Mara, Malaysia. On behalf of the organizing committee, we wish to extend our warm welcome and selamat datang and thank you to all the participants, guests of honor, delegates and representative from the participating institution, foreign and local participants to our second ICRAS virtual conference 2021 organized by Center of Foundation Studies, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan Selangor, Campus Tengkil. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful that the conference is joined by more than 145 participants, ranging from researchers, industrial experts and professionals. Esteemed participants are gathered here today to share their latest research findings and to share their knowledge and expertise on science, technology and social sciences. It is hoped that the duly gained knowledge from this conference will able to contribute to the betterment of the industry and society as a whole. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite our first parallel speaker, which is our director, Prof. Dr. Saifullah Haji Abdullah, director of Center of Foundation Studies with the speech or topic 
of her talk, his talk today is a study of mechanism on nano-coated mild steel surface. Please welcome Prof. Dr. Saifullah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and good day. Firstly, uh, I would like to thanks to organizing committee to invite me to present paper in ICRES 2021. Today, I would like to uh, talk about the study of mechanism on mild steel coated aluminium nanostructure. Uh, thank you for the students and also the co-researcher. Briefly about nanotechnology. Nanotechnology was introduced by physicist Professor Richard Penman in 1959. Various of definition based on application and area, but in general, nanotechnology, nanotechnology can be defined as a science, engineering, and technology conducted at a nanoscale which is size from 1 to 100 nanometers. Various and wide range of application on nanotechnology, including in the current world crisis pandemic COVID-19. Why is the differences between nanocoating and nanostructured coating? Nanocoating is referring nanoscale, referring to nanoscale, uh, meaning uh, thickness less than 100 nanoms, thin film that are applied to surface in order to create uh, or improve a material functionalities like uh, corrosion protection, friction reduction, anti-fouling and antibacterial properties and uh, self-cleaning and others. While nanostructure coating it is involved consideration of nanoparticles arrangement on porous or uneven surface microscopically. So normally nano coating can be defined as the very thin layer or thin film uh, at the thickness of around micron, yeah, micrometer. While for the nano structured coating, Normally, we are looking for how the particles uh, arrange, yeah? uh, nanoparticle arrange uh, in the structure form, yeah? okay, microscopically, uh, how they uh, actually uh, uh, cool on the uh, surface of metal or other materials here. Yeah? Okay. But nanostructure coating still under nano coating in general. Material involved in the nano coating, like the metals, oxide materials, polymer, ceramic, biomaterials, and others. There are many uh, uh, material can be used for the nano coating uh, based on the uh, purpose and also the application. The method to uh, prepare nano coating. Uh, like the physical deposition, physical vapor deposition, e beam sputtering, plasma ion deposition, chemical vapor deposition, the most uh, popular is plasma enhanced uh, chemical vapor deposition, and MBE, uh, molecule beam epitaxy. So normally uh, MBE will be used for the precise coating uh, to fabricate the sensor or any electronic uh, equipment. Like the deep coating, spin coating, spray coating, uh, including thermal spray and cool spray, brushing, yeah, brushing normally like we uh, apply paint to the walls, electroplating, that is more practical for industry and also some uh, research lab because they are uh, quite uh, low cost, yeah? the equipment used and quite simple here. There is the uh, schematic diagram okay, uh, for the uh, deposition, uh, especially physical deposition. We have the source of material here and after we heat up the 
source material and they will vaporize. So sometimes we are looking for particle by particle, and after that they will uh, coat the uh, or the surface of material. Okay. So normally we we, we carry out this process in uh, vacuum chamber. As I mentioned just now, there are many uh, application uh, on the uh, nano coating. Uh, so like the food and packaging, agriculture, water treatment, uh, equipment, meaning uh, water uh, filtration, uh, building construction, cosmetic, uh, textile, automotive, electronic, oil and gas, uh, healthcare, eh? healthcare, uh, and there are many, many others. So you can refer to this uh, chart, here, chart here. And the demand of nano coating uh, increase year by year. So you can see here uh, uh, data from Asia Pacific anti microbials yeah, from 2014 to 2020 and expected there is the high demand. And there is the data, uh, the world data here, demand from 2014 to 2025. Uh, there is regarding to the functional uh, material on nanocoating here, like the anti-corrosion, anti-microbial, anti-icing, wetting, self-cleaning, anti-falling, and etc. Et 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 okay, there is another possibility of application of nanocoating to reduce spread of COVID-19. Yeah? So there is a now very popular paper and very popular uh, discussion here. So normally the uh, possibility of uh, application of nano coating on the face mask yeah, coated with the nano carbons and also uh, silver nano particles yeah. and some is on the uh, coated tissue uh, to clean up the surface contaminated uh, contaminated surface okay the rest there are uh, involved with the uh, Touch surface, yeah, like the doorknob, uh, trolley handles, or the railing, yeah. Okay. So, but now uh, many companies uh, claim and produce. However, still there are many debates, yeah, uh, about the effectiveness and also the standard uh, of applying nanotechnology. Okay, this is the corrosion process. I think uh, everybody uh, understand about corrosion process, especially those uh, studying in chemistry, engineering. Yeah. Okay, corrosion will happen or will start uh, while the uh, uh, metal surface, for example, is iron uh, iron sur uh, metal surface. Okay, exposed to the water or vapor water. Vapor and also surrounded by oxygen. Yeah? So the uh, surface metal will donate the oxygen and the oxygen will react uh, with the water and also the oxygen and they will form the rust. Yeah? So you can, you can see the colors. And the, the corrosion will happen at anodic site because with the the, the surface of metals donate the electrons and the uh, the rust will happen in cathodic uh, side. So you can see all this chemical uh, equation process. Okay, this is the research scope which uh, in my talk here. Uh, there is purpose to investigate the corrosion protection of effectiveness of aluminum nanopartic coated on my steel surface and study the mechanism of nanostructured coat on surface compared to the conventional uh, coating. We are using the uh, electron beam evaporator with setting several parameters uh, including the position, current or power, time exposure or, uh, or deposition time, and handling process that is the post preparation. Okay, 
but however, I will only discuss about the set of optimal parameter after all this uh, earlier uh, parameter was optimized that current power time exposure. Yeah? Okay, so the characterization of material using FESAM, uh, FESAM, EDX, AFM, and also XRD. While for the verification of uh, performance corrosion protection, we are using linear polarization resistor technique or electrochemical corrosion test cell. Yeah? So you can see the sum of the auto from our set. Okay, this is the AFM image uh, of the samples. So you can see here for the A, there is big before annuals. Yeah, you can observe the pillar. Okay, and also the, uh, the small dots, uh, we call the nano dots. The, the white dot is representing uh, aluminium uh, particles, nano particles. And after that, we we uh, annul with the 300, 400, and 500. And you can see here from our estimation, the smallest particle at the 400 degrees C annul. And you can, you can actually observe uh, easily here. Uh, so like the uh, particle spot here, and also the pillar here, uh, smaller than the rest here. Yeah. Okay, this is the FSA micrograph and cross-section here. So once again, we are uh, observing the, uh, the surface. Okay, so you can see the nice uh, white dot here representing the aluminum uh, component or aluminum nanoparticles. And here at the right side, you can see there is the cross-section, yeah, cross-section. Uh, of the sample here, but unfortunately, we we cannot see the uh, uh, high resolution here because we don't have the equipment to measure here yeah, uh, so far. Uh, okay, otherwise, you can see the border yeah, between the uh, metal surface and also the, the coating surface here. But but fortunately, you can you can see the border here. And from <coughs> so from this. Uh, uh, micrograph and the cross section you can see there is the uh, smallest particle estimated uh, 10 nanometers yeah okay at the 400 degree c annealing that is the correspond to the AFM. there is xrd results so you can see here okay and the smallest particle at the blue Curve here, okay, rocking curve here, and also the size is 16.27 nanometers. Yeah, okay, there is correspond to the T400 degree C energy. So there is also uh, agrees with the uh, FSM and also the AFM here. So the rest you can see here before we annul, there is 35 nano M. And while we are ending with 30, 300 is the 32 and reduced to 16. And after they are increased uh, to 41, we expect because when you uh, uh, increase the temperature, so the particle of uh, aluminum start to agglomerate yeah, each other and clustering. That's why it become bigger uh, particles. Okay, corrosion performance, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, measure using linear polarization uh, resistant uh, techniques here. Okay, overall, the TEFL curve indicated the pre-treatment uh, of uh, mild steel with aluminium nanostructure coating causes a significant reduction in corrosion uh, current I core, yeah? so you can see here there is the I core axis here, so you can see they are reduced very very tremendously, yeah. Okay, uh, because after we coat and anneal, uh, so you can see this yeah? based on the calculated I core value, sample C exhibit the lowest I core value, indicating the highest resistance towards corrosion reaction. 
This is translated to 99.42% corrosion protection efficiency. Yeah. So you can see there is the sample C, okay, and the blue curve here, okay. While for the uh, P curve, there is the sample B4 annuals, C, D, and also the E here. So you can see here. Yeah. Instead of that, you can also observe the shift of the potential apply. Yeah. So uh, they are shifting to the left. So actually, there is the potential applied to the uh, uh, surface of my steel. Yeah? Okay, so because this before coated or uncoated here, after we coat the with the aluminium, so normally there is the potential applied to the uh, uh, to the aluminium coating. Yeah? Okay, so that's why they are uh, shift to the left and they, the range is quite similar here. So mostly that is the uh, correspond to the aluminium uh, nanostructure coated on mild steel. Yeah? So the corrosion parameters of the optimum sample, so you can see here. Yeah? Okay, uh, so look for the corrosion protection efficiency view here. So you can see here for the uh, for the bare mild steel before coated uh, or uncoated here. So you can see we cannot measure here yeah, because there is very very fast uh, 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 corrosion rate here. Okay, so uh, and after that for uh, uh, before annual. So you get this 99.9%. Uh, 300 degrees C annealing, we have 99.42. And after that, 400 degrees C annealing, 99.17. But you can see the highest, uh, we call corrosion protein efficiency at the uh, 300 degrees C annealing temperature here. But if you can see, there is the very close to the sample B and also the D here. So they might, uh, due to the uh, or in the range of error on here. But for the uh, 500 degrees C uh, annealing temperature, so there is quite far, 81.23. That's why I mentioned just now because the, uh, the nanoparticle of aluminium start to agglomerate, become bigger uh, particles, and uh, therefore the uh, if or the, the coating to the pore or the uneven is less. Yeah? So I will show you uh, later here. And you can see here, actually, the highest uh, corrosion protective efficiency at the sample 300 degrees C, not as our expected. Yeah? Our expectation, which is the highest, come from the smallest particles yeah okay so i will conclude uh, and discuss uh, later here. okay from the our observation and also our analysis here okay so we are proposed model proposing model of nano coated coated on miles this surface here okay so the diagram a if we are using the bigger particle or we uh, that is equivalent uh, to the uh, nano coating, yeah, mean there is only the, the the thin layer, okay, but still the compose of the big particle here, so they are still not cover the pore, the small pore, or the uneven uh, uh, surface microscopically. When when the microscopic uh, microscopically mean there is a sub micro, yeah, up to the nano here. Okay, so all this pore and also the uneven uh, or unfilled uh, pore here, that is the become big point, which is the uh, corrosion will be started here. Yeah? Okay, while if you are using the smaller particle, so the particle will able to fill up the small pore or the uneven surface microscopically and they are covered most perfect yeah? uh, surface 
of the milestone here. Okay, so mean uh, we can we can say that smaller particle will fill up the pore of surface better compared to the bigger particles. Therefore, protect corrosion better than bigger particles. Okay, we can conclude uh, once it's the, uh, the smaller particle will protect corrosion while still surface better than bigger particle. Okay, second one is the smallest particle is not necessary to give better corrosion protection, but it is certain optimum particle. So from the, our energy and our measurement, I think uh, we already present here. Okay, so uh, our suggestion, aluminum or metal nanostructured nanocoating can be used as the first layer coating and followed by the second layer coating to produce thicker coating and prevent mechanical stress, mechanical stress or effect here. Meaning after we coat uh, with the nano coating, because the, the thickness of film is maybe sub-micron, yeah? sub-micron very small, uh, there is exposed to the mechanical failure or scratch. That's why you can uh, uh, you can apply the second coating with the normal coating, either deep coating, uh, uh, spin coating, or uh, uh, spray coating. Yeah? Uh, because normally that is the advantage to industry. Nano structured coating is very high cost because the equipment you have to buy million of equipment. Price and the cost very high cost, uh, meaning uh, so you can uh, 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 put for the first layer, and after that you can use the low cost uh, uh, coating uh, to increase or the second layer with the thicker uh, coating here. Yeah. Okay, I think that's uh, the of all from from me. Okay, I would like to acknowledge. To my students and co researcher, Ministry of Higher Education for FRGS Grant and University Technology. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Saifullah, for enlightening us with the interesting speech, which is entitled Study of Mechanism on Nano-Coated Mild Steel Surface. Uh, okay, now we are open for Q&A session. Is there any question from the participants? Or do we have any question in live Facebook? I can read it for you. Okay, uh, so it seems that there is no one to ask a question. So, Prof, I just want to ask out of curiosity, uh, the PXRD powder that you run, uh, is it that one you run it before the inhaling or actually after the uh, the inhaling process? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Nurul. Uh -huh. Actually, we are uh, uh, measuring the XRD in mm -hmm. the solid XRD. That is not, not powder. Yeah? So, ah. after we work on the uh, mild steels, uh, but that, that result, as I mentioned, that is after we are annealed. But we have the results uh, while we are doing the uh, parameter of uh, current deposition, main power deposition, and also the uh, time exposure. Yeah? But we are presenting here after annealing. Uh, so that's why that is not powder, yeah? but they are nanostructured uh, coated already, meaning, meaning we uh, uh, do the analysis uh, on the solid material, not the powder. Yeah. Oh, I thought it's a powder. Yeah. So which means that even after the inhaling, the how do you say the structure because we see the the powder is still the same so which means that the component itself is very high temperature resistance isn't it like, yeah yeah uh, uh, oh okay because aluminium uh, the boiling uh, the melting point is aluminium is 600 
Ah. Uh, that's, that's why uh, if you can see that uh, at the annealing temperature of 500, they are close to the melting point. Uh, so meaning the, the, the nanoparticle uh, start to uh, become soft yeah? and they, that's why they are agglomerated. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Now I understand. Okay, so it seems that we have a question. So this is from Facebook. I uh, know this is from YouTube Live, I guess. So the first question is, is it possible to applying the titanium oxide solution onto surface of stain steel that affected by the coronavirus? Okay, as I, uh, I think uh, those uh, uh, follow my, my, my question from the prosoga just now. <laughs> so now actually, uh, we are looking for, if you are coating, uh, as I mentioned just now, the coating is the important. Uh, like the, now we call the copper is the killing metal yeah, for antibacterial, but we are not tested yet like, for the corona uh, coronavirus uh, because we don't have the facilities and that's why there are many arguments and also the uh, 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 debate lah, yeah, about that. Yeah. But we believe there is the metal uh, coated uh, is the potential for touch surface to prevent the COVID-19. Yeah. So normally we have the uh, uh, materials, uh, the important thing is the uh, uh, silver nanoparticle, also antibacteria. Yeah. Okay. Titanium dioxide, I think my, my student, yeah, Faisal, now uh, studying in Japan, yeah, uh, is doing the TiO2 on, on metals. Normally, TiO2 is very good also for the uh, antibacteria and also the fungus, but they need exposed to the UV. Yeah? Uh, so, that is the difference. Yeah? If they are inside or they are not uh, exposed to the UV, normally they are not very effective. Uh, but if you are using the uh, 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 silver nanoparticle, so you don't need to expose the uh, to the UV, and uh, and also the most popular thing is the copper, yeah, the copper coated, uh, especially if you are using nano coating. Nano, uh, that's why nano coating is different with nano structure coating. Yeah? Nano coating just very thin film, but nano structure coating you are using the very small particle and they are filled up. So mean the effectiveness. Because based on, I think Prof. Soga also uh, answered that because they are they raise about the surface to the volume ratio. Yeah, when we talk about the surface to the volume ratio, meaning with the uh, small volume, but the the effect of the surface are very high. So that's why if you are using the nano structured coating or nano coating, is more efficient than the common coating for. Uh, pandemic COVID-19. So that is the one of the area to be explored uh, yeah, to, to uh, pandemic COVID-19. Thank you. Uh -huh. oh, Prof, it seems that they have two more questions that you need to answer from the okay. participants. Uh, so the first question is from Dr. Norazila Ibrahim. Uh, I would like to know about the thickness of the coating. Is it the nano coated thickness is measured? Okay, actually we are uh, measure the nano coating, yeah? uh, nano structure coating uh, through the FSM. Yeah? Through the FSM, you you can measure. Uh, so normally they because the particle is around uh, 10 nano m, yeah? uh, so they are more than 100 nano m. So mean they they are uh, only around the 50 or 200 nano m. Uh, because we, we, we expect that the stack of particle, uh, you, you can see the stack of particle, if the particle size is 10, uh, 10 nano m, the stack of the 10 particle, so 10 times that is 100, yeah? uh, so that we expected they are lower uh, or the less than micron, that's why we call submicron, maybe they are up to the 500 nano m or 0 0.5 micron here. Okay, uh, so uh, last question. Okay, so this is from our keynote speaker this morning, Professor Totsuo Soga. Okay, so what is the physical reading that smallest particle is not necessary? Okay, from, uh, okay so from our simulation just now, yeah. Uh, uh so we can we can we, we can conclude like, no, we, we can say yeah? so from our our research here uh, even we got the uh, 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 smaller particle from this measurement but they don't give the highest protection 
uh, uh, capability. But however, as I mentioned, yeah, because the 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 particle size is quite close, yeah, ninety nine point, uh, I think. Uh, uh, the 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 protection uh, ratio is 99.5 to 99 point something yeah so uh mean you we have to uh, further and in investigate either the smallest uh, uh, particle uh will give the the good uh, uh protection because from the, our experience yeah, the optimum uh, optimum we call the smallest particle sometimes they is not give the optimum application yeah uh, so not only on the narrow coating but in many many applications sometimes we optimize uh, looking for smallest particle or the perfect uh, size of particle but suddenly they they didn't give uh, the optimum application because there's some many reason on that yeah but in our research now there is that is reason yeah Pro, Pro Soga. thank you and, and quick question. Okay. Uh, so, so the thickness is the same. You you did the experiment. Thickness is the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the experiment. Okay. So uh, the thickness is quite uh, quite same. Uh, so because normally uh, our time exposure is not quite different. Uh, and only we we expect in the smaller particle they be stack is. Uh, in uh, uh stack in several number of particle but in bigger particle mean bigger because uh, i think the, the size is only 16 nano m and 30 nano m yeah? so we expect that is uh sub micron and around 500 nano m or 0 0.5 micron probably yeah? they're not up to the micron of course let's see thank you Rob. thank you Okay, um, so uh, sorry because we are running out of time. So if anyone have a further question, you can directly email or contact Professor Dr. Saifullah Abdullah. Now, we need to proceed with our second speaker. Okay, so thank you once again, Prof. Dr. Saifullah. Okay, so now we need to proceed with our second speaker. I would am pleased to introduce and invite our second speaker, which is Associate Professor Technology CHM Dr. Nick Ahmad Nizam Nick Malik. He is currently the Director of Center for Sustainable Nanomaterials, Ibn Sina Institute for Scientific and Industrial Research, University Technology in Malaysia. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nick give his talk. So the mic uh, is yours, Dr. Nick. Okay, right. Sorry for this. Um, okay, we'll share the slide first. Okay, right. So, hope you can see my slide here. Okay, um, can I start, Dr. Fiza? Yes, you can start. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, that's mean you hear my voice, okay? Yes. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi And good afternoon, everyone. So it's good to be here, the ICRES uh, 2021. Uh, thank you very much, um, Pusat Asasi UITM. Uh, we have it, actually Prof. Uh, Saifullah, right? The director of the uh, UITM also as a invited speaker just now. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, and thank you, Chairperson, Dr. Fereza. Okay. So this is my title of the uh, speech for today, uh, for the talk for the today. I'm the Director of uh, Center for Sustainable, Sustainable Nanomaterial, or in short, we call it SCS Nano, UTM. Okay. Um, so the title is, uh, is a development of a hybrid, uh, organic, inorganic antibacterial agent. Right. Okay. So before that, before we go into deep, uh, I think do you know what is a hybrid car, right? Um, and do you know what is the purpose of the hybrid car, right? So before that, uh, hybrid car is the uh, combination of two uh, what do you call it energy. Uh, one is a battery, and another one is using fuel. And uh, 
we use hybrid car, not we use uh, the manufacturing is hybrid car is uh, associated for the a better environment or for a better world. Uh, they always say that the hybrid car can reduce the environmental pollution. So uh, actually the same goes to the material. Uh, material, any material uh, can be uh, combined together, okay? The elements can be combined together and it can form hybrid. Uh, so we call it as a hybrid material. So the purpose is also the same. Uh, the purpose of the hybrid material is also the same. We want to reduce the elements or the materials that we use, okay, for a better world, for uh, solving the problem with the environment. So for this uh, speech, for this talk, uh, I will talk about the hybrid material. So if you can see here, okay, gonna... okay so if you can see here, so this is the um, zeolite. Zeolite is one of the aluminum silicate, and then we can put it in organic uh, compound or in organic ion and attach with the organic compound inside the carrier system, which is your life. So this is what we call it hybrid material, hybrid organic and also inorganic materials. So this um, talk, uh, I, will, I will give a talk uh, based on this content, okay? Uh, first is about the issue of the, uh, especially on the antibacterial agent, okay, uh, types of uh, antibacterial agent and uh, support system or carrier system that we use and some of the uh, progress on the development of a uh, hybrid anti antibacterial agent and the potential application of uh, hybrid antibacterial agents. Create a bit, um, a little bit information or definition of antimicrobial agent. Okay, uh, I'm using the term uh, for this topic, I'm using the term antibacterial agent. But now I give a definition of antimicrobial agent because uh, I want you to know that there are actually different uh, between the definition of antimicrobial agent and also antibacterial agent. Okay, uh, antimicrobial agent is a general term that we use for drugs, chemicals, or other substances that either kill or slow the growth of microbes. Good. So there are actually two mechanisms here. Whether this antimicrobial agent, antimicrobial agent can kill the microbe or it can slow or inhibit the growth of microbes. So those are two uh, mechanisms because some of the antimicrobial agent, they do not kill the microbe, but they just only inhibit or slow the growth of the microbes. So among the antimicrobial agents, there are antibacterial drugs, antibiotics, antiviral agents, antifungal, and antiparasitic drugs. So antibacterial drugs or antibacterial compound or antibacterial agents, they are focusing on the bacteria only. Okay, but for the antibiotics, antibiotics is more uh, general, okay, but actually for the antibiotics is uh, it's a common drug that we use to kill the uh, bacterium. So it is antivirus, of course, lah, antivirus. Okay. So for this um, for this talk, I'm focusing on the antibacterial uh, agent because we just uh, we, we have done on the uh, performance study against uh, different types of bacteria only. Okay. So uh, so this is the issue that relates to the development of the hybrid uh, organic and organic antibacterial agent. Uh, one of the problem with the antibiotic or antimicrobial agent or antibacterial antibacterial agent is that the bacteria can resist towards these uh, agents. Okay, if you can see here, this uh, the facts uh, regarding this issue. Uh, more than 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infection occur in the US and more than 35,000 people died as a result of this uh, problem. So uh, this bacteria can actually resist towards this antibiotic. Even they grow and they come up with a new strain. For example, like MRSA. MRSA is a, sometimes they call it as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, it's come from the Staphylococcus aureus, one of the bacteria and sometimes they call it as a multi-drug resistant of a Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, and because of this problem, 
MOH Ministry of Health and also uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Agro-based Industry uh, because this is the 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 antiviral antimicrobial agents is also related to the agriculture because they use it for the veterinary veterina okay so they come up with a Malaysian action plan on antimicrobial resistance 2017 up to 2021 so there are actually four objectives Okay, uh, they they uh, they have done this, and one of the objective is to optimize the use of antimicro antimicro medicine in human and animal health. Optimize the use because the high usage of these uh, antibiotics or antimicrobial agents actually lead to this uh, antimicrobial resistance for the bacteria. Okay, so this has uh, another issue. Uh, Okay, the high usage of the antibacterial agent create secondary problem, which is a uh, pollution uh, to the environment. So if we can see the cycle here, okay. Uh, so once this uh, antibacterial agent uh, or antibiotics they are released into the environment, especially in water, uh, so it will go to the our our cycle our environment and uh, poultry cattle healthcare facilities and so on okay so uh, these antibacterial agents they are actually exist in environment and then it create another problem which is uh, contaminants of imaging concern or CEC CEC ini is one of the uh, environmental issue nowadays okay that uh, that we need to uh, solve it or we need to overcome it okay So what is CEC? Contaminants of imaging imaging concern. CEC is a term used to describe pollutants that have been detected in the aquatic environment that may cause ecological or human health. So despite advancement, significant obstacles still prevent comprehensive assessment of the environmental risk associated with the presence of CEC. So CEC ni contaminants of imaging concern ni uh, actually is a uh, current issue lah okay current issue uh, and antibiotics the release of antibiotics and also antibacterial agent uh, release into the water and uh, talking about the advancement advancements in term of analysis okay some of the new compound here and new compound new contaminants here uh, cannot be detected by our conventional method okay but they they actually these contaminants affect our environment and also affect our human health okay so these are the issues of the antimicrobial uh, agent okay uh, the high usage of antimicrobial agent first is antimicrobial resistant and release of a high amount of uh, antibacterial and also antimicrobial agents to the environment and this create a uh, contaminants of imaging concern CEC uh, sometimes I'm using antimicrobial Sometimes I'm using antibacterial, okay. Sometimes I'm using antibiotics, okay. Uh, so it's actually is uh, for the antibacterial is under antimicrobial agent, okay. So what we can do to overcome these issues is by optimizing the use of uh, antibacterial agent. Uh, we still can use the antibacterial agent, okay. We can use the various uh, agents available commercially or we develop with our own work uh, in the lab but we need to opti optimize it so how we can optimize this we can incorporate these antibacterial agents in a carrier system okay it's like a, a uh, it's like a car lah. okay uh, we put it inside the carrier system and we need to find out suitable carrier system so uh, this is actually the 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 one of the uh, Technique is to come up with a hybrid uh, organic and organic antibacterial agent. Okay. So these are the antibacterial agents. Okay. Uh, avail available in the market and also is uh, used widely in household and also in the pharmaceutical. Uh, it can be divided to two. One of one is organic antibacterial agent which are surfactant, chlorhexidine, antibiotic, triclosan, and many more, okay? Surfactant also, there are types of surfactant. Surfactant is a surface active agent, okay? There are uh, 
many types of surfactant. There are cat, cat ionic surfactant uh, having a positively charged. There are anionic surfactant uh, negatively charged. There are actually non-ionic surfactant and also amphoteric surfactant. But for this study, okay, uh, for our study, we're focusing on a cat, cat ionic surfactant, quaternary ammonium compound, because because it has a positively charged. Okay, uh, we, we can use other surfactant, but it depends also on the uh, carrier system. Okay, and the inorganic antibacterial agent that we use uh, is a uh, silver. Okay, silver ions, not the silver nanoparticle. Okay, silver nanoparticle also can be used as antibacterial agent. But for this study, because we want to uh, put it inside the zeolite, okay, the aluminum silicate, so uh, we need to consider the positively charge of the uh, antibacterial agent. So they are actually uh, silver, gold, copper, zinc, okay, uh, titanium dioxide that we can use as an antibacterial agent. Okay, uh, before we go, um, explain about the uh, concept of the hybrid uh, material uh, antibacterial agent. This is our preliminary finding. Okay, in 2011, we come up with a simple experiment and we present it in the International Congress on the Malaysian Society for Microbiology. Okay, we try to combine these metals and uh, silver or copper with the quaternary ammonium compound or surfactant. Okay, uh, we, we, we uh, combine it together in the solution form and we see the antibacterial activity of this combination. And we found out that when this metal, okay, silver plus or copper 2 plus, uh, combined together with uh, CTAP, CTAP is acetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide or CPB, acetyl uh, pyridinium bromide or BKC, uh, benzyl conium chromate. Uh, those are the uh, carrying surfactant, uh, is lowering the antibacterial activity. Okay. Um, so it might be due to the um, pre precipitation occur after these two compounds react. Uh, for example, Ag plus can react with a, a chloride ion. It's, com, uh, it's form uh, silver chloride, AgCl, and then it will precipitate and then it's lowering the antibacterial activity. So, what we can do is that these two, these two types of antibacterial agents can be immobilized on the suitable carrier system, okay, such as zeolite, carbon nanotube, clay, and so on, okay, uh, which uh, eventually can produce uh, liquid to solid system as compared to the liquid-liquid uh, systems, okay. So this is actually the ideas come from. Uh, so that's why the the one of the important things in come up with the hybrid organic and organic materials is to find out suitable carrier system or support system. Okay, so uh, a carrier system that we choose is zeolite. Why zeolite? Because zeolite uh, is aluminum silicate. Okay, it is actually in three dimensional form. It has a negatively charge. It is inert. Okay, it does not have antibacterial activity and actually is safe to the human uh, in actually use of, um, in the uh, pit stop and it has a K-ion chain capacity. Zeolite can be divided into uh, natural and also synthetic zeolites. So natural zeolites uh, is actually abundant at volcanic area, not in Malaysia. We can found this uh, zeolite at Indonesia because there is a volcanic area and they actually use uh, in the fertilizer, not as fertilizer, but uh, one of the component in the fertilizer. Okay, uh, there is also synthetic zeolites that we can uh, synthesize it in the lab. Uh, for example, we can synthesize it uh, from uh, silica, uh, from the source of silica and also from the clay. So, uh, you can imagine that uh, zeolite is in the 3D form. So, there are actually internal pores. Okay, here is the internal pore. Of, uh, uh, it is also contain a negatively charged and this negatively charged can accommodate with the uh, positively charged uh, material or element or okay, ions here. 
So once we exchange with some metal ions, for example, like AJ plus, we can create metal loaded zeolite or silver loaded zeolite. Uh, but in this case, uh, if you, because if you want to come up with the hybrid material, we want to reserve some space for the uh, organic compound. So we just uh, considering the 50% from the K ion exchange capacity. Okay, so this is CEC is a term for the zeolite K ion exchange capacity, only half of the CEC that we consider. And then um, after that, okay, so bef uh, before we go into the uh, organo modified uh, silver zeolite, let's look at the surfactant. So this is surfactant, cyanide surfactant. It has a positively charged head uh, and also it has a hydrophilic uh, uh, characteristic and it has a hydrocarbon tail or hydrophobic region here. So, uh, metal loaded zeolite can be uh, attached with uh, surfactant. Okay. Uh, from our study, we found out that if we uh, attach with a lower amount or lower concentration of surfactant, it will uh, produce a single layer of uh, surfactant, surfactant layer uh, on the surface of the zeolite. But if the, we use the higher amount of surfactant or higher concentration of surfactant, there will be a bilayer formation on the surface of the zeolite. And this actually, uh, uh, what we call this, the reverse the charge from uh, negative to the positive. So actually from here, uh, we can actually optimize the use of antimicrobial agent here. Okay, so we can reduce the amount of uh, silver ion that we put it here. It's just only 50% from the uh, ion exchange capacity of the zeolite. Okay, and then uh, half from the CEC, we put it um, surfactant either at uh, lower concentration or higher concentration. Okay, um, and this also we can determine the amount that absorbed by surfactant. Okay, so this is the possible antibacterial mechanism of surfactant molecules on a metal loaded zeolite. Okay, on the uh, surfactant, where we call it surfactant modified metal loaded zeolite. Okay, uh, there are actually two mechanisms that we propose. Okay, one is that the release of antibacterial ions here. So this is silver ions released from the zeolite uh, and also the release of the surfactant molecules uh, into the solution or into the media. And this metal ions, uh, silver plus and also surfactant molecules, uh, kill those bacteria. In another mechanism, okay, uh, actually we found out also this one, the uh, bacteria, because it consists of the lipid uh, layer here on the membrane on the membrane of the bacteria, uh, so it can uh, uh, attach or it can be absorbed by the surfactant modified uh, metal loaded zeolite here uh, through the hydrophobic interaction, and then after that the metal ion will kill the bacteria through the localized uh, silver ion inside the framework of the zeolites. Okay, a little bit uh, characteristic or characterization of surfactant silver zeolite. Um, okay, so if you can see here, this is the SRA reflection uh, or SRA patterns of uh, some of the sample that we produce. Okay, uh, one is a zeolite and a Y here. Okay, uh, zeolite and GY. Uh, HDMA is hexadecitramethyl ammonium, zeolite AGY, BKC is benzalkonium chloride, zeolite AGY. And uh, actually, from this SRD, what we can say is that there is no changes in the SRD patterns, and there is no changes in, in the uh, framework structure of the zeolite because the resorption of uh, AG and also cation uh, patterns occur. Uh, based on the ion, K ion exchange only on the zeolite without, uh, without um, distracting or without uh, what do you call this uh, affecting the zeolite structure. 
Okay, in another uh, study, okay, actually we have a lot of uh, characterization technique because, but because of the uh, limited time here, so I just give you only SID. So actually we have done on the FDIR infrared spectroscopy, the FISEM, the release study and many things, okay. But here I'm just uh, give you the concept of the hybrid uh, uh, material or hybrid uh, antibacterial agent only. Okay, and then we determine the MIC, minimum inhibition concentration, where uh, it's actually the minimum concentration that can kill the bacteria. The lower the MIC value here, the higher the antibacterial activity of the material. So we have done this against uh, E. coli, a common uh, bacteria, okay, and also as ORES. This E. coli is a gram negative and also as ORES, Staphylococcus aureus is a gram positive bacteria. And then we have studied in this water and also saline solution. Why we are doing this? Because in saline solution, there is a chloride ions. And uh, this AG, okay, AG zeolite uh, is really affected by the saline solution because in the saline solution, there is a precipitation of uh, silver chloride. And the, uh, the, the, the antibacterial activity is uh, reduced. Uh, in the saline solution as compared to the distilled water. So what we can see from the MIC value is that uh, the lower MIC here showing that the higher antibacterial activity as compared to the zeolite Y, uh, surfactor modified zeolite and also silver zeolite. So this hybrid, this is a hybrid material antibacterial agent has the higher anti antibacterial activity as compared to other material. Okay, so these are the list of paper related to antibacterial agents that uh, we have produced. Okay, in uh, in this year, okay, we come up with the streptomycin uh, immobilized on zeolite synthesized from natural coronine. Uh, you can actually, uh, it's already published. Okay, you can read this in the, uh, you can find it in the, um, in the suitable, uh, okay, usually in Google Scholar, lah, okay. And then absorption of gentamicin. So gentamicin is one of the antibiotic on surfactant carbonate. Carbonate is one of the clay that we can use as a carry system also. And then amine functionalized zeolite Y. Amine is the uh, organic compound. Okay, we know that we functionalize zeolite Y. And inorganic, inorganic loaded carry system. So here we use uh, what we call silver zeolite that we synthesize it uh, from carbonate. Copper exchange zeolite Y and silver exchange zeolite uh, Y. And these are the list of paper related to the hybrid, ma hybrid materials. Okay, uh, so we have tried on the chlor chlorhexidine is one of the antibacterial agent, modified zinc carinide. Uh, amine functionalized uh, ZIF-8 uh, CPB or cetyl pyridinium bromide, uh, modified silver loaded carinide. Uh, amine functional silver zeolite and also chlorexidine uh, loaded silver chlorinite and uh, amine functional silver exchange zeolite. So uh, it's not just only surfactant modified zeolite. So we have tried uh, different carrier system and also different organic compound and also different uh, inorganic compounds. So uh, this hybrid materials has a higher antibacterial activity as compared to the single uh, antibacterial agent. And this um, uh, hybrid uh, antibacterial agent can be used uh, as antibacterial, active ingredient in antibacterial soap, active ingredient in antibio falling pain, for wound healing, coating surgery room, coating medical device, and also antibacterial cream. And we could, can put it uh, as one of the element, uh, one of the, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, elements in the first aid kit. Okay, so uh, to summarize this uh, talk, uh, so I, I, I give you an uh, overview about the issues of the antimicrobial agent. So there are uh, antimicrobial resistance, the release of uh, antimicrobial agents to uh, environment, create contaminants of emerging concerns, uh, CC, uh, so what we can do to overcome this is to, to optimize the use of antimicrobial agent. Uh, so I 
uh, give information about the concept of concept of hybrid organic and organic activated agent. So these are important information or strategies in developing hybrid materials. Uh, first uh, is to understand the structure and physical chemical properties of the materials. Find suitable carrier system. So this is also one of the important things that, that you, you need to know. And also optimize the amount of both organic and inorganic elements. Understand the mechanism. The mechanism can be mechanism for the preparation of this uh, material. The characteristic of uh, this material, the antibacterial mechanism, because it can help you to optimize uh, the amount of these elements and study the performance of the materials as comparison with the control samples. Uh, control samples too is the single antibacterial agent or raw materials, uh, the carrier system itself without the antibacterial agent. Um, Okay, again, I put it this slide again. So uh, I want to show you that the hybrid material can also uh, for our uh, better world uh, to uh, reduce the environmental uh, pollution. So I would like to acknowledge all of the students, staff and all, and all of the personnel, uh, invo uh, also my collaborator involved in this project development and also for the funder. Uh, under the average uh, uh, project and the MO initial and also UTM. And thank you very much. And before that, uh, I would like to promote this uh, journal. So this is the new journal under uh, CS Nino. I'm the chief editor of the journal, Journal of Mater Materials in Life Science. So if you have any papers uh, that you want to submit, you can uh, visit this uh, journal Okay, uh, and hopefully that uh, you can submit a good paper to this channel. So I think uh, with that, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nick, for aligning us with his interesting speech. Now I open for the Q&A session. Is there any question from the members? from the participants. So let's have a look in our YouTube also. Oh, seems they don't have any question. Uh, okay, uh, doctor, I just have a, a very simple question. Uh, actually, because you are using Zeolite, right? Uh, like, is it the porous city? Because your light is porous, right? Yes. They have a, a like pore. So, is it the pore is also uh, play important part in the optimization in antimicrobial agent? Okay, right. That's a good, really good question. Okay, because we need also to consider the pore. Yes. Okay, actually, okay. Yeah. Uh, in my research, I come up with a few type of zeolite. And there is a zeolite A, zeolite X, zeolite Y, and three types of natural zeolite. Okay, so this all zeolite, they have a different families. And when you can come up with the different families or different category, they have different porosity, right? Yes. It's a small pore, and zeolite A too, it has a small pore. Uh, zeolite X and, and Y is actually under vorticide structure, which have uh, the largest pore among other zeolite. So actually, the porosity also is very important when you want to develop uh, this antibacterial agent because the, the antibacterial activity is come from the amount of antibacterial agent. Right? And this absorption capacity or ion exchange capacity is also depend on the pore. Right? So the higher the, uh, the, the larger the pore uh, will create the higher absorption capacity or higher K, higher K ions exchange capacity and also silver ions is the size or diameter of the silver ions is much like is much larger than the sodium ions or calcium ions right uh -huh. uh, to basic basic nila okay basic uh, basic diameter of the ion. ion so porosity also is very important and uh, i found out that Although zeolite A, it has a higher K-ion exchange capacity, 
but it has a low porosity because of the rigid structure as compared to the like X and also the like Y. So it's affect the antibacterial activity. Uh, mm. Jadi uh, for the antibacterial activity itu, the like X and the like Y has much higher antibacterial activity as compared to the like A. Ah, so which so, means that the mm. pore is also play important roles. Yes. Ah, so, right. ha, ha, ha. Okay, mm. okay, understand. Okay, so we have one more last question. Ah, uh, mm. because we're running out of time, so they have. Um, is that your team has study on efficiency and efficacy of this antibacterial? Okay. Uh, the word efficiency and also efficacy is really big actually. Uh -huh. uh, well, actually we have done many things huh, because uh, actually uh, I'm from the Department of Biosciences, Faculty of Science. My background is chemistry. So uh, actually interestingly, I have uh, facilities to facilities to to do this antibacterial uh, assay and also the uh, analysis of the um, what do you call this uh, of the antibacterial agent released into the solution so actually we have done on several antibacterial assay because antibacterial assay ni is not just only one or two methods there are many methods there is a minimum inhibition concentration there are minimum bactericidal concentration There are actually uh, also minimum bacteriostatic uh, inhibition. There is inhibition, in, inhibition growth studies. There is actually uh, morphology, morphological studies of the uh, bacteria and so on and so many things. Lah. So we actually we have come up with a different uh, angle of the antibacterial uh, assay. And then we we found out that uh, the result is almost similar where the hybrid materials ni, the combination of uh, two types of antibacterial agents ni, uh, they have higher efficiency and also efficacy as compared to the single anti uh, antibacterial agent or as compared to the raw, materi uh, raw uh, materials. Okay, so the efficiency and efficacy is based on various methods that we uh, have done okay not just only one because actually normally normally if you are not in the department of uh, you are not in a bioscience or biology uh, area uh, you uh, when you come up with antibacterial assay uh, some student just use uh, one technique this diffusion technique and uh, from the this diffusion technique there is a hello zone only okay So there's actually only one technique, but it cannot uh, determine the efficiency and also the efficacy of the antibacterial agent. So we need to have a, a combination of several antibacterial assays uh, that we need to do for this uh, antibacterial agent. So I think that is my question, Dr. Filza. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you Dr. Nick okay. for answering for all the questions. So, yeah. sorry once again for those who live, we cannot uh, answer uh, any more questions because we are running out of time. So, if you have further question to Dr. Nick, you can directly email him. Okay, so now we would like to proceed with our third and last invited speaker for this session. I am pleased to introduce our third invited speaker which is Professor Engineer uh, Technology Dr. Muhammad Rusuk Mahmud. He is a currently the head of Nano SciTech Center, IOS Institute of Science, University Technology Mara, Malaysia. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Rusuk to give his talk. Okay, Prof. Rusuk, the mic is yours. Uh, Prof. Russo, I think you forgot to open your mic.
So hopefully it's okay now. Okay. Can you see uh, my slide on the screen? Yes, we can see your slide and we can hear your voice now. <coughs> yeah, Bismillah. So much, Doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Th thank you so much for your uh, introduction. And then before I proceed my presentation today, related to the uh, physical behavior of titanium dioxide uh, nanotube array via electrochemical anodization method for ultra sensitive humidity sensor detection, I would like to thank to uh, the uh, conference committee, eh, especially to our director, Professor Dr. Sefullah, for giving me a chance eh, to give uh, an invited talk uh, today. Eh. So uh, this paper is uh, with collaboration of this, eh, those members on the slide, uh, and the main player of uh, this research is uh, NEA Azhar, eh, this uh, she is my PhD student. So what I want uh, to highlight uh, related to uh, she is doing uh, her research related to this because I will try to focus uh, my presentation today related to the uh, research gap uh, between the literature review and what we are doing in our lab. And then uh, for the result in discussion, I will uh, only focus to the part that we have been published only. So some um, part that may be very important that I should highlight, but since it is not published yet and then my PhD student is struggle for that. So I will avoid all presenting uh, of that. And then one of our collaboration is from University of Malaya also, Dr. Ahmad uh, Suhaimi. So this, before I start my uh, presentation, I proceed with more detail. Uh, my presentation, remember, this is a face. If you want to follow me on the Facebook and so on, please remember my, my face. Huh? Otherwise, you will follow the different person. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So this is the content of my presentation today. Okay. Uh, this is the four uh, points that I will focus today. So the first thing is I will highlight related to the literature review, huh? related to the uh, issues, research gap. Okay. And the problem statement related to the title, related to the uh, title, it, I will also will brainstorm, will propose the idea, the hypothesis that what as a re researcher we should think, we should think uh, of that so that uh, we could uh, consider as an objective uh, uh, in our research. So I'm telling like this because I hope that uh, okay some of our uh, researchers from especially from UIT and Benkil, uh, Hopefully, they will uh, would be interested uh, to join our research group uh, to do research in this area, inshallah. And then, after uh, I present related to uh, the uh, to propose the research objective, I uh, will explain in detail uh, related to the uh, methodology that uh, we have uh, selected. Because in uh, doing this research, actually, we in our lab we are. We are uh, doing, uh, we, we are synthesizing, then fabricating, uh, fabricating the electronic device by uh, various type of research methodology. So for this uh, presentation, in this presentation, uh, we focus uh, to synthesis uh, the material uh, by uh, iona, iona, uh, by anodization method. Okay, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, we will select some of the crystallization method. Uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, on the uh, characteristic of material, the properties of material that are required, okay, uh, we to know in order to utilize that material in the device fabrication, in, in the fabrication of the device fabrication that is the, uh, in this presentation is to use that material to fabricate the humidity sensor. And then in the uh, third part of my presentation, I will go uh, to the result and discussion and uh, determine okay the suitability of the properties of the uh, material that we synthesis thought uh, to a fabricate device and finally we will discuss related to the uh, device properties. So uh, this morning also some of our friends eh, uh, in this uh, conference has asked. Huh, and I I have add some of the information related to why we have used titanium oxide, why we have used the oxide. Uh, since some of our uh, participants today asking about that. Huh? So I hope that will be helpful to our participants also to know what uh, uh, 
the reason why uh, we are choosing, okay, we are considering TiO2, okay, nanostructured TiO2 as uh, material, okay, uh, as a material uh, to you uh, to to fabricate the device. So there's so many uh, so many merit of TiO2, okay, uh, that we can uh, we can what we can we can use for various kind of application. For example. My area is related to the last two, for example, uh, catalyst. Use use uh, titanium dioxide as a catalyst, as a photocatalyst. Use TiO2 as a solar cell, as a as LLD. And the last at the bottom one is today. I'm going to present to you all uh, how we are going to use uh, to synthesize the nanostructure TiO2 and to use in the uh, humidity sensor uh, fabrication. So. This is the advantage of the TiO2. Okay, uh, so one uh, of the uh, the advantage of uh, TiO2 is it is stable to heat, light, and weathering prevents degradation of paint in films and uh, and brittle okay of plastics okay, and then uh, that's why okay. Uh, TiO2 okay can be used as a coating uh, as a coating material. So in our case, okay, we synthesis nano structured TiO2. We form the composite as uh, been presented uh, by uh, uh, by uh, Doctor Nick just now uh, to use uh, as a pro uh, protecting material, for example. So so many application that we can use uh, TiO2 uh, in our in various application. Uh, so this is also we I could say as an example uh, of the properties because so many more uh, the merit of using TiO2. Uh. So in our case, we have selected uh, TiO2 uh, based on this one white band gap material with Anatase 3.2 uh, EV electron volt and energy the optical band gap uh, uh, the, the optical band gap okay or energy band gap uh, that is uh, required by uh, to move from the uh, from the valence band to the the, the, con the, the conduction band, and then rutile. Also, uh, the 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 uh, TiO two consists of three different phases actually. Yeah? So uh, the type of TiO two that uh, able to use in the electronic uh, device production is usually anatase and rutile. So here anatase. Uh, the optical band gap for another is 3.2 EV. It actually is, is uh, a big, for example, if you want, is a big, required a big energy yeah, for electron to, to move, uh, for, to jump from balance band to conduction, conduction band. Especially, for example, when we consider to utilize TiO2 uh, in the solar cell fabrication. But, okay, TiO2 has other, okay, other merit or other properties. Other properties that is better okay, than other materials, such as, for example, even the optical bond gap is high, is high, very high compared to the requirement of uh, the energy band gap, uh, necessary energy band gap when we want to use uh, TiO2 in the solar cell application, that is 1.6 EV. But TiO2 has another characteristic, such as it very sensitive with light. The absorption coefficient is very high compared to other material, and then it also has high porosity. This makes TiO2, okay, uh, cause the TiO2 has higher absorption coefficient, and then TiO2 also, for example, uh, when we fabricate, for example, solar cell using TiO2, it able to absorb uh, very at the at the uh, at the interface part. Right? It uh, able to absorb the electrolyte material that we use in it. So that kind of is because of the porosity. That also actually uh, okay part of the uh, what uh, we have discussed during during uh, our conference today. So the application on the right side uh, at bottom. So application photocatalyst, dye sensor, sensor cell, light light diode, light emitting diode and sensor. So humidity sensor is one of them. So first, let me introduce. Uh, uh, a bit the properties of the O2 that we need to consider when we want to fabricate the electronic device. For example, okay, when we want to fabricate 
solar cell, for example, okay, the Dyson solar cell, the SSC solar cell. So we need to to consider about the uh, about the charge generation or charge regeneration. So this is very important because we need uh, charge. We need more charge, okay? Uh, to uh, we need to generate more charge so that uh, we have more uh, uh, the electron to flow in the circuit. Compared to the LED, for example, LED, we 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 don't need charge regeneration. If possible, minimum charge regeneration, but higher charge recombination. This is very important. So, how to do all of this? We need to uh, for sensor for sensors. The characteristic of material required to uh, in sensor fabrication is same as the DSSC solar cell that require more charge. Okay, uh, to to flow more electron to flow compared to the charge recombination. We should avoid the charge generation. But for LED, we need to increase the re charge recombination. So how to control this? This I give as an example. So there are two ways. It's really uh, been reported in the literature or based on the basic theory. Yeah? One is through the doping process. So that we are doing also in our lab to dope, okay, to dope the uh, titanium dioxide or to dope the zinc oxide, for example, if we use zinc oxide in the device fabrication. Uh, so that by controlling the doping, we are able to control, okay, uh, to control the charge produced, uh, okay, the the charge, the electron mobility, for example, or to control the uh, recombination of the charge. So here, the important thing is, for example, if we do heavy doping, for example, it might cause to the increase of charge recombination. So we, if we want to fabricate solar cells, this is not, so, not suitable. Okay, so this is very important. Like, so the same consideration also we should uh, uh, consider when we want to fabricate the humidity sensor. We, uh, we when we want to, uh, when we do the annealing process, okay? The doping, doping process is the process to introduce the impurity into the semiconductor. Now we are talking about the semiconductor. Okay? So the doping process, in doping process, we want to introduce the impurity, either, either negative, uh, either electron or, uh, or hole. So when we want to introduce, we need to know the limitation so that it will only create movement of electron to generate the electron not to increase the recombination. So same for the, uh, same for the uh, annealing process. It's the process to diffuse the electron and at the same time to diffuse the holes in different direction. Okay? So and at the same time, it rearrange the atom and the crystalline phase. So we need to optimize that. So in, in this paper that I'm going to uh, present okay in this paper is the optimization of annealing process in order to make sure that our material suitable to be used in the in the humidity sensor not to uh, to become not to have the characteristic of material that is suitable to the light emitting diode because it might cause to the reduce of the humidity efficiency okay so this is the io2 so many uh uh, for example, that number seven. I give some of the example because so many, uh, so many. The the main the main uh, things, the main characteristic uh, of the TiO two or nano uh, nano TiO two or uh, nano zinc oxide that required in the is uh, is uh, the one that I have presented just now. For example, the number seven is large surface area. Uh, this so how to optimize the system so that we are able to increase the large surface area that su surface area that suitable in device fabrication so large surface area with porosity for example that is our aim okay and then the the, the last part of the number 7 that i have uh, cited from the reference number 7 uh, uh, in this uh, reference highly uniform morphologies and unique nano architecture with less interfacial grain boundaries so less interfacial because it well arranged and so if this is the IO2 nanotube array has this kind of characteristic, that's why our aim to produce the nanostructure TIO2 nanotube. Okay. So the same characteristic of material also actually, okay. Okay, we can we can obtain from the nanostructure zinc oxide, okay, other than non-toxic. 
it been reported can be used for light uh, LED, solar cell sensor, and then the characteristic uh, like structural properties, for example. Okay, the structure of morphology it also uh, exists in various kind of phase of material such as nano nano road. TiO two also has in this phase of material. So the difference, for example, between these two type of semiconductor is, for example, porosity. Uh, the, direct, the, uh, the level of the porosity, the level of absorption coefficient, the level of semi semiconducting characteristics. So this all need to be adjusted, need to be optimized. So this is actually what researchers should think of this, uh, uh, of optimizing of the characteristic. So, uh, like for example, for example, nanostructure, uh, titanium oxide, as I said just now. So it has, on the top of the properties that of zinc oxide, it has higher porosity compared to zinc oxide. So, a compared to zinc oxide. But it also has the demerit, such as, for example, uh, nanostructure titanium oxide has, has, the, has higher defects, for example. Uh, so, how to do this? We need to consider the doping process and the, uh, the annealing process. And then, this is an uh, example of the example of the dopant that we have selected uh, uh, in our lab to proceed uh, this research to fabricate the LED, to fabricate the solar cell and to fabricate the humidity sensor. There is the niobium pentoxide, yeah, NB2O. Uh, so we have also done research on this, but today I'm not going to this. Yeah, I, was, I, want, I just want to highlight from the beginning that uh, we actually considering to uh, of doping also because of what I have explained just now, but this paper is not doing on this. Just focus on the uh, uh, on the uh, on on the annealing process. So this is the issues in the latest review with the TO2. So many issues we have determined when we want to use in LD, it has a problem. Okay, when we want to use in humidity sensor, also it has a uh, a problem. For example. The, the emission efficacy reduced because of large amount of light generated is trapped inside the device and not emitted out, uh, outside. Uh, so this this is make the TiO2 cannot use for LED. So how? If we want to use LED, how to do that? So due to this, the charge regulation decrease. Uh, so this is what we need to think. So but so but TiO2, if we dock, we succeed to dock with niobium dioxide and we succeed to optimize the alien temperature, we hope that not on we could gain with the level of the charge recombination that required in the LED fabrication. Or we could gain the conductivity, okay, that required in the fabrication of humidity sensor and DSSC that required the charge generation and required the certain level of the conductivity. So this all. So let me go directly to the okay to the problem segment that we have considered related to this presentation today. Uh, so this is the problem segment. So so many issues, and then so many problem that we should consider. Okay, related to the uh, TiO two, but okay, in order to utilize in our device uh, to utilize this material. Uh, in uh, the the humidity device fabrication, okay, we have considered uh, we have considered these two, okay, two problem as a main problem that uh, we believe if we able to solve this, uh, we will succeed to fabricate the humidity sensor. So the first one is due to the unstable crystallite structure of TiO two due, uh, okay. TiO2 due low te temperature. So at low temperature, okay, the crystallite structure is not stable. The uh, the properties, okay, the properties of nano structure TiO2 is not stable. It's not stable means the uh, atoms, the electrons is not situated. It's not situated at the uh, position where it should exist. So how to do that? So in order to do that, we should consider the method that during the synthesization process also we able to re, to position the electron at certain place so that 
it will be stable. So that the crystallized structure will be stable. So that one will be stable. That is very important. So, and the second one, large optical band gap. This is problem. The, the problem, because when the optical band gap is large, we need more power. When the optical band light is large, we need more energy. Like for example, if we want to use for solar cell, we need uh, we need other substance, we need other help, such as for example, we need uh, electrolyte to help that to absorb the light, to pump, to uh, to to purge the electron, okay, to to the uh, top surface of the uh, the photoanode, to the TiO two. So we we need extra energy. And then for the humidity sensor also, we need more power. We need more, more voltage. Okay, so how to do that? We need to, okay, this is the problem. So how to do that? So in order to gain, in order to solve that problem with the motivation, with the motivation, with the hypothesis that I have explained just now, so we have considered these two objectives in our research to fabricate, uh, to synthesis uh, the nano structure TiO2 that is called as the TiO2 nanotube array, okay, uh, to be used in our device progression. The first objective is so to synthesis of highly ordered anatase TiO2 nanotube array, okay, highly ordered means well aligned, okay, and dense by electrochemical analyzation method, okay, by the uh, by the use of uh, electrochemical electrochemical that. Uh, considering the uh, analyzation me uh, uh, method to etching, okay, uh, in order to form the nanostructure TO2 with the nanotube array phase. Uh, so to synthesis the highly ordered. And then the second one is to enhance the optical band gap of TO2 nanotube array at different annealing temperatures. So we have uh, we have considered okay to optimize the annealing uh, temperature in order to gain the problem in in order in order to uh, to consider the research issue and to gain, okay, to solve the problem that I have explained just now. So this is uh, the meteorology, okay, the meteorology research meteorology uh, that we have proceeded, okay, in this research. The first one we have to uh, to prepare the template. So in this case, since we are using the ionization, uh, the Electrochemical ionization method, the template that we use, okay, the template or the anode part uh, or the counter uh, uh, part, okay, that we have considered is the titania foil, okay, the titania foil. So we have to clean that. We have to, we need to, uh, to, uh, to etch the top, uh, the surface part of the titania, uh, titania. A foil, okay, uh, so that uh, we uh, uh, could remove, uh, could remove the oxide, okay, on the top of that, and then after that we can uh, we can etching in a better way in the electrochemical ionization system. So the second part of uh, the uh, process that we have considered here is to prepare the so solution, the uh, electrolyte sol solution. So electrolyte is a uh, is a Method that uh, that conduct okay that uh, has the conductivity due due to the movement of uh, of ion. Uh, it consists in two different medium uh, that is in liquid and also in solid. Uh, so this morning, uh, uh, our 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 keynote has presented related to the uh, solid electrolyte. So this one is uh, liquid electrolyte. Uh, we use elect uh, we we need to prepare the uh, the liquid electrolyte solution. And then prepare the analyzation part and uh, analyzation part and the categorization uh, part uh, in order to use the method. And then after that, we also need to sonicate the sample that I'm, I'm going to explain after this. And then this, the last, uh, the next part is the handling process that is very important uh, that we have considered uh, this process to be optimized in order to uh, to obtain certain uh, conductivity. Okay. Uh, of level uh, conductivity uh, of the uh, titanium nanotube that is suitable uh, to be uh, to be used in the fabrication of the humidity sensor, and then after that, uh, of course, uh, we need to characterize. So today, I'm going to present part of the characterization uh, method that uh, my 
PhD student has done uh, on uh, uh, on the surface morphology, structural properties using SRD, surface morphology using FPSM, surface properties using uh, structural properties using the SRD, optical properties using the UVs, okay, and electrical properties to measure the IV characteristic and also to 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 uh, to determine or to measure the humidity uh, humidity properties, huh? and then uh, after that. We proceed to the fabrication of the TiO2, okay, nanotube array, uh, base humidity sensor, and then of course, uh, we use the same instrument that is electrical properties instrument IV characteristic with different environment and different uh, relative humidity to measure the uh, uh, the uh, humidity sensor. So this is what I have explained just now. First, we need to prepare the electrolyte. This is from the uh, the reference number 20 and then we also have published paper rela uh, related related uh, paper uh, related uh, to uh, 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 related to you the uh, use of uh, form uh, form the electrolyte uh, with this uh, ratio huh? and then after that okay this the method so you can see here uh, this is the tiny uh, that we attach to the to the anode. This is the ionization method. And here is the so solution that we have prepared at the number one. And then this is the cathode. Cathode usually uh, we connect to the platinum, the conductive platinum. Okay. And then after we synthesis the titania uh, nanotube get to expel or to to clean okay the contaminated particle on the top of the uh on the on the top or not on the top uh, that uh coat that exists okay on the top surface of the titanium nanotube so sonicate uh the the titanium film with okay coated coated titanium nanotube and then after that here we proceed to the Annealing process to annealing to anneal the fabricate the uh, the synthesized okay titanium nanotube at different temperature. So maybe this one, uh, if somebody wants to know uh, more related to electrochemical deposition, I will explain later on huh, in the question if you have no problem. So this is the characterization part. Let's proceed to the result in discussion. So this is FSM, okay? Uh, using FSM, huh? uh, the surface morphology uh, to determine the surface characteristic of the uh, of the uh, of the anodized uh, titanium nanotube huh? that we have uh, synthesized just, just now. That we have synthesized and anneal at different temperatures just now. Huh? So from the FSM, we can see uh, from this, uh, this on the uh, right top uh, uh, is written here, the diameter size of nano uh, nanotubes made of 41 to 62, around that, okay, around, around that. So that is, okay, equivalent or comparable, comparable to the, uh, our result is comparable to the, uh, size of titanium nanotube that been reported uh, in the uh, reference 14. Eh? You can see here this uh, the sample that we have deposit. Uh, we have uh, anneal, okay, anneal at six, uh, x350 is around this 350. This one eh? is around uh, 41 nanometer to 62. And then the here the diameter. Please mark here the diameter size of titanium nanotube that we have. Uh, anodized by this method just now is decrease okay with the with higher temperature so meaning that the electron has been readjust the atom has been readjust okay and the lattice also after this we are going to confirm with the srd and there is an arrangement of uh phase of material also or uh, the position of uh atom also so this is actually able with these properties also with this uh, uh, characteristic also we could understand that uh, the material becomes uh, the the synthesized the synthesized uh, nano nano uh, titanium nanotube 
okay, become smaller and smaller to the smaller size. That is okay. Actually, one of the requirement of the properties of material that we, uh, when we want to use in the device production. But of course, uh, the smallest is not not always not always good for all of the device location and for, for all times. So we need to determine okay, the suitability of the diameter size also by characterizing with different, uh, using different characteristics. Let's see this one. Uh, what we have highlighted uh, uh, related to the surface morphology. Yeah? The nanotube had better ordered okay, structures after anneal at 350. Better ordered compared to the others. And 450 also not bad. Uh, here I just want to highlight from the beginning. Almost better. Bro, yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, you yeah. need to finish your talk within 10 minutes because within we need 10 minutes, to finish. Inshallah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to finish about 10 minutes. 10 minutes <laughs> Sorry, bro. No, no problem, no problem. It's okay, it's okay. It's so, okay. Uh, this is the XRD. Uh, the, the, here, here, sorry. Uh, here I want to highlight that. There are not... We can see by our their eyes that 350 is better, well arranged and dense, but not much different with the 450. That is what I want to highlight here because after this, okay, if we compare to other characteristics, for example, this is the uh, structural properties from the SRD. When we uh, we measure, okay, the crystallite size by using the Sherrill formula, we can see that when the temperature, okay, the temperature increase, okay, the annealing temperature increase, the okay, crystallite size increase. Too much different. Okay, too much different, but it decreased again here. So, from the XRD, it might have some information related to this. So, here, okay, in order to, in order to declare or to come with the, with the conclusion that this one are good or not, we cannot just stop at this characterization method also. So from here, with this crystallite, because 20 nanometer size of crystallite size, also maybe, okay, maybe suitable because many reported, uh, researchers already report on that. So the important thing here is, this result is supporting the efficiency that we have discussed. Yeah, not, not much different. This, the, the, it's changing and, so, there is some information related to an arrangement of atom uh, 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 for the sample ending at the 350 and 450. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> from the UV visible spectro spectroscopy uh, method, we have uh, detected that the reflection is not much different. The reflection is not much different here at this range, at this visible range, meaning that okay, anyone could be used in the device fabrication. Okay, that is the uh, the things. But when we go to the uh, to the optical uh, properties measured by using the top plot, okay, the optical band gap decreases a lot compared to the one the S deposited one. Okay, and this is actually okay uh, comparable to the optical band gap of nano titanium dioxide that reported in the literature this is around 3.2 so we hope that this three sample is suitable to be used in our device publication so this is the electrical properties so we have selected for this presentation only the uh, the sample that we have annealed at 450 uh, degrees celsius okay 450 de uh, degrees celsius we have measured the resistivity for this sample is uh, about 20.8 ohm centimeter with the conductivity yeah, of uh, with 0 0.048 cement per centimeter. So compared to the literature, this amount of resistivity is uh, is suitable to be used in the humidity. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, actually I want to discuss about related to this one also what we are doing in our lab. This one is the SSC. Yeah? You can see here we are using the zinc oxide dot uh, N type TiO2 using uh, ruthenium dye and that you are using and then we also uh, try to uh, coat zinc oxide. Uh, zinc oxide not, not just dot it means the small amount of the dopant. We coat TiO2 on, uh, we coat zinc oxide uh, TiO2 with the nano structure uh, uh, zinc oxide on the uh, coat uh, uh, top so at the same time it also acts as a dopant that also we are doing 
So we also fabricate the DSSC. So we are, after this, we uh, we think to use the uh, titanium nanotube uh, uh, to blend, to form the hybrid structure of titanium nanotube and to fabricate the uh, to fabricate the humidity sensor and LED. So this is what we are doing in our lab. You can see here titanium dioxide. After we uh, we dep uh, we uh, deposit the uh, uh, we anodize the titanium, uh, we uh, form okay we form the titanium nanotube and then on the top of that, as I said just now, we cook the dioxide nanostructure. So uh, we fabricate, for example, the uh, the humidity sensor. Uh, this all can be n type uh, msm type metal semiconductor metal if we want to fabricate the led so we need to consider the pin junction here that is uh, the things that we are doing uh. so this is the configuration that i am presenting uh, today so we uh, deposit the metal contact on the top uh, of the uh, fabricated okay uh, titanium titanium nanotube and then we measure the humidity sensor okay properties so uh from this uh formula now you can see here so uh the sensitivity is equal to the uh resistance uh, uh at the uh at the uh at the uh in the air at the room temperature in the air uh over the resistivity okay uh <clears throat> this one of the uh, 90 relative humidity sensor uh, so this one so this is the uh the relative humidity yeah? uh, level for for 40 to 50 percentage of the relative humidity so the sensitivity we found is 2.26 uh, for this one 2.26 okay so this is the uh, figure shows the current flows uh, at different time okay when we uh, we measure the humidity sensor we off on on uh, on and then off on and off for example this one is the most highest uh, shows highest peak we on the uh when after achieve 90 percent of uh, relative uh, humidity percentage we on the machine uh, the uh, measurement machine and then after it uh, achieve okay achieve the the top and then we off okay after achieve certain time we off and then see the degradation of the uh of the current uh, and uh, after measuring as also can be understand uh, can be understood from this iv characteristic from this uh, current uh, versus times the sensitivity okay uh, performance the sensitive performance of uh, fabricated humidity sensor is uh, highest okay is highest here uh, is highest here for of course uh, because here it has the uh, oxygen and hydrogen uh, with uh, the environment of the uh, oxygen okay it uh, uh, contribute to the uh, higher conductivity so for this sample the highest uh, example the sensitivity okay the sensitivity amount for this uh, the sensitivity uh, value for the humidity sensor for the sample that we have uh, synthesized we have any at 450 degree, uh, degrees degree celsius uh, from this uh, formula, we have obtained the value is 177.75, which is okay comparable to the value of the humidity sensor that is reported in the uh, in the literature. And then, uh, even though since uh, okay since uh, not many okay not many uh, researchers reported using. Uh, the nanotube and uh, titanium nanotube okay uh, uh, using this uh, electrolyte material to fabricate the humidity sensor so that's also i believe is uh, could be considered also as uh, part of our uh, research finding eh? this is uh, the the mechanism that i should uh, explain eh? i should explain uh, yeah later on when we we have time so uh, th that's all actually my presentation. So I have highlighted about the properties of uh, several uh, characterization uh, of uh, uh, the synthesized uh, or anodized material by using FSM, by using the uh, XRD, and then uh, we. Uh, I also have presented uh, uh, the those uh, properties of. Uh, anodized material 
when uh, when we measure the properties of IV characteristic, and then after we fabricate, we found the uh, the we have obtained uh, we have obtained the sensitive value of the fabricated uh, humidity sensor was uh, obtained for the uh, sample with the annealing that we annealed at 450 degrees Celsius. Uh, has comparable to uh, the value that been reported in the literature is about 177.75. Huh? Uh, so I think, uh, I hope that uh, I have already uh, give some idea uh, related to the synthesization of uh, titania nanotube using uh, using electrochemical anodization method in the fabrication of uh, humidity sensor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for very enlightening and a fruitful speech. Um, sorry, on behalf of the community, okay, organizing committee, uh, we cannot accept any question anymore because we need to give uh, 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 we need to give a part away for the next session okay but if you have any question okay directly we can contact you right uh prof yeah yeah anytime anytime so if you have any question so you can directly uh contact prof Russo and don't worry because Prof Russo is our mentor in Pusat Asasi so if we we gonna meet him soon <laughs> so thank you uh, once again Prof Russo mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much hopefully that also will give the idea to our uh, researcher in UITM Dengkil uh, to to start or to proceed their research related to in this area inshallah thank you so much yes and to all my colleagues so if you really interested in joining prof russo uh, group do not hesitate to call and contact him okay so thank you everyone so distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen this is the end of our parallel session on behalf of the committee, once again, I would like to apologize if there are any lackness on my part. Okay, I would like to thank all the guests and invited speakers for participating in this conference. We hope that this conference has become a good platform for researchers, academicians and industry players to broadcast and disseminate their valuable knowledge in their respective field. Stay tuned for our next second session that will be chairperson by my colleague dr fatima so thank you once again for attending the first session the parallel session Uh, we hope that this uh, session still find you well and eager to absorb more research findings. Uh, please give your feedback regarding the quality of the visual and the audio of this conference that we need to improve to attend to. Uh, let me uh, improve a little bit my uh, speaker here. All right. So before we proceed to our parallel session, which is I'm chairing off, uh, to show respect and to ensure there is smoothness of the event, please uh, silence your phone or mute your speaker during this parallel session. Okay, invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be here as the moderator for this uh, iCrest Visual Conference 2021 for this parallel session two of Science and Technology. I am chemist Dr. Fatima Salim, uh, assisted by my co-moderator, then Mr. Muhammad Rahim Ichi Hassan from Center of Foundation Studies, University of Technology, Mara, Malaysia. As been mentioned earlier, we are grateful that the conference is participated by 20 invited speakers and more than 140 presenters ranging from local and international researchers, industrial experts and professionals. And for this session, um, we have three more invited speakers who are going to share their latest research finding and knowledge in their respective uh, expertise field. Excellencies, dis distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite our first invited speaker, 
for this session, uh, technologist, chemist Dr. Faizwan bin uh, Abdullah. He's the head of environmental chemistry research group uh, from the Faculty of Science, University Technology, Malaysia. Okay, and uh, Dr. Faizwan going to share his finding on current issue entitled the potential pollutant uh, from disposable face mask waste uh, to the environment. Please welcome Dr. Faizwan. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fatima, for a uh, great introduction. Right, I would like to share my slide now. Can everybody see my slide? Yes. Yes, it's good. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon uh, to all the uh, participants and especially to the organizing committee of the International Conference on Research and Practices in Science, Technology and Social Sciences. Um, such a great uh, conference I mean, have been organized through online platform. This is my uh, second time in this conference. As invited speakers, um, I would like to thanks for the to the organizing committee for this uh, you know uh, wonderful conference. Even we are facing a pandemic right now, but we can still present in the conference. Thank you so much. Right. Um, so I would like to present uh, my research entitled "The Potential Pollutants from the Disposable Face Mask Waste uh, to the Environment." Right. So I am a technologist chemist, Dr. Faizwan Abdullah from uh, University of Technology Malaysia. I'm a senior lecturer at the uh, Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, and also the head of the Environmental Chemistry uh, Research Group, or NVChemi. So, um, so what about the face mask waste? All right. So, I have uh, wrote this article uh, previously uh, in the Brita Harian. Okay, about this alarming issue on the uh, disposable face mask. All right. Uh, this one is uh, last year, November 2020. Right in the commentar. A segment uh, entitled Pelitup Muka Bukan Sisa Domestic, right? And then also wrote, uh, I've uh, written an article in the uh, in English version in the UTM Nexus magazine, right? Uh, on the same issues, all right? Uh, entitled Think Outside the Trash, right? So uh, let us think uh, how to manage this new, uh, you know, the, the new waste that we, we come out after the pandemic, right? Okay, talk about the pandemic right now. Uh, due to the coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, uh, virus uh, that have been, uh, you know, infected uh, all over the world since 2019, this is our third year facing this pandemic, right? Um, so about uh, more than uh, 180 million people around the world have been infected by this virus, right? The death toll, the death toll are now almost, uh, no, reaching uh, 4 million around the world. Uh, okay, as well in Malaysia, this is the statistic that we have uh, uh, taken from the website yesterday, right? The new cases uh, for just uh, yesterday, or Friday, is about 5,812, uh, 5, right? And the death toll now in Malaysia for for now, and until now, since the pandemic started, uh, is uh, about 4,800 cases, right? This is a lot, right? So, um, Luckily, they also recovered case all around, around the world. Okay, uh, for example, uh, I, I I took from the world uh, world domet world domitors, Okay, the recovered case around the world is about uh, 165 million and more more, right? So um, this is uh, the sickness. Okay, this is uh, the pressure they are facing uh, right now all over the world. The COVID nineteen pandemic, right? That changed our uh, daily life. Changed our perspective in a lot of things right in our life okay so um one of the the thing that have been changed uh, that we we need to uh, get ourselves um, comfortable right to the new normal okay what is the new normal especially in malaysia right this is three things that um we should uh, always remind uh, ourselves and our family okay the first one is to wa always wash our hand a lot of uh, hand sanitizer as well have been uh, you know uh, market have been uh, set <clears throat> uh, no, all around the place in the shop, right? We need to always wash our hands, 
with hand sanitizer or soap and so on. And the second one is we need to always wear a face mask, okay, especially at the public area. Okay, and the, the third one is to uh, know to warn or amaran is about uh, not to, uh, you know, shake our hand with others, okay, close our, you know, uh, uh, use a, a good ethics when we, you know, sneeze or coughing, right? Disinfection, uh, stay at home, okay, um, get a medication or uh, a swab test if we have uh, the uh, symptoms and so on. And since uh, August of 2019, <coughs> sorry, it is compulsory for us to wear a face mask, compulsory, okay, to wear a face mask in public area or else we will be, we will be fined, okay, for 1,000 ringgit. That's a lot, right? So this is a new normal, okay? The, the, the really... Um, Obviously, obvious one is we need to wear the face mask, especially at the public area. All right. So, what type of face mask do we wear? Okay, there are a lot, a lot of uh, you know, uh, type of face mask that we are, um, you know, using right now. Okay, we uh, we have a clothes face mask, and that is that uncle using a very creative one. Okay, using a bottle to do a face mask. We have a, quite a modern face mask. Okay, so it's like a fashion right now to use a. A lot, a lot of face masks, okay, a lot type of face masks. And then especially, we are using the disposable face masks. That is, uh, you know, the the common one that we have been used by a lot of us, okay, the disposable face masks, right? Easy to use, right? And cheap as well. But, um, you know, there's something else that we need to solve after this, all right? Uh, down there, uh, that is me. We are using the respirator mask, okay? That's not suitable. Uh, for the, this pandemic because it is for you know uh, 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 air pollutant issue air pollution issue right not not for the uh, for the, the pandemic all right so this one is the most common one we are using now which is possible face mask right so this is the, the you know the uh, the thing that we have in the disposable face mask okay we have a, a three to four layer of the uh, filter that made from uh, you know, uh, plastic fibers, right? Can we have a nose wire from metals? We have ear strap from from a synthetic rubber, right? And uh, the thing is, the face mask management uh, before the pandemic. Okay, this is the, the the surgical face mask is used by the uh, medical personnel at the hospital or clinics, right? And it is managed through the uh, uh, as a clinical waste, right? According to the Environmental Quality Act 1974, right? It is a schedule waste, right? Um, that uh, will be managed, okay? Will be um, disposed using an incinerator, right? Not um, just, uh, you know, uh, managed by the, the, as the domestic waste, right? So, due to the new normal, this is the thing we are facing right now, right? This is uh, our face mask will end up, end, end up right? This is where our face mask will end up. If we, we manage it, to the domestic waste. Some of us, uh, you know, the uh, unethics, okay, uh, citizen of Malaysia just throw away the, all the face masks, okay, everywhere we can see on the streets, right? This is a, a very bad attitude uh, from some of us, but but uh, most of us will throw it through the no domestic uh, waste, okay, in our dustbin, right? So it will, will be collected by the, you know, uh, by the um, local government, right? by the local municipal and collect it and then end up at the landfill. Okay, this is how the landfill looks like, right? Um, all the the waste that have been uh, collected from our house will be uh, dumped at the landfill and then either it will be burned or it will be, okay, um, buried under the land okay? and uh, it will end up in uh, the waste Okay, the the, um, the pollutant from all the ways will end up in two in two way. The first one, okay, if it uh, been burned, okay, it will release a lot of uh, uh, you know toxic gases. And then um, if it uh, been if it been uh, buried under the land, so the leachate will um, uh, you know will uh, come up from the runoff and uh, and um, end up in the uh, river and then also in the end up in the open sea, right? The problem statement of this research is the lack of awareness of the societies regarding the consequences of the improper disposal of the face mask, especially the disposable, waste, uh, disposable one, 
and then the insufficient of information about the toxic metals, volatile organic compounds, and microfibers that may be released by the face mask if we do not manage it properly. Right, so the objective is to identify the toxic metals and the volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, we call it, um, in the face mask waste samples, and then uh, to investigate the concentration of the toxic metals in the face mask waste samples, and to measure the size of the micro and nanofiber leached out from the face mask samples, right? So what is the significance of this study, right? The first one is to denote the potential pollution, uh, or pollutants, sorry, pollutants emerge from the disposable face mask waste. And then the second one is to raise the awareness of the public on the danger of the pollutants from disposable face mask waste. Right, so, so how we done this study, right? And then uh, the first one is uh, the sampling. Okay, we, we just bought the uh, disposable face mask from the uh, local stores. Okay, for example, we have from uh, Econsafe and Watson's, all right? Uh, we, we take two samples. The first, the first sample is uh, imported, right? From, uh, uh, you know, it's being manufactured in uh, outside of Malaysia, in China. And second one is the face mask, disposable face mask that is uh, manufactured in Malaysia. Right, and then we have to, uh, we, we already done the sample preparation, right? And also the uh, leaching test of the samples. And then we have uh, done the microwave digestion to analyze the toxic metals. And then we also done the method validation, of course. This is an, an analytical study. We need to do the method validation to ensure that our result is acceptable. And then we analyze it. Uh, the first one for the heavy metals uh, using uh, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer right uh, icpoes to screen what is the metals uh, that the being you know uh, metals that contain in the uh, disposable face mask and the second one is uh, we need to quantify how much of the toxic metals content using the graphite furnace atomic absorption spectrophotometer and then uh, to analyze the uh, vocs or the volatile organic compounds that uh, will be come out from the uh, face mask samples we using uh, we, uh, pyrolysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectro spectrometer, and to um, identify the uh, uh, the micro and nanofiber right so, uh, that being leached out from the face mask waste, we are using uh, FISM, right? And then um, I'll talk about the toxic metals in the face mask. The first one we you have done the uh, the analysis or the screening of the face mask samples. The, um, uh, either uh, via the uh, uh, leaching test and also uh, the total metals from the, the all the face masks that have been digested using the microwave digestion. All right, this is the list of the uh, you know the the highest concentration the to uh, toxic metals in, in the in the analysis, which are lead, cadmium, and chromium in both face mask samples. Right, and then um, we, we assume that this may, may be due to the galvanized steel that have in the, the you know at the nose uh, wire part. And um, there is a possibility that this present of this toxic metal was due to the uh, noise wire and maybe a compost uh, of the stainless steel, right? So as a result in discussion, okay, we have uh, this uh, ICPOES um, result. And then um, this is the volatile organic compounds that have been identified using the uh, pyrolysis gas chromatography mass, spe mass spectrometer, okay, from uh, both base mass, right? Right. Uh, for example, the face mask A, right? Uh, for metal heptane, uh, two for demetal heptane, uh, heptacosane, henicosane, uh, octadecane, pyridine, three carbo carboxamide, oxime, right? And for face mask B, uh, ecosane, tetracosane, uh, ecosane one, iodo, uh, pyridine, three carboxamide, ox oxime, and two trifluoromethylphenide, right? That is the, uh, we, we have uh, select these uh, voltaiconic compounds based on the highest, um, you know, uh, highest matching in the um, max spectrometer result, right? Uh, the, how the pyrolysis GCMS works? Um, the sample are uh, being uh, cut into a small pieces, right? And then uh, in the pyrolysis GCMS, the sample will be burned, okay? pyrolysis, undergo the pyrolysis process, and the um, the gas that emit, okay, the, the, the smoke that emit from the uh, burning process, the pyrolysis process, will be analyzed in the in the uh, gas chromatography and um, uh, the the detection is through the mass spectrometer, right? This is the the <coughs> the potential VOCs that have been identified um, to uh, more than ninety percent matching in the result, right? So um, it is true 
there are VOCs will come out from the dis disposable face mask if we burn it, right? Uh, remember, I've told that um, there will be two um, ending ending uh, situation of the face mask waste if we dispose it through the domestic uh, waste, uh, uh, you know, um, channel. Okay, it will be uh, end up at the landfill. It will be burned or leached out as a leachate. All right. So um, yeah, these uh, VOCs. Um, uh, consists of polymers, okay, emission uh, of volatile and semi-volatile organic compound from various kind of polymeric materials, and most common polymer use are pro, uh, polypropylene and uh, polyethylene. This is uh, a two common material that have been used uh, uh, massively to produce the uh, disposable face mask. Right, and degradation of this polyethy polyethylene produce aliphatic compound from C5 to C17. And this can be uh, deduced that the production of aliphatic compounds such as uh, 4 -met uh, methyl heptane, octadecane, tetradecane, and 2 4 dimethyl heptane are uh, produced due to the face mask raw material polyethylene. Right? We have done the method validation for the uh, analysis of lead, chromium, and cadmium. Right? The linearity is quite good. The R square is 0 0.999. Okay? This is uh, using a graphite furnace. Uh, atomic absorption spectrophotometer. Right, this is a method validation uh, using GFAS about the recovery, right, and also uh, on the accuracy and uh, precision, right. About the uh, this is uh, the limit of detection and limit of uh, the quantification of the uh, both three all three methods that have been analyzed. Is telling uh, just to tell that um, the analysis is valid, right? The method have been uh, validated. Right, the uh, measured uh, LOD and LQ is um, acceptable for our analysis. Right, so this is the concentration of the um, uh, toxic metals, lead, uh, cadmium, and chromium that have been leached out from the face mask. Uh, there are four conditions. Okay, we have done the um, leaching test. Right, we put the face mask in the alkali medium, acidic medium, and also the neutral medium of a solution. Then we uh, we um, uh, simulate the leaching process for about um, one to two hours, and then uh, the 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 solution will be analyzed uh, on the uh, toxic metals uh, uh, concentration, right? That have been leached out from the face mask waste, and also there's also total digestion of the face mask. Uh, this one is the uh, right. The total digestion of the face mask, the whole face mask will be digested and be analyzed for the content of these uh, all three heavy metals, toxic metals, right? So, um, most of the results are uh, above the LOD and LOQ, meaning that is acceptable, right? The concentration are acceptable, okay? So, uh, from the toxic metal in face mask, uh, what can be uh, conclude that um, when this face mask uh, leach out, okay, these face masks are brought and disposed in landfill that can be leached out no matter what pH condition uh, uh, is, uh, you know, the face mask uh, being uh, disposed there at the landfill, right? Either uh, alkali, acidic, or um, neutral, right? The heavy metal will leach out from the face mask. And this leachate may flow into groundwater, seawater, and bringing, uh, it bringing the toxic metal to the environmental uh, you know, uh, an aquatic life. And with the amount of production of this thing, it, it all accumulates. Just imagine how many face masks they are using every day. Okay? How many tons of face mask waste, disposable face mask waste have been managed at the landfill every day, right? And effect of this heavy metal to health, um, <clears throat> by microwave digestion, the high amount of heavy metal that have been uh, used to manufacture the face mask, especially on the part of the nose wire. <laughs> During the production of flow, there may, may, they, there may be chemical residue on face masks, including heavy metal, which even uh, present in trace amount and may result a uh, health concern among the societies, right? Uh, now we are um, um, talking about the uh, microfiber analysis in the face mask, right? We Remember, we have done the um, leaching test using uh, alkali, um, acidic, and also the neutral medium. And then we analyze um, the face mask before and after, right? There are damage on the structure of the micro and nanofiber, <clears throat> meaning that the structure of the microfiber has been damaged and <coughs> sorry, leached out 
to the um, um, solution, okay, in the medium. No, no, no matter how the the pH condition is, acidic, alkali, and intro, right? So there will be uh, <clears throat> micro and nano fibers being leached out from the disposable space mask. All right, and it is easy, easy, easily degrade. <coughs> Excuse me. The face masks are easily degrade when exposed to the liquid environment, no matter what type of body, water bodies, especially into the marine environment. The micro and nanoplastic, <coughs> sorry, will be a uh, uh, general toxic and cytotoxic effect to the, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to the uh, terrestrial and aquatic organism and will affect the food chain. These small particles may be easily taken up by the aquatic organism and maybe affect the food chain. And of course, the environmental pollution. Okay, disposable face mask waste can potentially have a serious environmental impact, right? Uh, on the right side of my slide, there are, you know, an image of the uh, identified as the, uh, the you know, uh, the microfibers that have been leached out from the face mask waste sample. It can be seen by naked eye, very small, but after we analyze using FSAM, right? There are um, <coughs> some of the uh, uh, fibers that have been, uh, uh, you know, tear apart from the uh, face mask waste and leach out into the uh, into the water solution, into the medium, the solution. Right, as the conclusion, the, the effect of this uh, disposable face mask, right? Um, the pollutants that come out from these disposable face masks can affect the environment, unleash a thousand of microscopic and nanoscopic fibers into the aquatic, aquatic world, and then uh, by accumulation of lead, cadmium, and chromium, which can bring health concern, right? And <clears throat> for the regulation, it is just, you know it's need to be enforced uh, for the uh, manufacture, manufa manufacturing and disposable of the face masks. We have we have we need we need to think something, you know. Um, in terms of manufacturing and um, disposing this all the, all these uh, disposable face masks, so that it will not affect the uh, environment at the end of this, uh, you know, the life cycle of this disposable face mask. And then more research need to be done, uh, <clears throat> uh, more environmentally sustainable alternative for the material of this uh, disposable face mask. And then what should we do, right? Um, the first one is we should think outside the trash. Which is uh, we we need to manage our face mask with a proper waste, right? If you are using the disposable face mask, right? Um, collect it and um, you know uh, put it as uh, as as we we had done for the <coughs> recycle material waste from our uh, daily usage. We we segregate the plastics, um, aluminiums, and papers, right? As well as one more for the disposable face mask, and then. Uh, we need to. Uh, this is if we can do. We, we avoid using uh, this uh, disposable uh, face mask, right? This is a sample, right? And use the closed face mask instead because um, there have been a study that have been uh, done previously, showing that the closed face mask also um, <clears throat> efficient in uh, you know in uh, blocking the the you know uh, the uh, particles. Uh, from uh, from you know uh, that may be contain uh, any virus or, and so on uh, the the efficiency of the closed face mask is um, similar with the disposable face mask and we need to do research and innovation on the face mask waste management and suggest the best way in disposing uh, disposing the way uh, the, the waste face uh, uh, that uh, could benefit all right and uh, for that uh, thank you so much and that's all from me assalamualaikum Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Faizwan, for sharing interesting finding on disposable uh, face masks. Now, I open the session for question and answer. Do we have any questions? Okay, Dr. Thank you for the uh, good uh, presentation. Yeah? 
Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask. Okay, so is is it um, must now now uh, in the market? Is it the same fiber use yeah, uh, to to make the mask? Or uh, what, what is your your recommendation type of fiber? Because now they have the some uh, <coughs> fiber or the fiber dope with something. Is it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe prevent the leaching yeah. or the uh, decompose become mic micro or nanoplastic. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the uh, interesting questions. I know um, some countries have have banned all the disposable face masks, especially the, uh, that the one that have been doped with the CNTs, you no know, carbon nanotubes. There are face masks that have been doped with carbon nanotubes. They are very dangerous. That the, the small particle even can enter our you know uh, respiratory system all right and then <clears throat> i think um on the material itself um <clears throat> all the manufacturers uh, have considered the cost all right that is the cheapest way on to uh, you know on making the face disposable face mask right but uh, it is an alarming situation where the face mask uh, disposable face mask had end up at, as the domestic waste and have this managed, <clears throat> you know, tons of the disposable face masks have managed through the domestic uh, no waste at the uh, landfills that uh, come up with these uh, problems that I've told previously. But I think uh, more research need to be done, especially for us as a researcher, as an academician. On the, you know, uh, safer materials, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, materials, resources in our country, such as, you know, we, we have Kanaf and so on. We should think, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> maybe a material that we can do a disposable face mask that can uh, biodegradable, okay, that can be biodegrade uh, in the environment so that um, this kind of problem may not happen uh, in the future. This is my, uh, you know, some of my recommendation to that I, I, you know, I open to all of us to do research, more research on that, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, for, so that uh, all the manufacturers not only thinking about um, you know, profit on making this um, <clears throat> disposable face mask in this pandemic situation. But we also need to have, uh, we, we need to think on the um, a a long term effect that if we use, we co if we continuously use this, uh, uh, you know, um, synthetic uh, polymer, synthetic plastic um, uh, as the material for the face mask. We need to think as an academician and researcher, we need to think further about this. Thank you so much, Prof. I hope that is you now the okay, question. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think uh, we have opened another uh, <coughs> another flow of the research, Prof. Uh, Doctor, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Prof. Saifullah, for the question and Doctor Faizwan. Um, uh, there is another question here, which we which is uh, given by Muhammad Lukman Salehuddin. So he said uh -huh. that the word. What are your view and prediction on this face mask leaching in the future, maybe 10 to 20 years ahead, as you are familiar with Sungai Kim Kim incident? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mama Lukman is my uh, master student. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> yes, I, I've been previously, I've been uh, appointed uh, as the uh, secretary of the uh, uh, scientific committee on the Sungai Kim Kim um, incident. All right. <clears throat> Uh, Lokman asked about the uh, what we can predict 10 or 20 years after this if we don't manage these issues, okay, disposable face mask issues well. What happened is when Kim Kim is the example <coughs> when we ignore, all right, uh, the environmental impact in uh, our daily life, okay, in our daily economy, economy acti econ economical activities, all right, we ignore. Um, the the impact that that will be uh, occur to the environment if we take things for granted about the uh, chemical waste and so on. So what happened if this type of waste we also ignore about the this uh, disposable face mask waste for ten and twenty years? Of course, the first one is the um, um, if the face mask being managed as the as the domestic uh, waste, okay, the burning process will. Uh, will uh, create a lot of uh, VOCs, okay, from plastic, volatile organic compounds. And the microfibers will leach out, okay, uh, microplastic will leach out uh, to the environment, to the aquatic life, right? 
as well as the heavy metals content also be increased because just imagine if uh, every one of us uh, about the uh, 32 million citizens of Malaysia use one face mask every day disposable face mask right and then we throw as the domestic waste there will about uh, more than six tons of face, disposable face mask waste will end up at the landfill every day so just imagine we we feel you know uh, is it is it uh, pol uh, we are polluting environment because we are using only a small thing of this disposable face mask but not only us everybody right everyone using this similar um, uh, disposable uh, harmful um, uh, synthetic polymer face mask and we throw every day we throw it every day that is the situation if you use one face mask every day but I think most of us use more than one right and our families as well our family members right our kids and so on and where where will this face mask end up <clears throat> Either we use uh, throw it properly as a domestic waste, or we throw if we are not a good uh, you know Malaysian citizen, we just uh, throw it everywhere in the environment. That is also a bad thing. So that is what uh, will be happen. Okay, we will pollute the environment. We will create a new um, you know a new kind of pollutants to the environment. Okay, in a massive uh, concentrations. All right. The, then we need to do something. Uh, for example, we need to think about uh, if the face mask previously managed as the clinical waste um, disposed using the incinerator. So why not? Uh, that is also being um, proposed to the government uh, to, to 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 dispose this face mask as it as the clinical waste previously. So everyone need to throw it separately, segregate all the waste, and then the municipal the the uh, you know. Um, the uh, council will collect it as the um, you know as the uh, new new type of waste that will be disposed in one incinerator. I think not not so big. The incinerator is not so big. We need the small one also. We can dispose all this face mask. Then the VOCs will manage properly. All the waste will manage properly as the um, scheduled waste. Right. I think this is my. Uh, I hope can answer Lukman's questions. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, that is a uh, yeah, insightful um, response to the, the question that been asked. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Faizwan, again. Right. So um, let's move to our second speaker. Uh, Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's move to our uh, second invited speaker, which is uh, Dr. Farah Shafira Elias and Ibrahim. So she is the head of anatomy and physiology unit, Department of Basic Sciences, Faculty of uh, Health Sciences from University Technology Mara, Selangor Branch, uh, Puncha Alam Campus. So Dr. Farah will share with us her research finding on proteomic analysis of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, human plasma by two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. So I think the title is slightly changed for from the one that we have in hand, but yeah, we're eager to hear from uh, Dr. Farah. So please welcome. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Doctor, it's clear. Okay, let me share my slide first. It's all right. Yeah, good. Okay. So, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to all. Um, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chapas and Dr. Fatima for your kind introduction. And uh, first and foremost, I'm so glad uh, to be part of ICRAS 2021. And I would like to extend my appreciation to the organizer for this opportunity given to us uh, to share our finding with all of you, uh, titled uh, Comparative Analysis uh, between uh, Pre-Diabetes and Type 2 Diabetes using Two-Dimensional Electrophoresis. Okay, so before we begin, okay, I would like to ask uh, all of you here, when was the last time you check your glucose level? Right, you can probably put in the chat uh, box down there or if you are following us through YouTube channel, you can put in the chat there. When was the last time you 
uh, measure your glucose level, your reading. Do you know what is the number in your blood? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one in two people, all right, or 50%, I can say, living with a diabetes do not know that they are having it. Okay, and why I am asking you this, because when we know our number, okay, we can prevent it from getting a diabetes and most uh, worst scenario, we are prevent ourselves from getting the complication. Okay, so today, uh, basically, we're going to discuss and share with all about uh, our research and the team of diabetes. So when we say diabetes, this is a major health issue, all right, that has reached uh, alarming levels. And if you can see from the statistic by the IDF 2019, half of the billion people are living with diabetes worldwide, okay? And from the prevalence, the global diabetes prevalence in 2019, estimated to be 9.3%, which is 4, 6, 3 million people, and rising to 10.2% by 2030, which is 5, 7, 8 million, and uh, going up to 10.9%, which is 700 million by 2045. Okay, so uh, this is a serious uh, long-term condition with a major impact on our life and also well-being of individual, the family, and also the societies worldwide, right? And for your information, diabetes is among top 10 causes of death in adult and was estimated to have caused 4 million deaths uh, globally in 2017. So uh, what I am showing now is the number of adults between uh, 20 to 79 years old with diabetes according to the seven regions that have been clustered by the IDF 2019, which is North America, the South and Central America, the Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa, Southeast Asia, Western Pacific, and also Europe. So Malaysia is clustered under a Western Pacific region that I highlighted in red, which have the highest number. If you can see the number there, all right, the highlighted in red, which is the Western Pacific, showed the highest number of diabetes population in the world, including Malaysia. Okay. So when we talk about Western Pacific, okay, uh, the data also showed that one in three of adults at risk developing type 2 diabetes in this region. And if we zoom to Malaysia, yeah, the prevalence has increased from 11.2% uh, in 2011 to 18.3% in Malaysia. It's how serious of the uh, disease. So, what is type 2 diabetes? Okay, so when we talk about diabetes, is the uh, a condition where the glucose levels is above a normal value. We call it as a hyperglycemia. So this is because of the inability of the bodies uh, to respond fully to insulin, right? And this is what we call it as the insulin resistant. So during the state of insulin resistant, the hormone is inactive, yeah, and uh, uh, it will cause the increase of the insulin production. So over time, okay, inadequate production of this insulin can develop as a result of failure of the pancreatic beta cell to keep up with the demand. So now, okay, type 2 diabetes most uh, commonly seen among uh, older adults. However, because of the rising levels of obesity, a physical inactivity, and also inappropriate diet in the society, we can see younger adults getting diabetes. Okay, now that is a uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, have you heard about pre-diabetes? Okay, so prediabetes is a condition where uh, the sugar level is above the normal value. However, it is still a below the recommended diabetes diagnostic threshold, meaning that uh, your sugar levels is increased. However, you are not uh, diagnosed as a diabetes yet. Okay, and this condition also uh, been called, all right, as the uh, impact glucose tolerance and also impact fasting glucose, IFG. And for your information, 
information, okay, one out of three U.S. adult has prediabetes, okay? And I just would like to share with all of you our experience throughout the study while we conducting, uh, when we want to recruit uh, our participant as a, a normal group, when normal, meaning that they are um, healthy, uh, not taking any medication, so they come as a control. Okay. However, when we screen, okay, out of 10, seven are detected pre-diabetes. Then, then they do not know about it. Okay. So what is the impact? Okay. The impact is, all right, 15 to 30% of the pre-diabetes, okay, uh, will convert, have a higher risk to become type 2 diabetes in five years time if they are not being treated, meaning that they are not uh, trying to uh, improve their lifestyle, they're tired, so they are prone to get diabetes faster compared to the others. So this is a state where you can reverse it. Okay, you can reverse through all the protocols and also healthy lifestyle. Okay, so um, I would like to show also the sequence of the progression to become type 2 diabetes. Okay, so when we say progression from normal glucose tolerance mm -hmm. to type 2 diabetes, it's actually based on the dual defect that include uh, insulin resistance. Okay, number one. And also the insulin secretory defect caused by the beta cell uh, dysfunction. So insulin resistance is characterized by decreased tissue sensitivity to the insulin. So this is a mark of compensatory of hyperinsulinemia. So initially, our plasma glucose levels are maintained in the normal range. So in patients who will eventually develop diabetes, there is a decline in the beta cell secretory capacity. So the first glucose abnormality that is detected is a rise in the prosperandial glucose level because of reduce the first phase insulin secretion. So with time, okay, uh, the further decline in the beta cell function will lead to a elevation of the fasting glucose level. Okay, so due to that, because uh, the dysglycemia is uh, actually uh, uh, initiation of the damage, all right? We can see the damage actually starting at the pre-diabetes level. You can see the endothelial dysfunction and also the inflammatory um, progression. So our objective uh, is to map out the changes by identifying the spectrum of the protein alteration involved in the molecular and also the structural pathogenesis between these two groups, okay? So... Now, let us move to the method that we use uh, to achieve our study, okay? So, this is the whole story, okay, starting from the sample preparation, okay? And then we need to deplete the protein, okay, until we do the characterization of the protein, Okay, so let's go for the first one, which is the sample prep. So our samples uh, have been collected at the Tangling Hospital, okay, and then uh, based on the ADA uh, guidelines, we uh, group uh, the, the subject into control group, uh, pre-diabetes group, and also diabetic type 2 groups, okay? And then after we get a consent, we collect the blood samples and also the urine centrifuge for uh, 3,000 RPM for 10 minutes, right? And before we start uh, to do the analysis. So when we would like to start the process, okay, when we want to see the whole sequence of uh, protein between these two groups, which is very important for us to deplete the high abundance protein. Because why? Because the target uh, protein is uh, among the low abundance. So we need to remove that high abundance so that they will not mask uh, the whole of the plasma. Okay, so in this process, we are using the uh, multiple affinity removal system. Uh, spin cartridge HU6. When you say HU6, meaning that they are remove uh, the first six high abundant, okay, which is the IgG, IgA, albumin, transferrin, haptoglobin, and also the antitrypsin. So 
after the process of depletion, we're going to get um, four mils of uh, sample, which is include of the buffer F1 and F2. So this is quite big uh, volume because when we want to load uh, on the gel, they have a maximum amount that we uh, can uh, load on the gel. So we need to do the concentration. All right. So for, from four mils, we concentrate uh, using the concentrator to become 300 microlit. And then we use the lysol buffer as well to dissolve so that when we uh, map up the protein that is the basically uh, the real protein from the plasma, no other things uh, beside uh, the plasma, especially on the buffer that we use. Okay, that's what we need to do the desalting method. And finally, okay, so when we got that uh, final 200 microlit, uh, we need to quantitate uh, to see how much of protein that we have in each uh, sample. And we use the Bradford assay protocol with the reading of 595 absorbent. Okay. Uh, now, the sample is ready, okay? So, we would like to conduct the process, okay, to degel or to dimensional electrophoresis. So, actually, this is a quite a powerful tool uh, for proteomic work, right? Uh, to degel is used um, to separate, uh, fractionate the complex protein mixture uh, from the biological samples. And when we say 2DE, they have two principles. Okay, so the first one is separation of the protein. Uh, we call it as the isoelectric uh, focusing, which is uh, separation according to the isoelectric uh, point, PI. And then the second step is the SDS page, which is separate the protein based on the molecular weight. All right, so uh, I would like to show you the diagram how the principle works. So we are using the IPG strip uh, 13CM, pH 3 to 10, right, uh, GE uh, type. And then we load 300 uh, microgram protein uh, using the 300 microlit rehydration buffer. And you can see the first tab where we have the IEF, okay, and and then uh, we proceed with the second uh, stage, which is the SDS page. Okay, so this is uh, what we have done on the first phase. Okay, um, as mentioned before, uh, the first separation is based on the PI, yeah, PI of the protein. So uh, I think all of you know that the protein are amphoteric molecules. They are positive, negative, or zero net charge, and they carry depending on the pH surrounding. Yeah, so the PI is defined uh, as the pH of the solution at which the net charge of the protein become zero. So if a protein with a positive net charge will migrate towards the cathode, it becoming less positive charge until they're reaching the uh, PI. While in the other hand, if the protein is negative uh, net charge, they will migrate to the anode. Okay, and becoming less negative until they reach its PI. Okay, so uh, after that, after that, uh, we proceed with the second dimension uh, as the as page. Okay, this one based on the molecular weight, and usually we have four steps here. Okay, number one, to, uh, prep of the gel, and then we equilibrate uh, the immobilized uh, pH gradient strip uh, in the SDS buffer, and then we place uh, uh, that strip on the gel, and finally handling the process of the electrophoresis. Usually, usually, uh, this process take about uh, four to uh, five hours. Okay, so this is how the gel was electrophoresis in our lab using Hofer SC600, right? We put it a uh, 10 times uh, lamy buffer, okay? Uh, 90 uh, volt for 30 minutes and then 200 volt for uh, about four, uh, about four, yeah, four hours, okay? Until uh, the gel, if you can see, there's a line, the blue line there, completely reached the bottom. 
Okay, completely reach the bottom. So after five hours, okay, after five hours, your gel is done. However, when you see that your gel that is empty from your naked eyes, you cannot see the protein. Okay, so that's why we need to do the staining. So usually staining, we have Kumasi and also the uh, silver staining. Uh, we use silver staining because um, this is more suitable for lower protein levels uh, because of the sensitivity. Okay, and this is how it look, All right? This is the gels that we get uh, once the process of the staining complete. However, the gel, yeah, you can see the spot, but you cannot, they cannot give you any significant result because uh, it is just a spot. So you must know what it is, yeah? And then uh, you compare between the three gel. That come a process where, Okay, uh, using the um, gel docs and also the PDQuest software, you analyze, you put, you layer three uh, groups of gels together, right? And then you scan it to see uh, which one is upregulated or downregulated. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, we did in the lab. Okay, uh, once you get uh, the right significant uh, spot, okay, you need to take it out. All right, and then we start to uh, uh, treat it, digest. Okay, treat it, digest, and uh, we proceed uh, with the protein identification uh, using LCMS MS. Okay, so now. Okay, uh, result and discussion, what we got uh, from the uh, process, okay? I would like to show you first, okay, on our um, uh, silver staining gel on the crude plasma. So when we say crude plasma, meaning that this gel contain both, which is uh, high abundance protein and low abundance protein. You can see that everything is there, okay? Uh, probably some of the um, uh, low abundance protein are masking under the big, big uh, spot, which is we don't want. That's why uh, we need to do the depletion. The process is very crucial to remove the high abundance, which is I highlighted in yellow. Okay, so that is your high abundance only. So when you remove that, there comes the blue color is the low abundance that we are focusing uh, to check on the low abundance protein between these two groups. Okay, so I would like to uh, share as well. This is the uh, control, the samples of the control group. Okay, and then uh, ED is a type 2 diabetes group. And then finally, the pre-diabetes group. Okay, so from the analysis, okay, from the analysis, uh, we can found a seven a significant um, protein significant spot okay significant spot compared to the uh, pd from the control group which are all are upregulated at set one which is a spot as a ssp6411 okay and then we also try to compare the control and also the diabetes group okay all five are upregulated and once is downregulated about 2.5 full change which is under ssp3706 Okay, and then uh, we compare, right, between pre and the uh, ED group. Okay, what's the difference between two? And then we final to get two spots are significant and both are upregulated. So how are they connected uh, between them? That's how we perform uh, the pathway. Okay, and... Um, uh, from the analysis, we can find that uh, they are top five significant canonical pathway, okay, which is the LXR, FSR, uh, acute phase response signaling, extrinsic protombin activation pathway, and also the uh, intrinsic protombin activation pathway. Okay, so uh, this is how uh, the mapping that we got, all right, all uh, the one that highlighted is uh, the protein involved. Okay, so this is the uh, LXR 
Okay, and then uh, this is the pathway for the FXR activation pathway. So FXR and LXR are the receptor of metabolic regulator and they are play important roles in the pathogenesis of the type 2 diabetes. And the final one, okay, is uh, also significant is our uh, acute phase response signaling pathway. Okay, so uh, increase of the plasma levels of this acute phase protein, all right, indicating that uh, this is a chronic subclinical inflammation, right, in the type 2 diabetes. So this is what, uh, as we expected. Okay, so as the conclusion, so the identified protein, uh, that express okay may be involved in the development and the progression of type two diabetes and its complication. So further studies involving um, specifically the pre diabetes uh, population are much needed. Okay, this group are much uh, need more attention so that we can assess the gravity of the problems and maybe able to pre uh, zen the preventive and also the therapeutic opportunity in the future. Okay, so. A, can type 2 diabetes uh, be prevent? The answer is yes, right? So studies have um, uh, suggest, uh, suggested from the uh, CDC, uh, Center of Disease Control and Prevention, they say that when uh, before the, before the pre-diabetes, all right, during the pre-diabetes, among the pre-diabetes person, how to reverse it, how to reverse it. Okay, we are not uh, asked to reduce 10 or 20 or 30 kilos uh, uh, from the weight. However, a small reduction, as small as 7% of our body weight, give a significant value of reduction of the risk getting type 2 diabetes. Okay, so we start small with a 7%. So if we calculate about uh, 70 kg, uh, an individual, if a 7% is just about 4.9, it is less than 5 kilo. So this small uh, improvement will give a big impact to us to delay uh, or prevent it to get a type 2 diabetes. That is one. So number two, regular exercise. So suggestion by the CDC is a minimum 150 minutes a week. If you lay out as a week, it's probably just a 30 minute a day, five times in a week, right? So if it's 30 minutes, uh, if we have a longer time, probably we can do a, 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 an hour, right? So three times a week. So minimum is 100. 50. Good to share with you another study by a um, researcher from uh, San Diego. Okay, they found a one session of 20 minute, uh, 20 minute moderate uh, treadmill exercise. Okay, will result of 5% decrease in the number of stimulated immune cell producing TNF. So what is a TNF? So earlier we discussed that the type 2 diabetes, they have an initiation of the inflammation remember and also the insulin resistance happening at the pre-diabetes stage yeah so tnf or we call it as a tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha is the most important uh, inflammatory mediator involved of the uh, development of the insulin resistance so if we exercise 20 minutes Inshallah, uh, five percent of uh, reduction in the cells that produce the tnf okay so start small uh, start to move, okay, because big journey begins with the small steps, right? And always take care of your body because this is the only place that we have to live, right? And I wanted to extend my appreciation to our collaborator in Jeffrey Chesko of Madison Monash University, uh, Professor Anwar, uh, Prof. Iksan Osman, and Associate Professor Dr. Rakesh Naidu. And uh, this is my team members. Uh, uh, my group, a research group called Smash Prediabetes, and this is my uh, postgraduate and also final year project students. And um, our focus uh, is on diabetes and also the prevention. So I more focus on the prediabetes, not just on the clinicals, but we also conducting the animal study and also on cells. <laughs> So with that, uh, thank you so much. And you can always reach me at any time uh, at the email uh, below. And uh, we welcome uh, for any collaboration from all of you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farah, for enlightening us with the interesting speech, of course, on the diabetic, because, you know, it is prevalence in the society now. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to open the uh, platform or the floor for question and answer. I think I received a few in the uh, chat box. Let me read. Okay, so, yeah, we have uh, plenty actually because this is a quite interesting um, yeah, topic. So, let's start from uh, here. Muhammad Rahimi is our co-moderator asking this question. I think he uh, copied from the YouTube perhaps. So, does central obesity play a bigger role in development of diabetes mellitus 2 compared to obesity defined by BMIs? Are there any significant difference in proteomic analysis between these two types of obesity? Between these two types of obesity? Definitely, definitely. However, that is not our concern because uh, when we screened out, uh, that is not the, the factor that we look into. Right? We measure, but uh, that is not the factor that we analyze. Okay, uh, but from the reading, uh, from the from the papers stated that uh, the these two different groups uh, have a higher risk of significantly show in the protein. Dr. Fatima. Okay. So, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Okay, the next question here is, uh, this is from Nor Fatiha Elias. So, okay. she said, thank you, Dr. Farah, for a good presentation. Based on your presentation, what is the best approach for preventive pre-diabetes uh, patient to become uh, T2DM? Uh, later, I mean, uh, diabetic type 2 patient later. Yeah, thank you, Fatiha. I think uh, I've mentioned in the last slide just now, uh, which is this too, uh, and even during a session that uh, we meet our subject and also the patient, we always uh, give two uh, suggestions where number one, uh, start to reduce the weight first. Okay, so the reduction of weight, uh, don't in a big number, just start to calculate about 5 to 7% of your weight. Okay, because um, there is a significant reduction of conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes type 2. Okay, so that is number one. Number two, we have to do the physical activity. So physical activity doesn't mean that um, uh, we have to go out every day. Uh, if you climb out, down, up, uh, off the stairs, uh, will be good. All right. But uh, let's take the recommendation by the CDC where um, we put us 150 minutes uh, in a week, uh, inshallah. Because I just like to share with all of you, uh, because uh, the, the, the study that I've presented is the uh, preliminary, because at the second phase, we uh, perform in the larger group, which is we're following up uh, about 300 uh, uh, patient participants. And under the pre-diabetes itself, after a, a year, a year and a half, some of them are convert to become normals, which is a very good. Okay. However, uh, there is also an uh, uh, individual that uh, convert from the diabetes, uh, from the pre-diabetes to become diabetes after, after uh, one year and a half. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, I'd like to share as well. Uh, I, I have, I used to have a student, PhD student working on this diabetic, but he's working on galactin tree. Have you heard on galactin tree? Which uh -huh, is uh -huh. in, in the adipose tissue, actually, uh -huh. to um, a, a obese person. So we're trying to reverse that particular protein, but the project was uh, half back. So we just uh, put it aside. So, of course, the reduction in body weight is uh, significantly going to reduce the uh, pre diabetic stage, actually. Right. So, yeah, I think there is no more question there. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Farah, for. Okay for the insightful talk again. So I'll be going to move to our, we're going to move to our next presenter. Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Juan Bin Matimin, which is the head of Green Chemistry Research Group, Faculty of Science, University Technology, Malaysia. So Dr. Juan was actually with, with uh, Basi last time, right? So we are quick. So Dr. Juan going to share his research finding entitled uh, Facil Preparation of ZIF and uh, 
TZ, so I think that is titanium, tin films for stable photo degradation of methylene blue. Please welcome Dr. Juan. The platform is yours. Right. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Uh, thank you to the uh, Secretary of the ICRAS 2021 for giving the opportunity to present uh, my finding. Okay. Uh, let, allow me to share uh, the screen first. Right. Uh, Assalamualaikum, everyone. Okay. Uh, I would like to present a preliminary finding on facial preparation of ZIF and titanium ZIF thin films for stable photodegradation of methylene blue. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-worker here and uh, take note that uh, this is actually a, pre a preliminary work done by my project student. Uh, this is my student here, Farah Dayana Mahan, and I think uh, she did a wonderful job and words to be presented here. Uh, for the background of the study, uh, the study concern on the methylene blue as the organic dye that is harmful and toxic for the pollutants. This can actually serious, uh, cause a serious health problem uh, such as cancer and hypertension. So what is the remedy? The remedy is we are going to treat it uh, with the photocatalyst and uh, due to the, its potential to treat the uh, polluted water by getting organic pollutant, uh, we choose uh, this method uh, to convert the methylene blue uh, using the uh, available light source you need a UV to less harmful substance such as uh, water and carbon dioxide. So this is a green approach uh, to develop uh, more sustainable uh, environment or treating the uh, polluted. As the background of the study also, uh, why we are actually interested in the uh, Z framework, this is actually a crystalline material comprising of metal ion and organic linkers, uh, as, as similar as the zeolite, but uh, this is a synthetic one. So it can adopt the zeolitic stability, but we can actually tune the properties. And by pairing the different organic ligand with the metal ion yield, it's going to actually give a, give a different structures and function. In this study, uh, we uh, focus on ZIF-8 and ZIF-L, which is almost uh, similar to the ZIF-8, uh, but uh, we can see later on the morphology is actually a 2D, 2D leaf line, leaf like uh, structures. Uh, as compared to the ZIF-8, where it's actually a 3D hexagonal. Both uh, structures actually bridged by two metal imidazolate frameworks and going to give you uh, a different property status. <clears throat> uh, we focus on the functionalization of our semiconductor because uh, we would like to induce a synergistic effect that enhance the catalytic abilities and absorb, uh, absorption properties. Okay? Uh, we also would like to reduce the recombination process in this uh, semiconductor material so that the photo degradation is going to be enhanced. Uh, the main drawback of this uh, project is that we are going to settle on the uh, powder characteristic. Although heterogeneous uh, catalyst is, a, uh, is considered as a great uh, catalyst in the uh, photo degradation uh, usage, but when we have a, pro a product in a solid form, uh, the separation is going to be difficult, and uh, uh, it's, lead going, it's going to lead to the low recovery, and thus the reusability of this catalyst is also going to be decreased. That's why uh, we propose a fabrication of a thin films that are going to provide a regeneration of easy separation and higher recyclability. Uh, for the problem of statements, okay, uh, previously there is not extensive works in comparison between the photocatalytic activities of uh, these different ZIF, especially in the thin film for the removal of the uh, methylene blue. Usually, conversion methods require a large amount of solvents, okay, organic solvent, uh, that is not uh, really good for our environment. And these catalysts usually suffer from leaching of this. Uh, 
uh, of the active site that in the end going to lead to the poor reusability. There is also no detailed works uh, that report on uh, the following approach that we uh, conducted uh, uh, primarily on the solvent synthesis for uh, zif l and uh, titanium zif l and there is also no uh, previous work on the uh, thin films form of this uh, material. Uh, they form, uh, this is an interesting finding that we are going to develop this catalyst uh, in a new approach to give a thin film where uh, it's actually going to improve our uh, photocatalytic performance on the degradation of methylene blue. Uh, these are the objective outline for the study. Okay. So, first of all, we are going to prepare our uh, zif L as well as the, the titanium zif L from the solvent synthesis, meaning that we are not going to use any uh, organic solvent. Okay, this is, this is very different from a uh, previous approach. Uh, secondly, uh, we are going to uh, induce the presence of water and in, uh, this is uh, interestingly, interestingly going to give you a ZIF-8. Okay? Uh, last but not least is uh, to evaluate the photocatalytic activity of this uh, material. Uh, the scope of study covers on the following scope where for the ZIF-L and the titanium ZIF-L thin film is going to be synthesis in the non-solvent synthesis. Uh, for the ZIF-8 and the titanium ZIF-8 thin film, it uses uh, water as solvent. And for the, uh, this material uh, going to be characterized using these advanced uh, 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 instruments okay, for the characterization method. Uh, in the case of the evaluation of the catalytic capability, we are going to uh, use this material for the degradation of the methylene blue uh, using the UV line and we are going to repeat it uh, actually for more than four cycles. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, why we did this study is because we want to promote a much greener approach that is going to contribute to the economical studies. Uh, and uh, we are going to give a new simple approach in fabrication of our tin film. Okay? Uh, and based on this uh, tin film letter, we are going to find out that this is actually uh, going to give a continuous and stable uh, degradation for effective removal of this uh, methylene blue. These are the uh, preparation method for the ZL. Take note that here uh, we use uh, almost uh, uh, similar uh, precursor for the static material where we use zinc nitrate, 2 methyl imidazolate, and tri triethyl amine okay, as the base. And uh, later on, uh, for the preparation of titanium zif for the functionalization, uh, we induce the titanium uh, esoproxide as the titanium source. Uh, as similar for the preparation of zif 8 uh, take note that only water here being introduced okay, is going to have a similar composition as the zif l but we introduce water here, okay, uh, which is uh, a, a, a common uh, uh, solvent that is uh, going, in the end, going to give you a transformation of uh, zif l to zif a Uh, the characterization method of this catalyst is going to discuss on the following uh, instrument here. Uh, of course, uh, we did uh, several other uh, characterizations such as XPS and nitrogen absorption, but uh, we are going to touch only on this following uh, characterization in this uh, session. Uh, these are the methods used uh, for the fabrication of tin film. Uh, this is where the, the, the term facile comes from. Okay? Uh, Previously, to generate a thin film, uh, there are numerous approach uh, such as chemical vapor deposition and so on. Okay, uh, and uh, in this method, uh, the approach here is actually very simple. Where the zip uh, actually being removed first uh, for the moisture here uh, by heating it at 120 degrees and grinding it in, in a, and compressed into a pellet. Okay, when you have a pellet form, we uh, coat it on a mylar my, uh, sub, substrate uh, using an uh, exposed resin. So that's going to give you a very stable uh, thin film. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, we are going to leave it to dry okay? because the apples, apples need a curing time uh, for the uh, zip to attach to the uh, substrate, uh, the mylar substrate. These are the protocol for the photocatalytic degradation. Okay, uh, take note that there are dark conditions uh, to measure out uh, the absorption capability. Uh, usually, uh, uh, typical method uh, use, uh, only give around 40 to 30 minutes, but we want to see any extensive absorption here for more than one hour. Uh, later, we irradiate it uh, for another four hours and we monitor the degradation of this metal in blue for a uh, cycle of 30 minutes intervals using the UV uh, spectrophotometer and uh, we calculate using the uh, degradation there using the uh, uh, formula given here. For the result and discussion, uh, let us discuss on the morphological properties of this uh, ZIF material. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, for the ZIF and ZIF L, okay, is giving you almost the uh, is, is it giving the oval shape for the morphologies okay and when we induce our titanium or function as the titanium here uh, there is a small particle of uh, that is uh, most probably the titanium uh, attached on the surface of the zip for the zip a okay uh, in the presence of water uh, the structures then directly transform into a hexagonal structures okay uh, with the presence of uh, more, uh, small particles, okay, and these are the average particle size of our uh, zip material, and uh, we did know that the smaller particles might induce a more active size. Uh, to further confirm this uh, FISM morphology study, we conducted a, a transmission electron micrograph analysis, and we found that the structures is sub in good support with the FISAM morphology. And take note that the ZIF-8 and the titanium ZIF-8 uh, preserve the hexagonal structures, okay? Uh, and the ZIF-L, okay, we monitor the oval safe morphology. Although that, the heavy agglomeration is present in the ZIF-L, okay? This is because uh, as the uh, approach uses the solvent synthesis, okay? They are present of strongly agglomerated uh, compound, okay? Uh, this is where we further analyze the elemental composition based on energy dispersed X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, we confirm that the structures of zip l and zip 8 are composed of uh, the imidazolate frameworks there, where the carbon, nitrogen, and zinc are present. And the elements are present and in complete agreement with our uh, literature review. For the titanium zip L, so this is where we uh, confirm that the titanium is uh, present in our uh, functionalization uh, methods. Okay, so both for the titanium zip L and zip titanium zip A, the presence of uh, titanium are present. Okay, so we can see the presence of titanium here as well as here. Okay, around. Uh, five electron volt. So this is in also is a good agreement with our previous literature. For the uh, crystal uh, crystal structures, okay, we analyzed it with the XRD and uh, uh, we found that when we induce our uh, function as our Z with titanium, there is a rise of a rotile phase of titanium at 101 and 204. Okay, uh, this is the uh, presence of uh, uh, titanium uh, in the rotile phase. Okay, so this image of peaks uh, at around 24.9 and 60.32 degrees is uh, indication of titanium uh, in the in the uh, in the uh, framework of the uh, our um, MOF. <coughs> And uh, in the case of a comparison between ZIF-8 and the titanium ZIF-L here, uh, take note that the sub and intense peak at 7.24 here, okay, at a lower uh, uh, degree, uh, theta degree here, imply that this matrix is actually highly crystalline. And for the titanium ZIF-8 here, 
the presence of titanium is actually uh, detectable or observable in the uh, range of 36.7 degrees, 36.17 degrees for the 004 plane. Okay. Uh, to confirm uh, the framework of our uh, MOF or ZIF here is uh, presence or actually uh, being synthesized, we uh, conducted our IR observ observation and uh, we noted that the, uh, the disappearance of the NH of the imidazolate means that your uh, imidazolate is already attached with the Z. So as such that uh, you are going to have the uh, linkers, okay? the uh, framework linkers, the metal organic framework linkers. Okay? So the, the absence of this NH uh, bond in the ZIF L and the titanium ZIF L uh, is significant for the formation of uh, ZN to the N attached to the uh, center of the uh, molecule. Uh, this is in the case of uh, ZIF L. Okay? We also uh, monitored other uh, uh, different functional group that is uh, contributed by the metal images frameworks. Okay? Uh, and take note that uh, there is no observable, observable uh, titanium uh, hydroxide form because of the overlapping of other molecules. <coughs> uh, we continue our uh, characterization using TGA, uh, where we monitored our thermal stability here. And uh, in comparison between the ZIF L and the titanium ZIF L, uh, the Titanium ZIF L uh, give all, only removal of around 18% uh, uh, of water as the first stage of, water, uh, of the removal. This indicates that the ZIF L is actually dense, much more denser than, as compared to the uh, non functionalized uh, ZIF. Okay. And uh, it's proceed uh, in similar. Uh, as the second and third stage uh, for uh, the this compound. Uh, it, as, as highlighted uh, earlier, that uh, ZL have a uh, greater first weight loss uh, compared to the titanium ZIF. This is because the uh, moisture content is that uh, entrapped within the uh, framework. Uh, so meaning that you have uh, the uh, what we call as the framework uh, void or porous uh, material then. Uh, this is when we compare our thermal stability of our ZIF-8 and the titanium ZIF-8. Uh, it's preceded, pre, uh, preceded almost in similar with the ZIF-L, okay, where we have a, a three uh, uh, gravimetric analysis uh, removal okay, uh, for the titanium ZIF-L. And uh, take note that uh, when we uh, analyze this, uh, we can say that the ZIF-8 uh, have a greater weight loss compared to the titanium ZIF-8. <coughs> Where the titanium ZIF-8 uh, have a 15% of the uh, uh, removal of water and trap, uh, while 16% removal for the uh, uh, ZIF-8. <coughs> Okay, so uh, this indicates that uh, the 3D frameworks in comparison between the ZIF L and ZIF 8, the 3D framework of the ZIF 8 is much more denser as compared to the 2D uh, framework of our ZIF L. Okay, uh, to uh, proceed with our experiment, whether this material is actually good for photocatalyst or not. We, we did the optical properties analysis and uh, to analyze the band gap. Okay, uh, based on the UVVs, the diffu diffuse reflectant UVVs here, we found that the top plot uh, that going to give you the uh, band gap for the ZIF L here is around 3.58 electron volt, while the titanium ZIF L is around 2.72 electron volt. Usually, uh, in the case of uh, photodegradation or photocatalyst, a lower band gap indicates that it's going to have a higher absorption efficiency and it's going to contribute to the higher photodegradation efficiency. Uh, for the 
in this case, the titanium Z fan has a better photographic activity and it's might going to contribute a higher removal efficacy to the, the, the ZIF L. Okay. Okay, this is in terms of uh, titanium uh, ZIF A, uh, where uh, you can uh, convert uh, based on the top plot to uh, determine your uh, band gap. Okay, this is a band gap for ZIF A, uh, around 3.55 electron volt, while your titanium ZIF 8 here uh, going to have a much uh, lower uh, uh, band gap, which is around 2.67. Okay, so this material uh, both uh, are considered as semiconductors. Uh, actually, for the ZIF 8 and ZIF L, are both are uh, semiconductors, and that's why we can conclude that this can be used as the uh, photo degradation of metal blue. Uh, when we convert. Uh, this material into thin film uh, using uh, the compression of our powder structures earlier uh, uh, and analyze it with the XRD thin film. Uh, we denote that uh, there are uh, preservation of the crystal structures, most of these crystal structures, especially on the uh, ZIF crystal structures. Okay. So, uh, we compare it based on the uh, peak described at the 004 at 36.17 here and uh, denote that uh, there is no uh, real, real observation okay, for the titanium uh, attached to the uh, uh, structures there. This is because there is numerous small diffraction peaks. Okay? And uh, we conclude that Although we uh, compress this powder, uh, there is no really uh, adverse change or that going to affect on the frameworks. Uh, this is uh, the performance of our uh, uh, material based on the photocatalytic activity. We found that uh, by using the ZIF L, ZIF L okay, uh, the degradation is uh, around uh, 80%. Okay? But when we use uh, ZIF-8, which is a 3D network, uh, the uh, degradation uh, reached almost 90%, okay? 90% plus. So there is a significant difference between both. Okay? In terms of uh, the performance, let's compare it further. Uh, we monitored the degradation uh, after the 20, 240 minutes. Okay? And we found that the ZIF L structures here okay, uh, give only around 88%, while the functionalization of our titanium here uh, increase the degradation into uh, 94%. Okay. For the ZIF A, interestingly, for the 3D uh, structures that we found that the 91% uh, give uh, the degradation of our metal in blue after 240 minutes. And uh, it's significantly enhanced when we have our titanium uh, to, to, get, to give you 96% uh, of the uh, degradation. So uh, uh, we found that the titanium ZIF-8 uh, is uh, the best uh, uh, catalyst here. Uh, we also observed the different color change, okay? uh, the blue uh, become uh, decolorized for uh, for this uh, dye here, become decolorized against time. And uh, take note that uh, this is how uh, we conduct the uh, photocatalyst studies, okay? So these are the mylar here, okay, small mylar, uh, attached uh, with our uh, pellet tin filament. Uh, based on the kinetic study here, we found that uh, this uh, degradation obey the pseudo first order kinetics and the order of this uh, catalyst uh, as follow where the titanium ZIF-8 is uh, actually greater than the titanium ZIF-L and uh, much more better than the ZIF-8 uh, while the ZIF-L is actually the least uh, performance of our uh, photo dedication. <coughs> uh, uh, so we found that uh, based on this study, 
Zif actually going to contribute to the uh, photocatalytic activities. Okay, it's going uh, to have uh, the activity in the photocatalyst, but incorporation of titanium Zif uh, enhance the uh, kinetics and the degradation, as well as uh, when we choose uh, the three D structures as compared to the two D structures of Zif L, uh, we found that the titanium Zif eight. Uh, in the 3D frameworks going to contribute uh, or enhance uh, the degradation much more better. Okay, uh, this is where I said that the uh, stability and the reusability of our thin film increase. In this uh, recovery, recoverability studies of our ZIF, especially in the uh, powder form, uh, after one cycle, uh, you found that uh, we going to lose around 60%. Okay, meaning that we only preserve around 40% or 40% of our uh, solid sample, and then the degradation going to uh, decrease. Uh, where we found that there is a leaching capability, uh, leaching disability of this uh, material. So uh, from 80% is going to directly slump into uh, almost 30 or 20% for the second cycle just for the second cycle. That is in case of zif L. But when we attach our uh, thin film uh, in this study, we found that the degradation or the activities uh, at four cycle remain above 80%. Okay? So in the case of zif L, okay, uh, only around 2% uh, uh, losses. Okay? So as compared to the uh, first cycle. While for the ZIF-8, uh, we found that uh, the degradation, especially in the titanium ZIF-8, uh, demonstrate 93% uh, uh, removal. This revealed that the reusability is in satisfactory. Okay, as the conclusion, uh, we successfully uh, synthesized our ZIF, where we have our ZIF-L without any solvent. And when we introduce the water, we're going to get a ZIF-8. Uh, from 2D to 3D structures, and the degradation of the MB, methylene blue dye, uh, follow the first pseudo first order kinetics. And this is material is actually a good uh, potential to degrade any organic pollutant. And by incorporation of titanium, we actually enhance the structures, especially when the structures are uh, 3D ZIF. Okay? And, and this approach, when we introduce a facile uh, thin film uh, formation, uh, this enhances the stability of our catalyst uh, around uh, to, to maintain their, uh, their performance above 80%. <coughs> These are the recommendations of our, based on our study here, for the characterization or uh, what we call as the optimization should be employed for different uh, uh, titanium uh, species. Okay, we also uh, would like to study on varying triethyl amine whether it's going to affect a lot on the structures. Uh, the effect of uh, pH also perhaps going to contribute to the degradation of our MB. Uh, as I would like to acknowledge uh, the student here. Okay, Para Diana, I think uh, she. Uh, deserve uh, an acknowledgement to, to that contribute to these uh, findings and the UTM grants that have been uh, awarded to me uh, for to achieving this output of the research. Uh, before I end up my uh, talk here, I would like to introduce all of you to my group, uh, Green Chemistry Group, uh, where I have I am the leader currently, uh, but I have wonderful. Uh, uh, colleagues here of different backgrounds. Uh, so uh, I would like to open up uh, any collaboration opportunities with, you, with all of you and welcome uh, any uh, future collaboration. With that, I would like to say thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Juan, for sharing your research finding, which is uh, very interesting. So now I'd like to open the platform for a question and answer session.
Do we have any question from the uh, YouTube? Okay, uh, there you go. There is. Let me read the question. Okay, so, um, yeah, we have two actually. So now, uh, one down there. Okay. Is there any reported X-ray single crystal structure on ZIF-8 and ZIF-L? If yes, may I know what is the space group for this ZIF? So the, the question came from Dr. Nurul Filza. All right, uh, the question asked on the single crystal structures. Uh, it's actually difficult to grow the single crystal structures and uh, in my uh, area, in my concern, uh, I, I have not found any literature yet, especially uh, on the zeolithic images frameworks um, for the single crystal analysis. Okay, uh, But I believe there is other uh, metal organic framework that is being uh, currently uh, characterized using the single crystal, but I'm not really uh, familiar with the ZIF uh, single crystal structures. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Uh, any other questions? So I guess silence means that there is no question. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Then. Okay, then. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Juan. And yeah, we actually... Um, Yeah, we actually um, had reached to the end of this parallel session. So um, I'd like to thank to all the speakers, Dr. Faizwan, Dr. Farah, and Dr. Juan, of course, and all the participants for engaging to this session. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to apologize if there is any inconvenience, inconvenience caused throughout the running of this session. We hope that the newly gained uh, knowledge from this session will be able to contribute to the betterment of the industry and the society as a until we meet again in the future, stay safe and take care everyone. Assalamu alaikum and bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you Dr. Fatima Salim. Uh, very good afternoon everyone. Uh, we continue with the final session of Science and Technology Track. But before we proceed uh, to ensure the effectiveness of the virtual conference, I would like to get your feedback regarding the quality of the audio and visual of this platform. Kindly respond by letting us know if there is anything that we need to improve or attend to. And uh, to show respect and as a sign of appreciation to the speaker, please mute your microphone and put your phone in silent mode during the parallel session. Our invited speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be here as the moderator for iCrest Virtual Conference 2021. My name is Resni Lumbihan from Center of Foundation Studies, University of Technology, Mara Malaysia. And on behalf of the organizing committee, we wish to extend our uh, warm welcome, Selamat Datang, and thank you to all participants, guests of honor, delegates and um, representatives from the participating institutions, foreign and local participants to our second ICRES virtual conference 2021, organized by Center of Foundation Studies, University Technology Mara Chawangan Selangor, Campus Timkil. We are grateful that the conference is joined by more than 145 participants, ranging from researchers, industrial experts and professionals. It is hoped that the newly gained knowledge from this conference will be able to contribute to the betterment of the industry and society as a whole. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is our final session for science and technology track. 
we have four invited speakers who will talk about topics from four different areas. In this two-hour session, we will be enlightened about dyslexia awareness, DNA sequencing, food safety, and bio waste. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first invited speaker for this session. Please welcome Dr. Ong Pua Hun, President, Dyslexia Association of Sarawak, Malaysia, with the title Phonemic Awareness, the Missing Anchor in Learning to Read and Write. Welcome, Dr. Ong, and the platform is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raisni. And uh, first of all, I, my partners yeah, and me uh, convey our thanks and gratitude to the organizers of iCrest yeah, for this invitation uh, to share yeah, regarding our area of interest and our area of passion. So first of all, maybe there are questions in your mind regarding what is phonemic awareness, uh, but be patient, yeah, you will learn. Uh, you will know, get to know what is this thing called phonemic awareness and its relationship uh, to uh, being able to read and write. So first of all, uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce my NGO. So this uh, Dyslexia Association of Sarawak has been set up in 2005 and we are registered in 2007. So that makes us about uh, 15 years old. We are adolescent now. And our main objective is to advocate yeah, for the needs of individuals. So for their learning needs, for their social emotional needs yeah, of individuals with dyslexia and other learning disabilities, including attention deficit. Yeah, and also we provide counseling to families. And these are our core activities here. Yeah, we provide uh, assessment services and also learning intervention. So after children have been assessed with dyslexia, what next? Yeah, so we provide a learning support, uh, intervention, and also fun activities, character building yeah, activities for, for affected individuals, not only children, but also young adults. So today's uh, presentation will be I divide yeah, them I divide it into three areas. So one, why literacy? Why are we so interested in this literacy? So what is phonemic awareness? And I'd like to share with you a case study yeah, where phonemic awareness has helped this child. So literacy is the ability to read and write. And not only technically being able to read and write, must be able to understand what has been read or what is written by other people and apply these skills in our day-to-day -day activities. So, of course, you know, children or individuals who are literate, are literate. Now, there are a whole host of, uh, we say, benefits, advantages, yeah, and enhanced functions in their daily life with literacy skills. Uh, they are better prepared for school. They have higher self-confidence, self-esteem, and it sort of opens the world up to them. Now, we need not go to China to see the Great Wall. We need not go to India to see the Taj Mahal. Just open up a travel log, a magazine, a book, and we learn more yeah, uh, about these, uh, these structures. And not only literacy help in our, in the children's current life, the life now at school, but it will change their lives for the future, for the future. Now, research has shown uh, that illiteracy, illiteracy, yeah, will affect yeah, their lives if children are not literate, when they become adult, you know, they have reduced opportunities for employment of choice, for gainful employment. And also research has shown that the people who are in the prison now, the substance abusers, yeah, a huge percentage of them, a significant minority, yeah, have literacy issues. And that caused them, yeah, to be engaged with criminal activities. So literacy is the key to learning. 
Children wants to learn in school. They want to learn maths. They want to learn science. They want to learn history. They must have these skills of reading, writing, yeah, and understanding. And it is a basic right. Yeah, it's a basic right enshrined yeah, in United Nations Human Rights. And the convention, the CRC, recognized this as a basic right to all children and all state parties must do their utmost to make sure children remain in school before they are 18. Yeah, and that they have the necessary appropriate, so we say they have the age appropriate literacy skills. Yeah. And uh, so when in our Malaysian setting, when will our children acquire literacy skills? Yeah, so here preschool education has done its part. Yeah, preschool education through their play, yeah, they have, yeah, be, they have uh, give the, our children a head start in literacy. But our primary education in primary one, two, and three, uh, look at there is known as phase one. Phase one of primary education is primary one, two, three. The children will learn to read. They will learn to read. They are as perceived. They are as uh, in the curriculum. They will learn to read. And when they are in primary four onwards, then they will need to learn. If they want to learn geography, open up the geography textbook. Okay, you read and you will learn. So if they want to learn history, open up the history book. Then they will read and learn. But the reading skills, the literacy skills of reading and writing, yeah, are supposed yeah, to be mastered in phase one before by the time they 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 leave primary three. And with that literacy skills, yeah, and if they proceed yeah, step by step through the education levels, then it will give them increased opportunity for employment. Yeah, because we are a paper-based society. The higher, the thicker our academic qualifications, our certificates, then the greater the opportunity for employment of choice. But for those children who do not acquire literacy skills, that is, it, uh, people will say that they are not interested in school, they will drop out. Now, if they drop out before their primary six, or they drop out before form three, or they drop out without the SPM, now, where? What is their opportunity for gainful employment? Yeah, definitely reduced opportunity. But we have staggering st statistics that many of our children do not acquire their literacy skills by the time they leave primary three. Do not. Now, these are all statistics, but maybe today's statistics, current statistics might show even worse picture, worse scenario than this. Now, children, our students are dropping out. And these are future mothers and fathers. They are dropping out. Even from one, yeah, and they still cannot read and write. And look at the number of children who have dropped out. Now, I'm not saying that they drop out because they have academic problem, but maybe a significant minority will surely have literacy issues. And that is the reason why they drop out. There's a whole host of reasons why children drop out, family, environment, financial, but there will be definitely out of these children, a significant minority not able to read and write. That's why they drop out. And earlier on, these are old statistics, 2012. Now, 8 out of 100 of our 17, 18 years old cannot read. Uh, and they are future mothers and fathers. So maybe I do not know. If, if somebody were to tell me this, I, I do not know this statistic. If somebody were to tell me this, I will be shocked. Because our children are expected to read and write by the time they leave primary three. And these are 18 years old that we are talking about. Yeah, and research has shown, I just show one research here. Research has shown that 
If our children cannot read and write by the time they leave primary school in adolescence stage, they have damage in their social emotional well-being. They will have that damage because they look at themselves as so different. They are so different. They are so inferior to their peers. Why are their friends able to read and write effortlessly, but not them? And, yeah, and if they fail to catch up by the time they're nine years old, 10 years old, that is a strong predictor you know, with problems with the law. There is a high risk that they will drop out, they will sub abuse substances or get engaged in criminal activities. Yeah. And this is also another re research coming out from US and Sweden. Yeah, that many of them, yeah, 15% of children with reading difficulties drop out. That is 15 out of 100. Yeah, isn't that a significant minority? Yeah, and only 2% complete secondary school. So they, they, when they leave secondary school, they have literacy issues. And almost 50% young people in Sweden, yeah, with criminal records and substance abuses have literacy problems. So here you see we relate an academic problem of being unable to read and write to social and emotional issues. And if we do not help these children by the time they are nine and 10 years old, they develop behavior problems. They become delinquent, angry, aggressive. They withdraw, yeah, they social withdrawal, and they will have unrealized potentials in their life. Yeah, an unpromising future. We do not know what their future will lead them to. Yeah, so and what is so tragic about these children? They have intact IQ. They have average IQ, even above average and superior IQ. But they cannot read and write. They cannot read and write with their superior IQ. And you see, and if they drop out, or if they get engaged in criminal activities, isn't that, uh, we say, a crime that schools have committed with these children? So that is case for literacy. Now we come to my second part. What is phonemic awareness? So let us just reflect. What happened in our evolution that requires humans to read? Uh, because, you know, our ancestors, our moyang, uh, right from the cave time, they do not need to, they did not need to learn to read and write. They did not. But why? Yeah, why do us, you know, modern citizens of this world, we, and in our technology driven world now, why do we need to learn to read and write? It is because of our evolution of our oral and written language. Humans 2.5 to 3 million years ago, we communicated with sounds and gestures. Yeah, that, uh, 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 yeah. And then through, through the years, each utterance, each speech, speech sound meant something. So the society at that locality understood if I, if somebody say, ah, okay, it means something. It is tapped to a standard object where all members in that society understood that that is the beginning of oral language. Yes, yeah? so different localities, they have their different oral language. But about 5,000 years ago, yeah, the early philosophers say, oh, oral language. Yeah, oral language, yes, we can transmit oral language from one generation to next generation, but there is no accuracy. Uh, because oral language, we can change the oral language. We can change the narratives and the outcome will be different. So the early philosophers say, oh, we have to, we have to make a form of communication that is accurate, that is unchanging from one generation to the generation. And they created writings. Yes, yeah, so they wrote on rock face, they wrote on wall, they wrote on bamboo sticks. And, and this writing 
represent the oral language. So the early philosophers look, okay, when they say ah, uh, okay, let's have a symbol for this ah. Uh. When, when we hear the speech sound, mm, okay, let's have a symbol for this speech sound. So this writing reflects speech sound. So can you see the evolution or not? We have the speech sound. We have the sound. Then humans create writing to reflect the sound. So we human, our human beings, our brains are genetically wired for speech, for oral language. But writing is invention. It's a cultural artifact. Yeah, so it is being invented by men about more than 5,000 years ago. And if you look at the evolutionary trend, 5,000 years is like yesterday in our evolutionary history of about 3 million years. So it's a recent invention. So reading is not natural. We are not born, not when a baby is born, it, there's no intrinsic ability for them to read. They can suck, they can make sounds, but not reading. So we have to teach reading yeah, in a deliberate way. So, but, so why are there these huge statistics of children failing to read and write? It's because there is a mismatch between the way reading is being taught in school to the way their brains learn. The children, the teachers are saying this is A and this is S. And I, and that is the wrong way, wrong way. Because this symbol, this symbol was created more than 5,000 years ago to reflect eh in English. When they hear the speech sound eh, this symbol was created to reflect eh. And when that, if the teachers say this is s, then, or this is m, and this is e, that is the natural way, natural way to teach reading because the symbols reflect speech sounds yeah, of millions of years ago. But what is happening in our primary schools and many preschools, teacher will say C-A-T cat and they use letter names. So that is not brain compatible because in English we have... many words, like children ask to just words as pieces, it's just too many. For example, if it is three letter or four letter, fair enough, I can memorize these words. But what if it is these two words, how to memorize? And we have a whole host yeah, of huge number of, of, of words with many letters. So not all children can learn to memorize and learn through letter names. Yeah. So what is the brain compatible way? Okay, when I give you this word with three letters, can you all read? Can any one of you read this? I also cannot, yeah, if I do not know the sound. None of us can read because we do not know the sounds. We do not know these letter sounds. We can see the shape, we can see the pattern, but we do not know the sounds. So if schools teach that this is R and this is E and this is T, R, E, T, can you blend it? Can you join up the sounds? R, A becomes red and red becomes red. Oh, it's a mouse. Yeah, red. And this is the children use the letter sounds to decode because this is a secret message like that, a secret message. But if you know the sounds, it is not secret anymore. You can decode it. You can break the code. You can crack the code by using the letter sounds. But how can R-A-T becomes red? How can R-A-T? It's not natural. R-A and T, how can become red? But if red, it's natural. It's natural. Yeah, so that is phonemic awareness. Okay, another thing. Can you please write on your piece of paper the word vault? Vault. Can you write, please? But uh, yeah, the audience. V, motorcycle sound. V, vault. So to write this word, uh, to be able to write, spell this word, you have to, in your mind, you have to say, oh, what is the first sound Dr. Ong has said? V. What's the second sound? V, or. And what's the third sound? Vault. 
And what's the last sound? Vault. Then first sound, second sound, third sound, fourth sound. You can write it because you encode. I give a speech sound and you encode it. You give a code to my v. My second sound is or. You give a code. My third sound is p. Now you give a code to it. And my last sound is t. And you can spell. Hooray to all of you. You can spell because you have phonemic awareness. You know the letter sounds. And United States, yeah, U, uh, UK, they are, they are saying, the research coming out from there. Yeah, this is uh, how many years ago? <laughs> yeah, and they say that that is the way to teach reading. Yeah, there's a way to teach reading. And what is phoneme? It's the smallest unit of sound. For example, vault, v, or p, t. Is the smallest unit of sounds. There are four phonemes. And what is phoneme awareness? Then you are aware of what sound is it and where is that sound? Okay, what's the last sound? It's, t, it's the last one. What is the, the second sound? It's all. Yeah, so the what and where. So we have to teach this. This is research coming out from the UK. All children with and without learning disabilities. This phonemic awareness is not only for children with attention deficit, autism, or dyslexia. It's for all children. Yeah, it's the best way for them to become fluent readers. So, what are some examples of phonemic awareness? For example, blending. So, if I give you k a p, can you put together k a p cup? Very good. Okay, how many sounds in pet? I have a pet cat. I have a pet cat. Um, the cat is my pet. So how many sounds? So one, two, three. Per actor. That's segmentation. And then, okay, if I say pet, okay, a cat. Meow, cat. What's the last sound? It's t. What's the first sound? It's k. That is isolation. And okay, cat. Can you say cat without t? It's care. Can you say cat without k? Is at. So the children manipulate these sounds. And substitution, okay, say cat. Can you say cat uh, and change t to p? Is cap. Okay, now change a to a is cup, drinking the cup. Yeah, drinking water from the cup. So let us see an example. So this phonemic awareness is not done in our primary schools. And that is the missing anchor. The children are not, they, they are not made to develop this knowledge of what sound where in words. And that is the missing link in the process of learning to read. So I would like to introduce this boy, he's eight years old, rejected by schools. Yeah, and because he has attention deficit symptoms, and later, you will see him moving his body. Eight years old, no school wants to receive him, wants to take him in. Yep, he cannot. He has zero reading and writing skills in BM and English. Zero, zero. Okay, so let's watch how I did the phonemic awareness activity with him. My first word is sub. So you can see, he started lessons with me, 12 January, zero. Cannot read and write. But yesterday was our class and he was able to read book 10. With that phonemic awareness, it is so easy for him now to manipulate the sounds in the words. And 
These are our letter sets. You see, first we started with only nine letters. And we progressed let sets by sets. And now he can read two syllable words. He can read words with magic E syllables. He can read words with digraphs. Yeah, set by set. So that phonemic awareness yeah, has helped him to master a uh, reading from CV. CV means consonant vowel, just be to longer words, to CV, C, uh, to CCV, CC, like Trump, cram and two syllable words in a matter from uh, January to June and uh, one week only two hours of classes two hours only in one week and we have a lot of holidays Hari Raya whatever is holiday and he could reach uh, to this level with phonemic awareness so uh, yeah ladies and gentlemen yeah I would like to share the urgency that our schools have to stitch the right way right early because it will affect the lives of our children in future. And if our children, because they are going to be the human capital, the leaders of tomorrow, yeah? So it will affect yeah, our society, our fabric of our community. We do not want them to be criminals. We do not want them to be substance abusers. We want them to be happy, functional contributing members of the community. So in conclusion, yeah, our many yeah, it's just a brain difference. Now, even typically developing children, yeah, have a brain difference. And so that brain difference gives them an academic problem. And this is compounded with an instructional mismatch and they get an emotional, uh, that's escalate into emotional problem and escalate into social problem. So my appeal is that we stop the problem here at the academic. Let it not yeah, escalate to emotional and social. So with that, yeah, my team and I say thank you very much yeah, to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ong, uh, for the enlightening and uh, very passionate uh, way of opening our eyes about the phonemic awareness. Um, we actually have, I believe we have a lot of questions to ask, but because we have um, a time limit and um, our next presenter is engaged with other commitment after this. So I'm really sorry, maybe if other, um, the audience have question, maybe they can um, ask directly or they can um, make uh, contact with Dr. Ong. Is that okay? All right. So, um, I hope that uh, Dr. Shema is uh, here with us, us, but let us um, uh, introduce her, yeah? Um, yeah, from dyslexia awareness, awareness a topic that uh, we, the general public, can relate to. Now, let us move on to a very specific topic, which probably some of us may not have uh, heard, of, uh, heard of it until today. Uh, let us welcome our second speaker for this session, Dr. Shaima Enani, Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology Department, Faculty of Pharmacy, Suez Canal University, Egypt, with the title Whole Genome Sequencing of Klebsiella Pneumoniae Sequence Type 627. Warm welcome to you, Dr. Shaima, and the platform is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning here and good afternoon in Malaysia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, your invitation. It uh, was my pleasure to give um, my talk in your uh, ITRIST uh, 2021 conference. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, as you said, I am an associate professor of uh, microbiology and immunology in Faculty of Pharmacy, Suez Canal University in Egypt. I uh, got my PhD uh, uh, in 10 from uh, Niigata University in Japan. And after that, I got three postdoc, uh, one in Japan and one in California in USA and the other one in, in Japan. And uh, nowadays I am uh, preparing my uh, Master of Business Administration and uh, I expected to graduate in 2022. 
Uh, actually, for my uh, work and my measure, uh, to give a hint about my themes of my research, in uh, principle, my major is microbiology. And uh, during my master's thesis, I worked about uh, a microbe known as Helicobacter pylori, and my PhD was about another microbe, which is known as the Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, most of my research uh, was about uh, different uh, bacteria, which causing several diseases. Uh, as you said in the introduction, maybe it's uh, more specialized topics. Uh, and uh, most of my articles was aimed to elucidate about the molecular function of this, either for discovering the virulence factors or the antimicrobial resistance uh, determinant of these bacteria, uh, or also finding some markers, proteins, or enzymes to discover how these bacteria causing the disease. Uh, to do that, I use several multi-omics techniques like uh, genomics, metagenomics, proteomics, or metaproteomics. Uh, actually, today I will present my topic about the proteogenomic analysis of ESPL producing and non espel producing TLA pneumonia. Klebsiella pneumonia is a pathogenic bacteria which causing several diseases. Uh, we can classify th this bacteria to two types. One is known as ESPL producing and the other is non-ESPL producing. So what is ESPL? Uh, ESPL is a simple for extended spectrum beta-lactamase enzyme. Uh, this means that Klebsiella pneumonia may produce enzyme or or may not enzyme. If it produces the extended spectrum beta-lactamase enzyme, we called it espel producing bacteria. If it does not produce this enzyme, we called it non-espel producing bacteria. And this enzyme is playing an important role in increasing the resistance of this bacteria to antibiotic, which we used in the market. So this means that uh, if the bacteria producing this enzyme, this means it's a highly resistant, causing several diseases. We can find in the graph here that the non espel producing bacteria causing already several infections like urinary tract infection, bloodstream infection, meningitis, and many other infections. But on the other side, the espel producing bacteria uh, usually is more pathogenic. This means it also causing several infections, but usually the outcomes and the symptoms of this infection is worse and more severe and harder than the non espel producing Klebsiella pneumon. For that, we needed to do our work, and the aim of our work was to do a proteomic analysis for the ESPL and non espel producing bacteria and the whole genome sequencing bacteria to find the more details about the virulence factors and the protein level of both ESPL and non espel producing bacteria. For the proteomic analysis, we did mass spectrometry analysis to unravel the proteome of these bacteria and also to elucidate and discover the pathogenicity determinant for both groups. Also, we did the whole genome sequencing, WGS, to understand the genetic variations for these bacteria and to compare the genes of these bacteria with the genes of reference, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, from the databases or from different places in the world, which is already presented in database. Uh, for that, we, uh, for the proteomic analysis, after we did the mass spectrometry, we found that the ESPL producing and the non ESPL producing bacteria have uh, uh, completely different correlations uh, with the heat map. As you can find, the red parts and the blue parts in heat map indicating that they are uh, significantly different profiles for their proteins. Uh, each group produces proteins which is completely different than the others. At the same time, when we make the uh, partial least square, which is a kind of the multivariant analysis, we found also that they are significantly discriminating from each other. Uh, this means that uh, the green parts, which is uh, the green parts, which is indicating the non espel group uh, of bacteria, uh, completely different than the espel producing, which is indicating in the photo with the red parts. Uh, they are uh, completely different in their protein abundance and in their protein profiles and discriminating from each other. This class three map also indicating the significantly different between the heads, which is found in the ESPL and the non-ESPL producing groups. Uh, unique proteins abundance for both groups were significantly different. Each group has their own unique proteins, which indicating they are involved in different diseases and in different outcomes. Uh, 
Here uh, we can find the volcano plot, which segregates sample based on the p value and the fold change. And uh, from this uh, volcano plot, we can show that the shares between the two groups uh, significantly difference in the abundance. So uh, by selected volcano plot with the B value and the magnitude of difference uh, in the expression value between average biological replicates for these groups, we found that the shared proteins between the ESPL and the non-ESPL producing was significantly different. Uh, this table indicated the top 50 different proteins which is identified by the previous volcano plot between the two groups. Uh, interestingly, here we found that the most different proteins, the top proteins, were involved mainly in the pathogenesis and the virulence, also in the antibiotic resistance. Uh, and this indicates how we can found that the ESPL producing bacteria is usually more severe or producing more severe outcomes or more severe diseases rather than the, uh, the non-ESPL producing groups. This is because the mainly different proteins involved in the virulence and pathogenesis also in increasing the antibiotic resistance for this group. By the analysis of the pathways for these proteins, we found that uh, using KIG analysis, we found that most of these different proteins involved in the pillars formation or increasing the adherence to the biological tissue. This means that increasing the ability of bacteria to adhere to the surface, which also increase its colonization and increase its establishment in uh, the host, increasing the possibility for causing a disease. Uh, after that, we moved to the other part of the work, which is the whole genome sequencing analysis of the sample. Uh, we also analyzed the whole genome sequencing for our CLIPS. Modulated from clinical patients. Uh, in this uh, analysis, we found that uh, there are 15 antimicrobial resistant genes. Uh, most of these Genes involved in uh, different classes, either for uh, aminoglycosides or uh, beta-lactam, phosphomycin, uh, sulfonamide, tetracycline, and most of them was involved in different mechanisms. Three classes of mechanisms was found either in uh, antibiotic inactivation or antibiotic efflux or antibiotic target replacement. Uh, we also make a heat map for the, the virulence genes or the virulence factors which is found by the whole genome sequencing analysis. And we found that our isolates containing 65 virulence factors. Mainly they are involved in the adhesion, as I said before, increasing the possibility of bacteria to adhere to the surface of the biological membrane, which increasing its colonization and establishment in the host. And this means increasing the pathogenicity of the bacteria. All also, uh, this virulence was involved in the biofilm formation. Biofilm formation, like the formation of a surface of biofilm in the surface of teeth, in the surface of the skin, in the surface of the GIT. And this biofilm helped the bacteria to itself against the antimicrobial agents which we use, and also against the immune system of the host itself. Uh, may, uh, some, some groups also may be found to a role in the capsule formation. Uh, this capsule formation increases the possibility of the bacteria to escape the phagocytosis of the immune system of the host, and also playing a role in the side of four translocation, which increasing the virulence of the bacteria. Uh, another results we found the insertion sequence. The number of the insertion sequence we found was 13. Uh, this insertion sequence is a mobile genetic element which is found in the bacteria. This mobile genetic elements playing uh, a role in uh, antimicrobial resistance and in increasing and spreading the antimicrobial resistance among the bacteria. Uh, we can found uh, as a I said third insertion sequence as shown in the heat map, uh, IS1, IS3, IS481, IS5, IS6. Everyone from this insertion sequence have a critical role in the antimicrobial resistance. For example, ISKPM26, which is playing an important role in the cholestine resistance. Uh, this is very important in both human infection and in animal infection. And this is playing an important role in uh, transferring the infection between human and animal, especially in uh, the places where they found animal and human in the same place, like in the farms, in the veterinary sections. We can found that uh, there is a 
close contact between human and animal. Uh, so this insertion sequence could play an important role in transmission of the bacteria between animal to human or from human to animal. And uh, this is what we call a zoonotic diseases. And this is due to the insertion sequence ISCKPM20. Possible for the cholesterol resistance. Another insertion sequence is uh, 26. Uh, this is uh, participated in the mobilization of antibiotic resistance genes and uh, play a critical role in multi drug resistance, not only one drug, but multi drug resistance phenotypes. Uh, we have also IS1X2. This is playing an important role in the Zidovudine uh, resistance uh, spreading between uh, humans from human to human. Uh, this one is a, a CRISPR analysis. Uh, after we did the whole genome sequencing, we tried to find the CRISPR analysis of these uh, isolates. We found that most of our isolates was carrying CRISPR-1 and CRISPR-2, which is indicated or identified as CRISPR-associated Cas3 helicases. This is playing an important role in adapting the system immune system in the bacteria. we did a comparative analysis between our isolates and uh, the already known isolates. We chose one reference, Klebsiella pneumonia, from the gene bank, uh, which is Klebsiella pneumonia strain C17KP0052. Uh, this strain we used here in uh, this uh, study as a reference to compare our uh, whole genome sequencing for our samples with the whole genome sequencing of these reference strains. And uh, interestingly, after we did the phylogenetic tree analysis uh, between our samples and between this reference, we found that one of our reference, which is K75, was correlated to the uh, reference genome which we used. While the other samples was completely different and in a different sections or clusters in the phylogenetic tree, uh, this is indicated that uh, we already have different strains, and uh, this is confirmed the result that Klebsiella pneumonia spreading worldwide is completely different, and uh, the clustering is meant on the geographical regions or the geographical distribution. In uh, conclusion, we can uh, say that our analysis. This is after the mass spectrometry analysis and the whole genome analysis. We divide our results to proteomic results and whole genome sequencing results. Uh, the proteomic results show that uh, our samples have different proteomic profiles and different pathways after uh, analysis by KIG and GO on mutations. We found that they have different pathways for the two groups, ESBIL and non ESBIL producing bacteria. Also, we showed that the virulence factors producing uh, from the ESPL producing bacteria was completely higher than the non ESPL producing bacteria in the intensity of the virulence proteins. Several virulence determinants were identified only in the ESPL producing, while does not find at all in the non ESPL producing group. In the whole genome part, we uh, confirmed that our results first genomic analysis for this sequence type which is the sequence type or SCT 627 and also for the antimicrobial resistance mechanisms we found they are in different classes either antibiotic inactivation or antibiotic effluxes or reduce the permeability of the antibiotic. Uh, different uh, virulence factors have been identified using the whole genome sequencing and uh, we found or emphasized the uh, critical role for the mobile genetic elements and the insertion sequence in distributing and the spreading of antibiotic resistance. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shaima. Um, yeah, I know that you are in a hurry. So would you rather uh, receive question through your email or you can answer some uh, questions? Yes, of course, uh, of course uh, I can stay for uh, 10 minutes more. All right, okay. So I open this session for a question and answer session. If you have any uh, question from those who are watching live uh, through YouTube now or uh, from anyone who's with us now. Yeah, I, I have this uh, question that I receive uh, through WhatsApp. So I'll just read it as it is, yeah. It says that um, I have to be honest, but this topic is too specific and too scientific for me. But I'm just curious, 
Um, how many Klebsia lab pneumonia in sequence type are there known so far? And how are they being labeled? Are they being labeled according to uh, where they were found, like the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta variant of COVID-19, which originated in UK, South Africa, Brazil, and India, respectively? Or are they labeled according to their extraction process? Oh, actually, there are millions of sequences available now in pneumonia. But uh, for example, in my study, we already did the sequence analysis for uh, four samples, four clinical samples isolated from patients. Uh, but uh, to found the uh, sequence, you can enter in the PubMed or the gene bank. And uh, at this gene bank, you can find the whole genome sequence of many, many different uh, strains of Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, for the different strains of Klebsiella pneumonia, of course, we have different types or different strains. I, uh, he, here, I focused only on two groups, the SPL producing and non-SPL producing groups. But for Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, even either uh, inside one group, uh, even inside one group, for example, in the SPL producing group, we can find several Overall, uh, each strain have different gene sequence, uh, and this means, as uh, as he said uh, in the question, that like COVID nineteen, there are so the same happened in the bacteria. There are several mutations, and every time we can find new genes, new mutation which is appeared. Uh, that's why we are usually making whole genome sequencing to try to find the new mutation and uh, try to find which strain it is spreading in a specific area or in a specific uh, location. I hope I uh, can answer it correctly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe so. Um, is there any other question? The committee, do we have any question from the other platform? All right, so I believe uh, there is no other question uh, given to us. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Saima, for thank your you, presentation please. and the sharing of your knowledge. Thank you so much. Well. Okay, from a very specific topic, let us move on to a topic which every one of us could be exposed to every day in our life, a topic about food safety. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Noor Aini Mahyuddin, Head of Laboratory, Laboratory of Halal Science Research, Halal Product Research Institute, Faculty of Food Science and Technology, University Putra Malaysia, UPM Malaysia, with the title Microbial Food Safety in Food Service Industry. Warm welcome to you, Dr. Noor Aini, and the platform is yours. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator, and also thank you to the organizer for uh, inviting me to give a talk on this topic today. Um, I Can I share the screen now? Yeah, sure. Okay, the topic for my talk today is the uh, microbial food safety in food service industry. And it is um, a general topic and the outline of the talk today is a little bit on the background of uh, microbial food safety in food service industry. And the talk will be based on two cases. Uh, the first case is food safety in selected school canteens. And the second case would be the food safety in selected restaurants. Uh, then at the end, I'll do some uh, brief uh, conclusion. Uh, and uh, as a background, uh, we know that uh, food handlers um, are among the main uh, vehicles for food uh, contamination and they, uh, their level of practice 
practice, of course, uh, play an important aspect in the uh, food, uh, microbial food safety. Okay, there are three factors uh, playing role in the occurrence of food poisoning uh, with regards to the KAP or uh, knowledge, attitude and practices. And this KAP of food handlers playing major role in the occurrence of food poisoning. The contamination... Uh, uh, besides food handler, the contamination of work surfaces and equipment by the food handlers also can contribute to increase uh, microbial load. And the, we also know that the survival of bacteria on food contact surfaces has important economic consequences as they can also serve as a potential source of contamination. And... Um, among others, cutting boards is one of the uh, instruments or equipment that have been used uh, largely at the food service uh, establishment or premises and it has been reported that it has highest level of contamination. And the other uh, part of the microbial contamination is the ability of the microbes to form biofilm on the food contact surfaces. And being biofilm, they are not easily removed by rinsing and uh, sanitizing procedure. And also, this biofilm may involve uh, in multi-drug resistance and that can present challenges for infection control. So, food service industry... Uh, continues to have significant impacts on food safety and health of the public, as we all know. Uh, uh, there have been reports um, worldwide, including in our country, on these incidences and the foodborne illnesses at this food uh, service industry uh, has been associated with unhygienic preparation and lack of knowledge on personal hygiene, improper storage, uh, in, uh, inappropriate food storage and uh, cross-contamination. Okay. And um, I'm just sharing briefly the uh, selected works that our food safety program group uh, uh, has been working on the microbial food safety in food service industry. Uh, we have been working um, on the uh, food safety aspect uh, at uh, various uh, restaurants, uh, school canteens, uh, boarding school um, canteens, and also at the military uh, food service institutions. So these are among the work that uh, we have been uh, doing for the past uh, 10, about 10 years. So for today's um, talk, I'm going to choose two cases out of uh, this uh, listed work, and I'm going to uh, briefly talk about it. And the first one is the case that uh, we did in the uh, period of 2012 to 2014. Uh, it is on the food safety in selected school canteens, whereby we have selected 38 primary school canteen with 85 uh, food handlers. And the scope of studies involved the uh, KAP of uh, the food handlers and also the antimicrobial resistance of E. coli and Staph aureus isolated from the food handler's hands. And uh, this is um, the result that shows the lack of uh, hand hygiene knowledge, principally regarding uh, ready-to-eat foods and also the existence of bacteria and correct hand washing methods. And the next uh, scope of the study is uh, to relate the demographic uh, of the food, uh, food handler with their knowledge, attitude and practices uh, on hand hygiene. And there were significant differences in the following areas whereby the hand washing practices between genders <coughs> here uh, is uh, significant and we also have the the hygiene attitudes uh, and also glove use between nationalities being uh, significant and the personal hygiene knowledge between groups with different levels of education also were found to be um, significant. And on the other part is that we uh, the study also um, compare the self-reported practices and the uh, and we observed 
the practices. So I'm just selecting uh, two of the uh, main hand hygiene practices that were was reported by the food handlers. Like they always uh, practice uh, proper hand washing procedure. But when we did the observation, 100% all of the um, uh, food handlers uh, were not uh, practicing a proper uh, procedures. And also on wearing jewelries while handling food, uh, 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 quite a huge uh, percentage um, uh, reported that they never wear uh, jewelries. Uh, but uh, during our observation, uh, we found that uh, about more than seventy percent uh, food handlers are still wearing jewelries when they handling food. And these are some of the examples of the good and the bad. Uh, practices that have been observed, uh, like bare hand contact with the ready to eat food, uh, was among the um, practice that was uh, un unhygienic in our observation. And uh, the second scope of the study is that the uh, food handler's uh, uh, hand, uh, we have isolated uh, E. coli and Staph aureus and we studied the, uh, their resistance against anti, uh, antibiotics. And the antibiotic resistant patterns for E. coli is shown in this table, whereby of the, we have 28 confirmed E. coli isolates, six were resistant resistant to more uh, or two antibiotics, whereby um, of that six, four were uh, multi-drug resistant, where they are resistant to three or more than three classes of antibiotics. And for these staph aureus, uh, of the 148 confirmed isolates, eight were resistant to two or more than two antibiotics. And of that eight, one isolate was uh, found to be MDR or multi-drug resistant. <coughs> okay. And uh, as a summary of the case that we studied in the period of 2012 to 2014 uh, on the food safety in selected school canteens uh, for the first scope uh, on the KAP, uh, it was found that the KAP were considerably good. Uh, the hand hygiene knowledge on the RTE foods uh, existence of bacteria and correct hand washing uh, should be highlighted, uh, should be improved. Uh, the practicing of correct hand washing methods among food handlers also need to be emphasized. The hand hygiene risk factor determined were food poisoning knowledge, hand hygiene attitudes, hand washing practices, contamination prevention and glove use practices. So that would be the first scope uh, summary. And the next summary is for the... Uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance of the two isolates, E. coli and Staph aureus. Uh, we have found that 85.71% uh, of the E. coli were resistant to the penicillin and propanicol, while 100% of the isolate was susceptible to gentamicin and nitrofurantoin. And uh, 72 0.3% of the staph aureus were resistant to amphicillin, while none of the isolate were resistant to uh, the three uh, antibiotics. Then the multi-drug resistant E. coli uh, isolates were higher, uh, was higher than the staph aureus uh, strains. So that will be the summary from the case uh, one. So now we move to case uh, number two. Uh, this work uh, was conducted uh, in the period of 2015 to 2019. Uh, and we did the food safety uh, research in selected restaurants, whereby we have uh, four scopes of study uh, involving the cutting boards that we obtained uh, from 22 restaurants in Sri Serdang, Selangor. And we uh, look for the presence of Staph aureus and E. coli on the clean cutting board, uh, cutting board surfaces. And also the uh, antimicrobial resistant profile of the isolated uh, bacteria. Uh, then the ability of the bacteria to form biofilm on uh, cutting board surfaces. And also efficacy of sanitizers in reducing the bacterial biofilm cells. And uh, for the first scope uh, of the study, um, we have 
identify and detect enterotoxin <coughs> genes uh, from Staph aureus and E. coli that was isolated uh, from the cutting box surfaces. So from the table, it looks that the uh, all the Staph aureus are isolates uh, harbor the genes that encode for enterotoxins A and D. Uh, while the uh, E. coli isolates only 37.5 harbor the genes that encodes for production of heat level enterotoxin. And the gene that uh, was responsible, the, uh, the heat stable enterotoxin, was not detected in any of the E. coli isolates. And for the second scope of the study, the all the isolates that have been um, um, isolated from the cutting boards were tested against 11 types of antibiotics from five different classes. <clears throat> and this is what we found, uh, the response of uh, Staph aureus to antibiotic. <clears throat> It shows that all the Staph aureus isolates were resistant to the penicillins, uh, which are uh, represented by amoxicillin and the penicillin G. And all isolates of the Staph aureus were susceptible to the uh, aminoglycosides, sulfonamide and cephalosporins. Yeah. So there are nine uh, patterns of antibiotic resistance and the most common were the amoxicillin, penicillin, uh, nalidicity acid and the CIP. Uh, and 11 of the uh, isolates were multidrug resistant where they are resistant to three or more than three classes of antibiotic. And for the E. coli response to antibiotic, we found that all isolates of E. coli uh, were resistant to penicillin, which are represented by the amoxicillin and the penicillin G, which is similar to what we found uh, in the case of Staph aureus. Uh, however, in E. coli, uh, it shows that the, um, the resistance to cephalosporins were observed in some isolates. Uh, the highest susceptibility was against the quinolones and the cephalosporin. And the most common pattern of the resistance are the uh, against the amoxicillin and the penicillin. And the 16 isolates here were resistant to two classes of antibiotic, which are the uh, penicillin and the cephalosporin. Yeah. Then we move to the third uh, scope of the study. It is on the biofilm formation ability of Staph aureus and E. coli. The isolates of Staph aureus and E. coli that were resistant to <coughs> at least two classes of antibiotics were tested for their ability to form biofilm uh, in the 96 well microtiter plates. <coughs> after incubation for 24 hours at 37 degrees and the ability was classified based on the absorbance value uh, determined at the uh, OD570 NL. Okay, so <coughs> based on this, <coughs> this study, 57.1% of the Staph aureus isolates are strong biofilm formers. <laughs> then of the 12 strong formers, 7 were multidrug isolates, uh, while 5 were resistant to 2 classes of antibiotic. And uh, uh, the electromicrograph of the Staph aureus uh, was represented by uh, isolate uh, SA016 and 16. It shows the, <coughs> the staphylococcal cell form biofilm due to to the influence of the EPS matrix here. Then we go to the ability of E. coli to form biofilm of the 16 isolate, 75% uh, 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 produce uh, of uh, strong biofilm formers. They are, the remaining four were only moderate and weak. And we can see here the uh, biofilm formation of E. coli under the SEM. 
And for the uh, last scope of the study is the efficacy of sanitizers. So in this uh, scope of study, the sanitizers that we use are the uh, chemical sanitizers and also the uh, hot water. Yeah, we use also hot water. So there are three chemical sanitizers used. Uh, that was the paras parasitic acid. PAA, the sodium hypochlorite and AOCL and the benzyl corneum chloride BAC. So they were tested against the strong biofilm formers, which we have 12 isolates of Staph aureus and 12 isolates of uh, DE E. coli. Okay, based on these uh, results, it shows that all sanitizers uh, <coughs> were in effect ineffective to reduce Staph aureus by film at three minutes exposure. Okay. And um, although the they are able, the sanitizers are able to reduce the biofilm population uh, for more than 3.5 log at five minutes, uh, the PAA showed the most significant reduction, which uh, their reduction ranging from 5.3 to 7.9. So, all sanitizers effectively reduce biofilm cells of all the 12 uh, isolates at 10 minutes contact time, except for the BAC that was less efficient to eliminate biofilm cells of uh, Staph aureus SAA 0, 5, 16, and 22. Okay, so this is the result for the reduction of Staph aureus biofilm cells by the three chemical sanitizers. Now we move to the reduction of E. coli biofilm cells uh, by chemical sanitizers. And in uh, for E. coli, we can see here uh, that the exposure to the PAA at three minutes significantly reduced E. coli biofilm cells. Uh, which range from 3.4 to 6.8 uh, log, yeah, comparing to the other two uh, sanitizers. Well, at five minutes contact time, PAA was more effective to reduce uh, E. coli biofilm cells uh, with more than six log reduction, except for the resistant uh, isolate of EC005. And at 10 minutes, all the sanitizers effectively reduced uh, the cells of all 12 isolates of E. coli with the uh, reduction of uh, 6.5 to 7.5 uh, log. Okay, so uh, besides the chemical sanitizers, as I mentioned earlier, we also are uh, using hot water to uh, reduce the biofilm cells. And from here, we can see that <coughs> the... <coughs> at 85 degrees Celsius, the biofilm cells of three isolates, uh, uh, 5, uh, 16, and also 22, they were eliminated in a lower range, uh, which is 5.1 to 6.2. And the rest of the isolates were effectively reduced at 85 degrees Celsius. But at all the tested um, um, uh uh, temperatures, uh, the nine isolates were effectively re reduced at more than 7.5 log. And then we move to the E. coli reduction by hot water. Uh, it shows that there's no significant differences in biofilm reduction at all the three temperatures uh, tested. And most resistant biofilm cells were uh, the three isolate uh, 2, 19, and 24 with a lower reduction of uh, in the range of 6.5 to 6.6 .6 log. So in a summary for case number two, that the study that was conducted uh, in the period of 2015 to 2019, uh, <clears throat> all the isolates of Staph and E. coli were resistant to the classes of penicillin represented by the amoxicillin and penicillin G. Um, and uh, they also were uh, resistant to aminoglycoside and sulfonamide. The uh, multi-drug resistance was only observed 
in Staph aureus ice lakes against three classes of antibiotics. For the second stop, a scope of the study, it shows that uh, not all multi-drug resistant isolate were able to form a strong biofilm. And on the efficacy of sanitizers, the PAA was the most effective, followed by NAOCL and BAC. <coughs> at the recommended concentration, 10 minutes exposure uh, required to effectively reduce biofilm cells of Staph aureus and E. coli. And the uh, 2 minutes exposure to hot water at 90 and 95 degrees Celsius was effective to reduce the biofilm cells of Staph aureus and E. coli by more than 6.5 log. So that will be the summary for the uh, case study number 2. So, in conclusion, the occurrence of multidrug resistant staph aureus and E. coli is an indication of poor personal and sanitary uh, hygiene. Uh, and therefore, continuous effort should be invested in hygiene and sanitation education for food handlers in food service establishment. And based on the results of the two uh, case uh, cases, more research collaboration uh, between policymakers, local council authorities and researchers should be encouraged to promote effective cleaning and sanitizing procedure on the survival of biofilm cells of resistant bacteria on cutting box and maybe on air, other food contact surfaces. And as <clears throat> this study is limited to the area of Klang Valley, more studies uh, should be conducted across the country to represent the collective uh, Malaysian population. And uh, uh, the research team for these two studies uh, are listed here. And I thank you uh, for listening. And I thank again to the uh, organizer for having me uh, in this session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Narani, for the uh, very insightful um, presentation. Um, I'll open this uh, session for question and answer if there's any. Okay, there's this um, just one general question. Um, with the current lockdown where everyone is ordering food online, is there any some sort of guidelines or standard to make sure food is always safe for consumer? Uh, okay, maybe I can just uh, quickly uh, uh, answer that. Uh, in our country, uh, you know that uh, the Ministry of Health is responsible uh, for the uh, matters pertaining to food safety. And talking about guideline, yes, uh, the uh, Ministry of Health via the BKKM, or we call it Food, uh, food Safety and Quality Division, they have uh, produced or established a uh, lot and document that can be used as guidelines to um, to the uh, uh, rider and uh, how to handle food and how are we receiving the food, how are they uh, handling the food while not uh, sending over to the uh, customer and also um, uh, how we should handle food when we at home, when we receive it, how to store it, uh, things like that. Yes, we do have that. Nice. Um, is there any other question? The committee, can you please check if there's any question from other platform? Okay, if there is no more question, thank you very much, Dr. Noor Aini, for your presentation you. and the sharing of your knowledge. Thank you. Okay, so from food safety, now let us take a listen about a topic related to bio waste. Ladies and gentlemen, our final speaker for the science and technology track and in the ICRES virtual conference 2021, Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Chia Pohwai from the Faculty of Science and Marine Environment, University Malaysia Terengganu UMT Malaysia, 
with the title Sustainable Synthesis Using Bio Waste as Catalyst. Warm welcome to you, Dr. Chia, and the platform is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, can you uh, look at my slides? Uh, can you can you see my slide? Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Bon Rajni um, for moderating today's session. And also I would like to thank the organizer of this meeting for inviting me here today. Um, today, I would like to present to you um, on a topic entitled um, Sustainable Synthesis Using Bio Waste as Catalyst. I believe everyone um, here are researcher and educator, and we can be in the front line of movement, okay, um, to train more environmentally conscious um, scientists. So the discussion today will provide everyone an overview and also a great opportunity to explore what green chemistry means for scientists. Okay, so before I proceed further, this is a little bit about myself. I'm a researcher in the field of organic synthesis with um, nine years of independent research experience, branched out in the academic um, research field of green chemistry and chemical education. So um, I have been um, actively associated with Institute Chemistry in Malaysia, and recently I also appointed as the consultant for the Green to You company, um, Sanjian Berhad. And also I'm an associate editor for Journal of Sustainability Science and Management, and also, um, I'm just appointed as the head of uh, Eco Innovation Research Interest Group in University of Malaysia, Trengganu. Okay, um, the presentation is structured as follows. So initially, I'm going to talk about the valorization of bio waste for organic transformation, and followed by the topic on the use of food additive as sustainable catalyst for organic transformation. Next, it will be followed by the topic on using radical chemistry to achieve um, semi-year um, reactions. Also, we talk about um, the merit of working okay, on green chemistry okay, together with the um, industrial. Okay? And last but not least, I will also share on my chemical education research, uh, which focuses mainly on the chemistry and also um, education for sustainability okay, as the whole. Okay, so I would like to share some memorable quote that I read from the book okay, that inspired me when I was looking for my research direction. So, which led to my current research interest, and it is also about uh, green and sustainable chemistry. Um, here are some of the famous quote. So, quote, waste we need to recognize is a man-made concept. In nature, there is no waste. Everything, um, yeah, every time a waste is generated, so uh, an organism uh, evolved to use that waste as a feedstock, okay? So, and so, we think about how to do the same thing, okay, in industry, okay? How do you uh, want to prevent or avoid waste or utilize whatever waste in a valuable way, okay? So in light of this, okay, I was wondering about how we can realize the zero waste concept, okay? And how it can be applied in the context of sustainable um, synthesis in chemistry, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, we are a project group focused on, okay, uh, on the issue of sustainability, okay, via the green chemistry approach. So one of my current research, okay, interests lies primarily in the field of waste valorization. Okay, in my research group, we have managed to um, transform the waste onion peel, okay, into many um, useful catalytic systems. And most of these catalytic systems, they are capable to facilitate organic transformation and um, that generate uh, various kind of, uh, what they call, bioactive compound, okay, such as the bisindole, bisinol, isoindoline, thiazolopyrimidine compound, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what is onion? Onion, okay. So onion is an ubiquitous crop, okay, grown not only for human consumption, but also for their therapeutic and also other functional purposes. Okay, why did we choose this bio waste though? Okay, we choose it because we noticed that in every year, okay, it is estimated about 100 to 500,000 um, tons of onion waste were generated in the developed country alone. So which we felt uh, was very worrying. Okay, later on, so some idea pop up, okay, in my mind. So how can we relate this bio waste to green and sustainable chemistry, okay? And can we find an effective and safer method to handle the bio waste? Can we find a way to reduce waste management and disposable costs? And are we able to recycle the bio waste as a result of high demand on agriculture and foods? And finally, can we recycle the bio waste and apply in the concept of eco-friendly organic transformation? Our first idea uh, pop up in my mind, okay, was to use the water extract of onion peel for the synthesis of this indo. Okay, so just for a rough idea, of how I managed to uh, prepare the uh, water extract of onion peel. So first, I collected or sampled the onion peel, okay, and then I sliced the onion peel into a smaller pieces. 
Okay, after that, I filter, okay, I use, uh, I rinse the um, sliced onion peel with the filter water, okay, uh, with the distilled water, and then the filtrate that I collected is termed as the water extract of onion peel. So um, the pH measurement, okay, reveal that it is quite acidic indeed, which is 3.68, okay. So once we have obtained the water extract of onion peel, we quickly chuck in the two starting material, which is the benzaldehyde and indole, and um, gratifyingly, we managed to um, get the um, end product, which is the beast in dome. Okay, so um, to widen the scope of our um, study, so we have bought um, commercially available um, benzaldehyde, okay, to synthesize a variety of um, beast in dome here. So in all cases, the pure um, beast in dome, they were purified, okay, uh, over short column chromatography, okay, in a very good yield from 62% to 90%. And we have also explored the chemo selectivity of the current catalytic system. So we have um, subjected the benzaldehyde to the indo, and also we also uh, subjected the uh, acetophenone to the benzaldehyde to see whether they are selective or not. Okay, whether it is going to the indo is going to attack on the aldehyde only, or it is uh, is not non-selective, or whether it it can go, uh, it can uh, attack both uh, starting material. So in our case, okay, we have observed that only um, the 3A compound is the solely compound, okay, solely end product that we managed to isolate, okay. So in this case, we um, in the, we concluded that this reaction is uh, very chemoselective, okay, because the indoor only um, reacted with the benzaldehyde to afford the 3A in 90% yield, okay. We, none of the, uh, what do you call it, the 3L, okay, observed. All right, so next we are also um, interested to okay study about the recyclability okay about the current catalytic system. Our laboratory okay uh, result shows that the WEOP okay or the cat current catalytic system can be recovered okay and then reused for the si five successive recycles okay for the synthesis of this indo with a good yield from um, eighty eight percent to uh, eighty five percent. Okay, next, we are also interested to learn about the chemical constituent for the onion peel. The LCMS revealed that the, most of the phytochemicals in the WEOP, they were water-soluble compounds, such as the um, ferulic acid, caffeic acid, synaphenic acid, cyanidin, tannic acid, gallic acid, and other organic acid. And um, finally, so we would like to study about the mechanism. So the dramatic promotion of the synthesis of uh, bis indo in the current uh, study not well understood. However, the literature uh, report revealed that tannic acid and also um, henna extract, uh, okay, so they are capable to okay act as the catalytic, uh, what do you call organic catalyst in organic transformation. So in our case, okay, because the pH measurement shows that um, the current catalytic system is three point six eight, and also the LCMS shows that it contains a lot of organic uh, acids. Okay, and therefore we um, postulated that this organic acid, okay, they are capable to act as a um, catalyst to facilitate the um, transformation from benzaldehyde to the beast indo. And uh, we managed to publish this okay um, result in one of the journal. Okay, and next we're going to look at um, the second usage of the onion peel. So the second idea that popped up in my mind is we are going to um, slice the onion peel again and then um, subject it to furnace, okay, ash it and then become the uh, ash, okay, derived, okay, uh, onion peel waste. So this time we wash again the ash with the distilled water and we collect the filtrate. And um, upon the, what you call it, the pH measurement, okay, so it revealed that it is a very basic, okay, medium. So a pH value of 11 was obtained. And okay, the next, okay, next we're going to uh, explore the general applicability of the ash water catalytic system. So we have uh, bought, okay, a series of starting material, okay, to synthesize or to prepare the uh, beast eno compounds. So in most of the cases, all these compounds were afforded in good to excellent yield from 63 to 93%. And next, okay, we also study about the reusability, okay, of the current catalytic system. Okay, so it was observed that the current catalytic system can be recycled, can be recovered, okay, and then reused for up to five times, okay, without significant loss of the catalytic activity. So uh, the U is ranged from 94 to 92 percent. And next, we also evaluated the metal content of the ash water extract, okay, so using the ICP OES. So the metal content of the ash water um, extract, okay, result review that, okay, there are uh, many, uh, what do you call, uh, elements here. 
So with magnesium is one of the major uh, elements. And also, okay, uh, from our literature search, we found that magnesium oxide, okay, can um, facilitate the similar ide or identical kind of reactions. So therefore, we um, hypothesize that the magnesium, okay, the element, in particular the magnesium oxide in the ash, ash water extract can facilitate the organic transformation to um, UD and product, which is the bisinol. And we managed to publish this result in one of the journal, okay. And next, we going to I'm going to talk to you about how I managed to transform, okay, um, waste, okay, onion peel into um, C1 nanoparticle. So uh, we have gone through the same process also, slice it, okay, and then use the ring, uh, what do you call distilled water, wash it, okay, and then react with the C1 nitrate, okay, and then um, the color of the solution changes from light orange become um, dark brown color. So this, uh, what do you call observation, or this, uh, what do you call that, um, synthesis was also monitored by using uh, UVBs. And also we have um, confirmed the size of the silver nanoparticle, okay, synthesized from the waste onion peel, okay, using uh, TEM analysis. So from the TEM, TEM analysis, it revealed that the size of the particle, okay, is ranged from 10 nanometer to 15 nanometer, okay. So we had an average size of 12.55 nanometer, okay, out of 200 spherical, okay, silver nanoparticle, nano, uh, silver nanoparticles. Okay, next. We have also studied about the catalytic performance of the synthesized silver nanoparticle, okay? So before that, okay, I have um, checked on the science finder, okay? So um, most of the uh, method used for the acetylation, so involve the, uh, what do you call, phenyl uh, triphenyl boron, zinc triflate, and also um, silver triflate, okay? So all these compounds, okay, or all these uh, reagents, they are quite toxic or hazardous. So in this case, we would like to substitute all these uh, hazardous reagent with the green one, which is the silver nanoparticle. And um, gratifyingly, we managed to, um, uh, what do you call, yield the end product, okay? And also we repeated with various starting material, okay? And uh, we managed to publish this result, okay, in one of the journal also. And also inspired by our success, okay, in our previous um, uh, research, okay, we also uh, tried the silver nanoparticle to synthesize the uh, what do you call 1,4-DHP uh, uh, compounds or known as a hunch dihydropyridine compound, okay? And also we have uh, published this, okay, just this year, okay, in one of the journals also. And we also uh, try our luck, okay, uh, in one of the uh, compound, okay? So we have continued to explore new materials, catalysts, okay, that can facilitate green and sustainable synthesis in organic chemistry. So a key aspect of green catalysis research is the catalytic system, okay, being developed and studied. So they must be, uh, they must be able to deliver practical and useful solutions that have positive societal and industrial impact. So uh, last year, okay, in 2020, we reported a highly efficient green and recyclable, okay, method of preparation of carboxylic acid from aldehyde to um, to carboxylic acid using the sodium he uh, hexametaphosphate. So for your information, sodium hexametaphosphate is a food additive, okay? So it is used to alteration of pH, preservation of uh, food colors and also food quality, okay? So um, using food additive such as the SHMP, okay, is not only addressing the problem, okay, in sustainable chemistry, while it also expands, okay, the green chemistry toolbox by having, okay, alternative mean of doing sustainable catalyst. And we managed to publish this result in one of the um, journals also. So immediately, uh, just this year, I've written a review paper together with uh, Prof. Ahmad Sazali, okay, from EITM. So we have uh, published, okay, on the use of food additive and uh, food additive as green catalyst in organic transformation. And uh, fortunately, it was um, accepted in environmental chemistry letters, okay. So uh, just a brief introduction, okay. So since 2003, dozens of environmental friendly, okay, green catalysts that are derived from food additive from the preparation of organic substance are described in the literature, okay. So among the benefit and green features showcased by these catalysts, they are fast, okay, chemical reaction rate, improved reaction use, and also use of uh, non-toxic, okay, inexpensive catalysts, okay, um, some of the benefit here, okay. So this review article present to uh, okay, readers an overview of the green organic synthesis achieved using the food additive. And also I have, uh, what do you call, uh, developed a strong interest, okay, in uh, fundamental chemistry, okay, or fundamental organic synthesis. So I have also tried my hand, okay, on uh, one of the, what do you call it, uh, basic organic reaction, okay, which is called the Sandmeyer reactions, okay. So to prepare the aryl nitrile compounds, 
So for information, aryl nitrile are valuable class of compound. So there are many found in, okay, as a starting material for medicine, agriculture, natural product, materials, and dyes, okay? And traditionally, okay, the synthesis of aryl nitrile, so they rely heavily on the use of uh, expensive, okay, endangered matter, which is palladium, okay? So in this case, I have substituted this element, element with the, uh, what do you call it, sodium nitrate, okay? Uh, use it solvent free, okay, and then we managed to get the uh, end product, which is the around nine child. So we managed to publish this in uh, one of the paper two years ago, okay. So in this slide, I would like to show you some of the value, okay, then the contribution of this fuel uh, towards industrial application. So green chemists can act as an advisory group or play an important role in design new chemicals, okay, to use in place of one that have been proven to be problematic. And recently, I have been uh, investigating, investigating for a cheap, okay, and green committee site using natural product as ingredient to cause the mortality in microcerotomus and uh, nasuti termus species. So, for information, microcerotomus, okay, uh, is one of the most destructive termite, okay, that can cause serious uh, economic damage for wooden product in buildings. So our few testing, okay, show that we can use a baiting system as shown here, okay. So after we uh, install the, what you call it, the baiting system, okay, and uh, we monitor it for the next one or two weeks, okay. So after the fourth visit, we found that all the termites were killed, okay, with carcass identified, okay. So with none of the active termites being detected in the nets or in the, uh, in the pillar, okay. So the result shows that the current baiting system containing a natural product-based insecticide, okay, okay, is capable of causing mortality in microcerotomous termite. And until now, the, this baiting system is being used in uh, this, uh, this company also. And also, I have a chance to collaborate, okay, working closely with a chemical educator from Daegu University. So, uh, so far, we have published seven papers, okay, and these are the papers, okay, that we have collaborated, okay, and then uh, published so far. And... Uh, Okay, as we all alert, okay, our world is, um, okay, facing the outlet of, uh, outbreak of COVID-19. So there are many lessons we can take from the year of 2020 that will help us face this new decade, the decade, okay. So one of the main lessons we can learn from the pandemic is not in my opinion about technology, but about how chemistry, okay, uh, education can be more relevant, useful, and attractive. Okay, so that's, a, okay, uh, in uh, science, okay, there's a big general agreement that organic chemistry course is one of the toughest, okay, subject among the science subject, okay. So particularly for the unprepared student. So as a science or chemistry educator, so I believe that an expert lecturer in a discipline, especially in the field of organic chemistry, so we should possess organized coherent framework. So in which the knowledge should be linked and contextualized, okay, making the learned knowledge, okay, accessible and linked to a bigger picture. So in order to incorporate this element in my teaching and also learning philosophy, one of my personal goals was grounded in the fact that, okay, uh, any new information or knowledge disseminated in the lecture or virtual room must be concretely connected to student prior knowledge and they must understood the reason of learning new knowledge so that um, they can learn more meaningful understand the ultimate purpose rather than the shallow or brute fashion, okay? So in order to support students with the kind of um, experience that help them to build a coherent learning framework in organic chemistry course, I've highlighted to students at the beginning of course, the core idea for supporting the study of chapter one to three, uh, one to five, okay? Or the big ideas emerge from each idea, okay? So for example, this is the uh, chapter one, okay? To support students in reasoning analysis or fundamental skill, I've included, okay, the organic chemistry base. Um, I have included, okay, the drawing here, okay. So after we have learned so many things, so the big idea here is to, link, to learn about the Lewis structure. And in the second chapter, okay, so we are focusing on uh, atomic orbitals, hybridization, molecular geometry. And the big idea here, okay, that I want my student to learn about is the molecular shape, which is um, highlighted in the right uh, hand corner, okay. And in chapter three, okay, students will be introduced with some of the fundamental concepts on the polarity or organic bonds or electron flow within a molecule. Students were able to predict the polarity of bond, molecule, electron density, intermolecular forces, and physical property of a molecule. So the big idea here we want students to learn about is electron distribution within the molecule. Okay, so moving on to chapter four. So we have studied, okay, we are going to discuss about the acid base by applying the previous knowledge okay, on electron distribution within molecule. 
So explaining to students why the lone pair here has a higher electron density and thus facilitate the deprotonation of the hydroxonium um, cation using Lewis acid-based theory. Okay. So finally, okay. So after I have uh, managed to arrange everything, okay. So I will explain to students. So from chapter four onwards, okay. So we are going to make use of the Lewis acid-based theory to study about the organic reactions. Okay. So. The acid-base theory is not limited to uh, the Lewis-based theory is not limited to acid-base reaction, but also can be extended to explain typical reaction occur in organic chemistry, such as the alkene, alkyne, alcohol, and aromatic reaction. So the subsequent chapter will build upon the knowledge of Lewis theory and also the previous chapter to understand other organic reactions. Okay, so all these idea will align. Okay, to form a coherent or a uh, big picture in their study. So also, okay, I have uh, allied students to learn knowledge in basic organic chemistry about the social environmental responsibility project. So we can design an activity such as by subjecting students to social scientific issue and asking them to propose a potential solution to what they read on the literature. So in this way, we can understand much better about student developed decision making skill and how students make use of the organic chemistry knowledge to provide potential answer to pressing social societal environmental question. So in this project, so I have asked students, okay, so what have you read, okay, about the issue on the BPA bottle, okay, and also the uh, paraben product, okay, and how, what are the potential solutions to overcome this, okay. So after that, students will come up with the solution, okay, and then it will showcase to the lecturers, okay. So all these students, they participate, okay, voluntarily, and then we manage to publish this, this result in one of the local journal, and here are some of the recent publication, okay, with many uh, focusing on green and sustainable chemistry. And this is my future work, okay, so I welcome any research collaboration, especially in the field of green and sustainable chemistry. And um, these are my collaborators, okay. And last but not least, okay, I would like to share a quote with you, okay. So, um, labor put on the people, okay, in school or society, such as smart, not very bright, are not the great importance, okay, rather persistent and energy to complete what you have set out to accomplish other strength that will be viewed as set in your life, okay. And I would like to thank uh, for your kind attention, okay, feel free to ask me any question and I will try my best to handle, okay. And I pass back the session to moderator, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chia. Yeah. Um, so I open the uh, session now for question and answer, if you if you have any. Um, those who are watching live uh, through um, YouTube, you may just type your question and uh, the committee will um, read it to us. Is there any, especially from um, a chemistry lecturer, it's time for you to ask and share knowledge. Okay, I just have uh, this uh, very general question. Probably it's not related to your presentation today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just that um, um, regarding education for sustainable development, uh, mm -hmm. what do you think is the biggest challenge in promoting education for sustainable development using chemistry education? Uh, okay, so um, basically what I thought, this is my own opinion, okay, we should cultivate the uh, ESD, okay, achieve via the chemistry, okay, since um, primary school, okay, so we need to cultivate this, um, what do you call that, um, awareness since uh, primary school and secondary school, and it is not uh, from university level, yeah, this is my comment, mm, so this is the difficulty that we face now, yeah. Yeah, all right, mm -hmm. any other question or any um, announcement from the committee? Let me check the um, WhatsApp first, yeah? Okay, since it um, seems that there is no other question. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Chia, for your uh, presentation and the sharing of your knowledge. My pleasure, thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is the end of our session. I would like to uh, thank 
uh, all the invited speakers for this uh, final session. Um, Dr. Ong Kwe Hoon, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Shaima A. Enani, Associate Professor Dr. Noor Aini Mahyudin, Associate Professor Dr. Po Huai Chia. We thank you and um, we would like to apologize all our um, shortcomings in this um, uh, conference, especially on time management. Yeah, we hope that this conference has become a good platform for researchers and academician and industrial players to broadcast and disseminate their valuable knowledge in their respective field. Knowledge shared indeed will be useful and beneficial to all. So till we meet again in the future, stay safe, take care and have a nice day everyone.